She scrambled to her feet and started running hard, following Johnny back along the trail. Her eye was still watering, but it had cleared, and she remembered all the running she'd done as a kid. Her performances for her county had got her the scholarship to the private school. Another shot rang out, but she wasn't running for the finish line anymore. She was running for her life. Another gunshot. Another. Was that six now? Seven? She tried to think how many bullets were in a gun, how many would be in the type of gun that the man had, and how many he would have left. But it was taking all her focus and energy just to run, to put one foot in front of the other, to watch where her feet were landing. In front of her, Johnny batted away a succession of branches, but his eyes were constantly flicking back to check that Rebecca was still with him. Another shot, and then a second almost instantly. This time, Rebecca was knocked off balance. It took her a split second to react, to process and understand what had happened. Then she looked down and saw a hole in the outer edge of her coat. A bullet had passed right through it, millimetres from her left hip. White insulation spilled out of the hole. Black marks scorched the circumference, and in the moment it took her to look, she'd taken her eyes off the contours of the path. Her foot caught on a stray tree root. She tumbled forward, smashing into a tree. Black. It lasted a couple of seconds. As Rebecca pinged back into focus, confused, she saw the man, fifty feet away, looking in her direction. She glanced to see if Johnny was nearby, but he was gone. He didn't know she'd fallen. Where Johnny had gone, the trees formed a kind of mouth, the trail darkening, the canopy drawn together. She looked again at the man, even closer now, his gun up in front of him, then to the path. When Johnny came back for her, because he would, she knew he would, he'd be a sitting duck. The way the path wound and closed, he would never even see the man until it was too late. Don't come back for me, Johnny. Please don't come back. But then she heard him calling for her. Back? His voice short and desperate. Back! She sprang to her feet. The instant she did, the man caught sight of her. He fired into the trees, the bullet fizzing past her and hitting a pale, scrawny oak to her right. She headed away from the path, away from Johnny, deeper into the forest, looking over her shoulder to make sure the man was following her. He broke from the path into the undergrowth, kicking and chopping his way through a maze of vines and scrub. Rebecca heard Johnny calling her name again, further off now, his voice like a cry from another room. And then finally, the sound changed. It was just the noise of Rebecca, stumbling and her pursuer breathless behind her. He shot at her again. It came close, a low hiss in the air to her right, but then she veered left, making use of a break in the scrub and tried to alter her direction. Somewhere, so far off she wasn't even sure if she was hearing things, Johnny called her name again. And then the ground became uneven. As trees clotted around her, the forest floor popped and her ankle jammed into a hole five inches deeper than the rest of the terrain. It jarred the whole side of her body, ankle to hip. She'd barely even lifted it out when she hit another, less deep but much wider, and this time her ankle rolled into the empty space. She fell. Her hands cushioned her, but the impact still hurt. Every part of her hurt. She was so scared her bones ached. She pushed herself up, stumbling forward, hitting a tree, bouncing away from it, then hitting another. She fell a second time. Beneath her, the ground had altered again. It was starting to slope away from her, and she could hear something. She could smell it, too. Salt. She was nearing the coast. Maybe I can find help there, she thought, clambering to her feet. There might be people or fishing boats. She looked behind her to see where the man was, to see how much distance he'd gained on her, and faltered. Where was he? A shot rang out. The bullet came so close it was like she could feel the air move in the spaces beside her head. Her immediate reaction was to shield herself with her arm, protect her eyes, her skull, even though it was too late, even though the flesh and bone in her arm would be as effective as paper if he got the next one on target. As she did... She wobbled, the lunge of her arms shifting her weight, and she took a jolting step into another hollow. Her cell phone fell out of her pocket, loose change went with it, and then she started to tumble. 
This time there was nothing to stop her. The ground dropped away beneath her. She'd been on the edge of another gully, but this one was smaller, much deeper, and disguised by a swathe of scrub. She went straight through the scrub, taking some of it with her as she tried to stop herself falling, and hit the sides of the gully hard. One roll, another, another, each one faster, each turn of her body pounding so hard against the frozen ground it was like a series of grenade blasts going off inside her. Halfway down, she pierced her head on something sharp, a branch, a root, the pain an immense flare along her face and neck. And then she landed so hard in a bed of dead, dry leaves, it sucked all the breath from her. Leaves puffed up around her, her body became cocooned by them. And then she became still. She stared up at the sky. It was grey like dead skin. Is this it? Is this the end? She tried to reach a hand to her face, to the injury she could feel next to her right ear, but it felt like everything had disconnected. Her arms weren't doing what she was asking them to do. Her chest was on fire. Her breath was catching, and when she tried to clear her throat, she wheezed. Seconds later, everything smeared. There was blood in her eyes. Briefly, her vision went red, and then, once again, everything turned to black. Missing Hours Travis paused the DVD of the interview with Johnny Murphy. There were a couple of moments in it that he hadn't paid much attention to the first time around and hadn't placed any great emphasis on in the times he'd watched the footage since. The pauses between words or after sentences, Murphy's head dropping, his fingers coming together, his eyes flicking between Travis and the camera. It was all tiny, possibly insignificant stuff, but Travis wrote down the time codes for all of them so he could easily refer back to them later. Once he was done, he turned back to the monitor, to the frozen image of Johnny Murphy. Take a second look the caller had said. But a second look at what? Travis opened his notebook again. He'd been through the computer on day one to see if Murphy had a record, any markers in his history. But he'd been clean, not even so much as a parking ticket. His alibi for the night was backed up by cell phone records and security cameras. He dropped Louise at the fundraiser at 6 p.m., and GPS data showed him heading to the ER at NYU Langone in Brooklyn, as he'd stated. Travis pulled video from cameras at the hospital to make sure, and Murphy had appeared on film at the entrance. That in turn coincided with a text received by Louise's cell phone from Murphy a minute later, apologizing for abandoning her. Back in October, following the interview with him, it had been enough for Travis to dismiss him as a suspect. But two months on, perhaps there were potential gaps. The video that Travis had pulled of Murphy at the ER covered only a very brief time period, 9.29 p.m. to 9.51 p.m., when he was visible at the entrance. Before that, the information was much less overt. In fact, Murphy's cell phone appeared to have been switched off completely between the time he arrived at the hospital at 7.01 p.m. and when he first appeared on camera at 9.29 p.m. Travis had spotted the anomaly shortly after the interview and called Murphy about it. And Murphy had given a credible reason. He was in a hospital in an environment where certain areas of the building and certain equipment might have been sensitive to the presence of a phone, and therefore he'd been encouraged to turn it off by hospital staff. But what if that had been a lie? What if he turned it off because he didn't want to be traced? And that was because the two hours and twenty-eight minutes that his cell phone was off coincided with the last time anyone had seen Louise at the fundraiser. It coincided with the split-second glimpse of Louise that Travis had found on one of the cameras at the Royal Union Hotel, too. 
She'd been in the bar at 9.01 p.m. Ten minutes later, her cell had died. Both of those fit into a timeline where Murphy could have headed back to the fundraiser. Those two hours and twenty-eight minutes would have given him more than enough time to drive from the hospital back to the hotel, then make it back to his friend Noella's bedside in order to send the apology text to Louise. The question was why. Why do it that night, when his friend was sick? Why do it at all? Travis still couldn't answer any of those questions, because Murphy still felt like an empty space. So the next step seemed obvious. He had to speak to Johnny Murphy again. Nick Tillman sat in the corner of a deli in Sunnyside, watching the time. On the table in front of him was a notebook. He'd filled most of its pages already. He preferred paper to a phone because paper was easy to dispose of. Phones weren't. They melted. They shattered. You could throw them into a river or bury them in the ground, but they still left a trace. A single text or the briefest of Internet searches, and suddenly you were on a server somewhere forever. He hated that idea. Sinking the rest of the coffee he'd ordered, he'd headed to the counter to pay. The woman at the register tried to engage him in small talk, which he forced himself to take part in. In his experience, it was easier to remember someone who was rude to you than someone who was pleasant, then exited the deli, heading out into the snow. There was a payphone a couple of blocks to the south. The woman answered after four rings. Travis is going around in circles, Tillman said. She didn't reply. Responding to her silence, he said, Is something up? Give me a second, she told him. Another wait. Okay, she said finally, coming back on. In the background, Tillman thought he could hear a door closing. I just had to wait for Axel to leave, she explained. I don't want him hearing this. Axel. He was going to be a problem if they weren't careful. But Tillman didn't say that to her. For now, as always, he just kept quiet. Nick, I'm looking at these things you sent over, she said. The sound of paper being leafed through, the tap of a keyboard. What about Johnny? What about him? Is he really capable of this? Tillman looked up and down the block. When it comes to beautiful women like Louise Mason, he said, Men are capable of anything. Snow flurries skirted across the windshield as Travis made his way south on the interstate. To his right, somewhere under the steel girders of the freeway, he saw the flash of light bars, their color painting nearby buildings, sirens screaming to a crescendo and fading again as they headed away from him. All the way from the office, he'd been thinking about Louise Mason trying to line up what he knew with what he suspected. Images of her blinked in his head, photos her parents had given him, footage of her he'd watched that her father had filmed at an anniversary dinner. Louise had made a toast to her parents, her words warm and witty. It had drawn Travis even closer to her. Mostly, though, when he thought of Louise, he thought of the terrible error he might have made in dismissing the man she'd been dating. He got off at the exit for 86th Street and headed for 3rd Avenue. There, squeezed between a grocery store and a nail spa, was Bay Ridge Electronics, the place where Johnny Murphy worked. He found a space a block away. It was less than a week until Christmas Eve, so lights and decorations blinked everywhere. It was almost the same amount of time until Travis retired. At 5 p.m. on the 23rd of December, he would walk out of the front entrance at one police plaza straight across the road to a retirement party. And after it was done, he'd go home to the emptiness of his house and never return to the office. To his desk. To his cases. To Louise. He upped his pace, walking faster, 
the city in deep freeze. I've got five days, he thought. I've got five days to solve this. When he got to the store, he paused, looking through the ice-speckled glass. There was a closed sign up, but he could see someone moving around inside. Travis rapped on the door, and after a while, an Asian guy in his thirties approached. We're not open until ten, he mouthed. Travis placed his shield against the glass. The guy's face changed. Surprise, then confusion, then worry. Why would the cops be calling so early? He unlocked the door and pulled it open. Can I help you, officer? He asked. Detective. I'm looking for Johnny Murphy. The guy frowned. I couldn't get him on his cell or at home, Travis pressed. He smiled at the guy, reassuring him that there was nothing for him to worry about. Johnny's not here, the guy replied. He didn't turn up for work? No. Did he give a reason? No, I mean, he hasn't been in work for seven weeks. It was Travis's turn to frown. Seven weeks? What are you talking about? I thought you people would have known. Known what? Him and his sister, the guy said. They disappeared. Part 5 The Storm Before Blackness gradually gave way to a vague grey light. When the muscles of her face moved, they felt starched, and Rebecca realised it was because her blood had congealed and dried. The wound was above her jawline, close to her ear. Every time it throbbed, it sent a spear of pain across her nose and forehead and into her neck and shoulders. She tried to blink. That didn't work either. She could smell the blood, taste it, but mostly it was in her eyes. When she tried to open them, she couldn't. The blood had acted as an adhesive, binding her lashes together. Finally, she wrenched them open, and as she saw where she was, she remembered falling, the ground giving way beneath her, her last desperate attempt to cling to something as she tumbled. The whole thing was over in seconds, but that had only disguised the distance she'd come. This gully was deeper than the one in which they'd found Stelzik, the sides much steeper, almost vertical. If she'd been descending on foot, she would have had to do it leaning back with a hand pressed behind her or on her ass. And then she thought of something else. Why was she still alive? Where was the man who tried to kill her? Rebecca froze as she pictured him his green eyes as she remembered what he'd done to Stelzik, to Roxy, how he'd tried to march her and Johnny up to the spot in the tree roots to kill them. And then, as her head filled with an image of her brother, she panicked. Where was he? Had the man gone after him? Was Johnny dead? The idea sent a tremor through her throat. Slowly she raised a hand, her muscles stiff, then tried to shift the rest of her body pain on her left side, in her skull, her neck, right the way down the centre of her chest. After a couple of failed attempts, she managed to sit up and try to move her legs back and forth. She was looking for sprains, fractures, breaks. Miraculously, the only injury was on her face. She touched a couple of fingers to the wound. It felt bad. Skin was flapping like paper, and as she moved again, trying to get onto her knees, she felt a trail of fresh blood break free from the cut and trace the outline of her cheekbone. Out here, in the middle of a forest, and especially because of how she'd fallen, there was a good chance the cut was dirty, filled with debris. She needed to get it cleaned and dressed. Using a nearby tree as an anchor, she hauled herself up. Bones creaked. She paused, checking her pants for her phone. Shit, no phone. But she still had the keys to the Cherokee in her pocket. As she started to look around at the floor of the gully, at the scrub and vines and swathes of thick brush, she remembered why she didn't have her cell. It had spilled out of her pants as she fell. All her loose change had gone too. 
The phone was still at the crown of the slope somewhere. Slowly she headed up there on her hands and knees. She felt a hundred years old and heavy as concrete. Her hands became filthy, coated in mud and leaves and chips of ice. She wiped more blood away with her sleeve as she got to the top, still breathless after the climb, and started scanning the area for her cell. Eventually she found the place at which she'd gone down the slope into the gully. The ground disturbed, her footprint visible. Close by, loose change was dotted like jewels. But there was no cell phone. He must have taken it. She looked around the forest, suddenly worried that this was all part of the game, that the man might still be somewhere close by, watching. But she couldn't see him. So why had he left her alive? Picking up her change, she scanned her surroundings again. The trail she'd broken away from, the trail she and Johnny had been following back to the dig site, was just about visible through the trees. It looked quiet. The whole place looked quiet. In the time she'd been out, the wind had died right down and the weather had changed. There was no blue sky now, just an infinite grey ceiling of cloud, and it was even colder than before the air raw. In desperation, she began searching for her phone again, not just so she might be able to make a call, but to find out the time. She had no idea how long she'd been out. A minute? Five? Longer? I need to find Johnny. She got back onto the trail and tried to pick up her pace. She wanted to run. But what if the man heard or saw her? Under the canopy of trees, inside the section she'd last seen Johnny pass into, she realised how cold she was. Her coat and hoodie were both wet from the ground, muddied from the leaves. She could still feel blood and dried saliva on her face. She wiped at her cheek with her sleeve, smearing blood across her lips, and, briefly, thought of calling out for Johnny. But she stopped herself, thinking of the man once again. If he was close by, he'd instantly know that she'd made it out of the gully. She headed back in the direction of the car. It took her twenty minutes to get to the Cherokee, with no sign of the man or Johnny on the way. Where are you, John? Please don't be dead. I can't handle this on my own. Then she noticed that Stelzik's Chevy was gone. Had the man taken it? Or Johnny? She looked around her, and as she did, she caught sight of herself in the windshield. She took a step closer to the glass. Blood covered one side of her face, an eruption of it from a hole-like injury next to her ear. The cut looked worse than it had felt when she'd been poking around with her fingers, blacker, deeper, and when she tried to wipe blood away from her cheek, most of it had dried solid. When she used a little saliva, all it did was spread. The whole area was like an explosion of red dye. Leaning further in towards the glass, she turned her head to get a better view of the injury, and something occurred to her. Her mind spun back to the moments before she tumbled into the gully. One of the bullets had passed so close to her face, it was like she'd felt the air move. It was what had knocked her off balance and triggered the fall. As she descended into the gully, she'd injured herself. She'd smashed her head on something, and then she'd hit the ground and she'd bled across her face, and she'd lain there, with that side of her head showing absolutely and perfectly still. She'd been that way because she was unconscious. But if the man had come to the edge of the gully, if he'd looked down and seen her lying there, and especially when he'd seen all the blood and the shape and appearance of the wound next to Rebecca's ear, it would have looked like something else. A kill. Instantly he would have switched his attention to going after Johnny, because he'd have believed that the reason Rebecca fell, the reason she ended up in the gully, was him. That was why the man wasn't here. That was why Rebecca was still breathing. He thought he'd shot her in the head. Chapter 41 Rebecca returned to the second hostel, armed with tools. She'd managed to find a claw hammer and an old chisel to use as levers on the door. The day was bright, the sun out, but two weeks into December, 
the temperature had dropped like a stone. As she stood outside the hostel, Roxy beside her, panting impatiently, all she could see in front of her was her breath. Wood splintered as she attempted to rock the hammer back and forth, the claw wedged into the space between the door and the frame. She could feel how rotten the edges were, damp and soft, and it didn't take much effort to break off small chunks of the door at its edges. The more difficult part was the area around the lock. It had been treated and repaired at some point. Please let there be food in here. She renewed her attack on the door, Roxy moving in half circles at her legs, as desperate to get inside as Rebecca was. She could feel herself sweating, hot under her clothing, but any moisture that formed on exposed skin instantly felt like ice. After a while, she shrugged off her coat, but then a glacial wind cut in off the water and she was no longer sure if she was hot or cold. It felt like a fever. Roxy started to scratch at the door. Out of the way, Rox, Rebecca said, frustrated. She kept going, but after a few minutes, the door remained intact and she'd made precisely no headway on the lock plate. How the hell are we going to get in? And then an idea came to her. Returning to the Cherokee, Roxy trailing in her wake, she reversed the car onto the grass at the front of the hostel, all the way to the door. Getting out again, she opened the tailgate and grabbed some rope from the trunk. She managed to push it through a tiny welded loop on the door's lock plate, then knotted the other end to the jeep's tow hitch. With Roxy on the back seat, obviously sensing something was about to happen, Rebecca put the car into drive and began inching forward. It took a few seconds for her to feel the resistance kick in. Once the rope was at its full extension, she gently touched the gas. The grass was wet under the tires, and for a moment they spun as the car went nowhere. She kept the same amount of pressure on, her eyes flicking to her mirrors to see if anything had changed. Roxy didn't know where to look at Rebecca or at the rear windshield, her head pinging back and forth. Come on, Rebecca said softly. The wheels spun again. Come on. Roxy barked. Come on, you stupid bloody... She heard the ping above the sound of the engine, and then, a second later, something crashed against the back of the car. For a moment, she didn't know if her plan had worked or if the tow hitch had simply broken off. She got out. On the ground, below the Cherokee, was the metal plate, as well as a fresh, ugly scar carved out of the fender where the plate had struck it. Rebecca didn't care. She hurried over to the door, screws hung loose, no longer attached to the plate, and the door handle had broken into two pieces. More wood had cleaved away as well. The door was open. Rebecca let Roxy explore while she hurried straight for the kitchen. As she passed the bedroom, she could see they were exactly the same design as the ones in the other hostel, plain and undecorated, blankets on the beds. In the kitchen, she started opening cupboards. She felt an instant wave of relief at seeing the cans there, knowing even from a quick glance that they now had enough for at least another six weeks, maybe a couple of months, if she continued to ration what they ate. She grabbed ravioli, tuna, corned beef, more clam chowder, and a lot of beans, refried and pinto, chili, beans with pork and with chicken franks. She'd never have eaten any of this stuff if she'd still been at home, but right now the cans meant survival. Roxy started barking. It sounded like she was upstairs somewhere. Rox? she called. What's up? More barking. Rebecca headed to the first floor and found Roxy in the last room on the left. She stopped in the doorway. In the middle, Roxy was doing circles. She was worked up, confused, and it was obvious why. She could smell someone in here, someone she'd loved. This was the room Stelzik had stayed in. Rebecca dropped to a crouch, trying to reach out to Roxy. It's all right, Rox, she said softly. It's okay. But even as she said the words, her mind had skipped ahead to what she might find in Stelzik's room. Maybe a clue as to why he was killed. Maybe the reason they'd try to do the same to her. Before
Rebecca stared into the window of the Cherokee at the image of her head injury, at the wound that looked like a bullet hole, then noticed something else on the other side of the car. The window on the opposite side wasn't there. It had been smashed. She totally missed it, the shock of seeing her reflection overpowering everything else. But as she hurried around the front of the jeep, she looked in through the passenger window and found glass all over the seat. Something was missing from inside, too. The dash cam. It had been stuck to the windshield without ever being switched on, but now all that remained of it was a vague circle on the glass. She couldn't remember the last time she'd run it. Gareth had bought it in the weeks before the split, telling her everyone was using them, that in the event of an accident it would save a ton of hassle with their insurers. He'd framed it like an insult, a comment on her driving, but in those final days and weeks she hadn't had the energy to fight him on every tiny thing. Now it had been taken, and she had no idea why. Why would someone smash a window to get at it? She slid in at the wheel and fired up the jeep. The moment it rumbled into life, she looked at the clock on the centre console. 1458. She'd lost track of time. Didn't even know when she and Johnny had entered the forest, so she had no idea how far behind Johnny she was, or if Johnny had left at all. She looked out through the dust and mud speckled on the windshield into the tangle of trees and worried that trying to go for help was the wrong move. What if Johnny was still in there somewhere? What if he was injured? What if he was dead? She focused on the thing that mattered, finding him. And she could only find him with help. The forest was far too big for her to cover by herself, its trails too difficult to understand. She needed local knowledge. Jamming the jeep into reverse, she began backing out. But the second the wheels started turning, she knew something wasn't right. The car felt imbalanced, as if something was weighing it down on the left side. Getting out again, she looked towards the trunk. The back rear tyre had been slashed, cut so deeply that the rubber had folded over on itself. In her hurry, she hadn't noticed it. She wanted to scream into the trees. Popping the trunk, she began looking for a spare tyre, even though she was already certain that there wasn't one. When they'd bought the car, she remembered overhearing the salesman telling Gareth how the tyre inflator kit worked. But it was worth less than nothing when the damage was to the side wall. Sure enough, a kit was all she found. She slammed the tailgate shut. What now? She had no cell phone and no vehicle, and it was at least a mile back up the track to the loop. But it was her only choice. The track was hard going, full of ruptures and holes, and halfway up it began to rain. It didn't take long for the cracks in the mud to split, and Rebecca was slipping, the wind gathering and scattering leaves from the trees. When she finally got to the top, the clouds were even denser than before, knotted together like clumps of wool. Out to sea, a leaden wall of rain hung like a stage curtain and then the entire sky blinked white. A storm was coming. She looked both ways along the loop, hoping to see a car close by, a truck, a person, anything. The road was empty, save for the flickering shapes of buildings drifting in and out of the rain, and debris, perhaps from a truck. She could see wood chips and plastic fasteners dotted across the road. The most direct route to Helena was to her right, but the buildings she could see were on her left, so she headed there first. If just one was occupied, that meant people, and people meant help. The rain jagged in towards her, needles against her face. She was already wet from the climb up the track, but now the cold came too. Her clothes were stuck to her, like a skin she couldn't shed, and as the first of the buildings edged closer, she started shivering. It was ugly crumbling with a gunmetal grey roof and no windows at the front. She tried the door. It was locked. She started banging on it, and, when there was no response, moved around to the back. It was full of junk, a graveyard of old machinery and mangled vehicles. It was clear no one had lived here for years. Lightning flashed again. 
The next building was a couple of minutes away, but before she got there she could see it was a dead end. It was boarded up, part of its roof collapsed. The next house was the same. The only difference this time was that the front yard had a mobile home in it. Rebecca stopped outside the trailer and banged on its walls. They vibrated against her fist. Hello? She shouted against the rain. Hello? She tried the house too, but everything was locked. No one was at home. No one was anywhere. She needed to get to the ferry. There would be help there. She set off again. All the time the rain kept coming and now it was getting dark. That meant it must be after 4 p.m. The day before, Chloe in one arm, Kyra at her legs, she'd opened the doors of the brownstone and remembered seeing the sky through the back windows starting to colour. She remembered Kyra asking if she could watch TV, then the sound of the Dora the Explorer theme coming from the living room. Dora, Rebecca had learned through routine, through repetition, started at four every day and was like a rescue boat. It was a thirty-minute pause on a videotape that never stopped. For that short period every day, her girls would sit and watch Dora, and Rebecca would get to cuddle them. She didn't have to make anything. She didn't have to prepare any food. They didn't wriggle away from her. She wasn't telling them off or kissing them better. It was just the three of them. She tried to think of other things about her life. Memories that would give her momentum, that would energise her muscles and bones as if she wasn't already soaked through, freezing and exhausted, and for a while it worked. She pictured Kyra playing with her building blocks on the living room floor, Chloe reaching a hand up to the toy bar that arced over her bouncer. Rebecca was thinking of Kyra, of the structures she used to build with the blocks, of the sound they would make as the tower finally collapsed when the images of her daughters began to flicker, and as the storm intensified and the rain lashed against her, desperation began to overwhelm her. Why is this happening to me? She tried to calm herself, going over what Johnny had told her earlier, using it to reassure herself. The ferry back didn't leave until five o'clock, so she still had time. If she missed it, it would be bad, but not irretrievable. The island didn't close until tomorrow. She could still get home then. And if she had to wait until tomorrow, she had time to find Johnny. She looked out to sea through a wall of rain. A few seconds later, the entire horizon bloomed with white light. The storm was still a long way out, but it was getting closer, sailing towards her to the island like a warship. But then... Something else slowly tilted into focus. Not a memory, but something real. Here. Now. Up ahead, faint and imprecise. She broke into a run. Chapter 42 Stelzik had set up a desk in one corner and his laptop was still on top of it. There was a pile of books in the corner, stacked waist high, and a folder of notes, hole-punched and clipped to a binder. Rebecca went to the closet first. Inside there were rows of dog food cans, and above Stelzik's clothes. Stelzik, the real Stelzik, hadn't been a large man, so Rebecca suspected his clothes would be a decent fit for her. Better, certainly, than the ones she'd found at the gas station. The whole time, Roxy kept doing circles. Rebecca beckoned the dog towards her while trying to focus her attention on Stelzik's desk. But she was finding it hard to concentrate. Roxy just kept moving, stopping only occasionally to sniff the bed, the mattress, the unmade sheets and blankets. It's okay, Rox, Rebecca said. I understand. The room wasn't much, but Roxy had known it for almost seven months. She'd been here with Stelzik every day. Now he had simply gone. Except not entirely. She could still smell him in everything. Roxy finally came to a halt. Rebecca had removed the dressing from her face. Her eye remained a little pink, even though it had healed, but Roxy had been blinking a lot, as if it were irritating her. And in that moment, in the slump of her body, she was so human. 
inconsolable, heartbroken. Rebecca put a hand on her. I get it, she said again. I get it more than you can ever know. She started going through Stelzik's desk. In it, she found three notebooks. He'd already filled one and had been on his way to filling a second, but the third was blank. Rebecca fanned through the empty pages. At the store, she'd been using the inside of a cereal box to make lists of food and supplies to keep track of what she had, what she needed, and how long the canned food would last. But the notebook would be better, and it would allow her to do something else. For the entire time she'd been on the island, she'd been trying to work out why she and Johnny had been targeted. Why had Hain and Lima wanted them dead? What could they possibly have done? Rebecca was a doctor and a mother. Johnny was an unpublished writer and the assistant manager at a failing electronics store. It made no sense. Rebecca had lain awake at night, trying to set it out in her head, but too often it dissolved into chaos. It was the kind of chaos in which her friends and family had never reported her missing, in which Noella took her kids from her, in which Gareth cried crocodile tears whenever people asked where Rebecca was, and he told them he didn't know. She kept thinking about Johnny on that last day as well, the little things that had embedded in her memory. Like when her brother had begged Lima to spare them, offering to pay him when they got back to the city, and then Lima had cut him off, gun raised, and said, she ain't gone back, John. She, not you, not you and your sister, not both of you, just Rebecca. She ain't going back. Did that mean Rebecca had been the main target? And what about the look Johnny had given her after that? Like he'd been confused somehow. Like he'd been betrayed. Had she really seen that in his face? Or was it just the terror of the moment? Roxy brushed against her legs. Rebecca ran a hand through the dog's coat, switching her attention back to the empty notebook, trying to dismiss the thought about Johnny. Instead, she concentrated on what the pages of the notebook would allow her to do. Write everything down, slowly, meticulously, and try to make sense of it. And then she looked at Roxy again, and a different idea landed. It took a couple of journeys back and forth as Rebecca took blankets up the stairs to Stelzik's room and the supplies she'd gathered over the course of seven weeks. Every minute, Roxy got more excited, and by the time they'd finished, she didn't know what to do other than sprint from one end of the corridor to the other. Rebecca had only remained at the store to watch the ocean, to watch for the rescue she had hoped would come. Now that seemed forlorn. It was possible a helicopter might come back, and if it did, she'd have a pretty good view of it out of the hostel's first-floor windows. But there seemed little hope of a boat, at least one unconnected to Hain or Lima, passing so close to shore that they could see her waving them down. She'd come to the conclusion that the fishing lanes must be much further out, because she'd seen nothing on the water in seven weeks, which meant that, at this time of year, Trawlers didn't come close enough to the island to register her as a person, let alone to instigate some recovery. Nevertheless, after Rebecca had locked up the store as best she could and placed board at the window she'd smashed, she wrote SOS on the wood using some paint she'd found at the gas station. Once that was done, she collected some rocks, rubble and old pieces of masonry from a patch of scrub just out of town and brought them all back to the harbour. As Roxy waited patiently, Rebecca created a series of messages in the empty parking lot. Help me, and need rescue, and left behind. She got back to the hostel as it was growing dark. Using the rope from the car to secure the door from the inside, she tied it to a metal railing on one of the interior walls, then moved through to the kitchen to double-check the generator. Just as when she checked earlier, it was obvious that, like the other hostel, everything had been disconnected. She spent a while trying to reconnect wires, just in case, but something had been removed from the front panel, a battery or a power source, so any fantasy she'd had about a warm shower soon ended. She headed back up to the room. Roxy was curled up at the end of Stelzik's bed, completely ignoring the one Rebecca had made for her. 
I'm not sleeping on the floor, if that's what you're thinking. She smiled and went to the desk. There was a calendar on the wall above it. She could use it to replace the pebbles she'd been using at the store to count down the days. There was a laptop, too. She flipped up the lid, expecting it to be dead after going months without use, but, to her surprise, it sprang into life. There was still 9% battery left. Grabbing a blanket, she wrapped it around her shoulders, sat down, and used the trackpad to open some folders. Luckily, Stelzik hadn't used a password, so she had access to everything. But it soon became evident there was nothing of any real interest. Most of the documents were scans of textbooks, notes he'd made, or papers he'd been writing. She opened his email. No new messages loaded because there was no internet connection, and as she searched the room, she saw no phone line and no router. It probably meant Stelzik had been using his cell phone as a hotspot whenever he needed to fire off an email. She spent a couple of minutes digging through his things to see if she could find his cell, but she couldn't. Most likely, Lima had taken it, just as he'd taken Rebecca and Johnny's. She looked at the inbox again. This time, something caught her eye. Slowly, she began scrolling down. The further she went, the more she realized what was missing. She checked the trash just to be sure, but there was nothing in there either. Dread slithered through her stomach. She leaned away from the screen as if a part of her didn't want to have to look at it, and as she did, her mind spun back to the day Johnny had come to the house when he'd first asked to borrow her car. I've got an interview lined up for this Saturday, he told her, with a curator from the Museum of Natural History. It's taken me almost three months of emails to get him to commit. Except there were no emails from Johnny. Not even one. He and Stelzik had never been in touch. Before Helena Rebecca could see a hint of it in the distance now. She pushed herself harder, running faster, the loop empty ahead of her like a road at the end of the world. Keep going. Thunder rumbled. She tried to count the gap between claps, try to work out how far away the storm still was and how much time that gave her. Keep going. She kept repeating it to herself, dropping her head against the rain. But as she did, she saw that in the dark she'd strayed off the road. She stopped, exhausted. The road was about fifty feet from where she was, but even such a small deviation felt like a defeat. She dragged herself back, keeping her focus on the yellow lines, but she lost her rhythm and was shivering uncontrollably. A minute later, lightning forked across the clouds above her, terrifying, beautiful. That was when she spotted the bicycle. It was leaning against an old shack, the back wheel raised off the ground, turned every time the wind roused, each revolution bringing a muted squeal. Rebecca hurried to it, almost losing her footing in the water that was running out of the overflowing storm drains. Yanking the bike away from the shack, she wheeled it back to the road. She could feel one of the tires was soft, the movement of the bike slightly off, but she didn't care. Just started cycling. Rain was coming at her horizontally, and as thunder exploded directly above her, she wobbled, almost losing control. But then suddenly the road started to drop away. It was subtle at first, then became steeper, and she could see the town clearly, grey roofs, the harbour. Her adrenaline spiked. I'm almost there, Johnny. I'm almost in Helena. I'm going to find someone here who knows the forest, and I'm going to come back for you, I promise. Please don't be dead, John. Please don't be dead. Please don't be She hit the brakes. The bike screeched. The sound was so loud she heard it over the snarl of the wind and the machine gun crackle of the rain on the road. There were no lights anywhere in Helena. No cars, no vehicles, nothing at the harbour. It had been ninety minutes, maybe more since she'd got to the loop, ninety minutes of being out in the rain, so she'd expected to miss the ferry back. It wasn't a surprise to see no boat waiting for her. But where were the people who worked here? Why were there no cars in the parking lot? Why was there no sign of life? She hadn't noticed it at a distance, in the darkness, but she did now. 
The buildings were already shuttered, wooden boards fixed at windows and doors. It wasn't protection against the storm. It was protection against winter. No, 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 Rebecca muttered into the rain. She swung her legs off the bike and let it roll away from her. It clattered to the ground. By then she'd already broken into a run, sprinting down Main Street. The buildings on either side boarded, any sign of human life gone. At the bottom, the gates to the harbour had been pulled all the way closed, chains binding them together. On the other side, a padlock taunted her. No! she screamed, her voice instantly lost in the rain. This must be a mistake. It must be a trick. It can't be right. It can't be. She yelled into the night. And as a vibration moved through her chest, a faint wail escaped from her throat like the moan of an injured animal. Everyone's gone. Everyone's left already. She looked back along Main Street. Johnny had told her that tomorrow was the last day of the season. He talked about it on the ferry that morning. Even though it felt like centuries ago, she remembered exactly what he'd said. Halloween was the last day. But now she could see the truth. The island didn't close tomorrow. It closed today which meant Johnny had been mistaken. Or something much worse had happened. He'd lied. Chapter 43 Stelzik's laptop died fifteen minutes later. Rebecca stared at the black screen, the whole room dropping into darkness as night settled outside. Reaching for her flashlight, she flicked it on, her gaze returning to the computer. Why were there no emails from Johnny in Stelzik's inbox? Has Stelzik deleted them? If he had, why weren't they in trash? Rebecca glanced at Roxy, saw her staring back and muttered, Do people delete emails after putting them in the trash folder? Maybe some people did. Maybe Stelzik did. But it seemed a weird and very deliberate thing to do. Johnny had told Rebecca the day he asked to borrow her car that he'd been chasing Stelzik for three months. Had Stelzik become pissed off with Johnny's requests? Would that explain why he might go to the trouble of completely erasing Johnny's emails from his laptop? No, that didn't make sense either. If he was so pissed off, why agree to be interviewed at all? She looked at Roxy again, and a deep, pervading sense of unease spread inside her like an oil slick. Could Johnny really have lied to her? Why? She closed her eyes, hating the idea, an image forming in her head of the snow globe he'd bought her. She could see Kyra tilting it and letting it settle again over and over the night before Rebecca had come to the island. She could still see her brother with the gift box in his hands a couple of days before that when he'd handed it to her. I saw it and thought of you, he'd said. Her mind went even further back, digging through her best memories of him, trying to bathe in the certainty of them, and one in particular lodged with her. When Rebecca was seventeen, in her second year of A-levels, Johnny had flown to London to visit her. He'd managed to sell a five-thousand-word short story to a literary magazine on the West Coast, the one and only time he'd sold any of his writing to anyone, and had been paid four hundred dollars for it. When he talked to Rebecca on the phone, elated at the idea of being published, he told her he was going to use the cash to come and see her. She told him he didn't need to, that he should spend the money on himself, but he insisted. I miss you, he said, and the more she and Johnny talked, the more excited they became. She'd show him the city again, all the things that had changed since the families moved to America. And when she was at school, he would go and see all the literary sites the British Library, Baker Street, Highgate Cemetery, the homes of Keats, Dickens and Samuel Johnson. He landed on a rain-soaked morning, and Rebecca met him in the arrivals hall at Heathrow, both so glad he had come. They laughed on the tube, catching up on the things they'd missed in each other's lives. They dropped off his bag at the cheap, dreary B&B he'd paid for, close to where Rebecca boarded at school laughing about the sinister-looking woman on reception and renaming the place The Bates Motel. Then they went into the city and straight to the pubs, Rebecca high on the adrenaline of being with her brother, 
Johnny slightly delirious with jet lag. He told her it was so good to be back in England, to be able to share those moments with her in the country they'd grown up in. He said exactly the things that Rebecca expected from Johnny. Kind words, earnest, loving. He might not always be demonstrative. He might never say, I love you. But he didn't need to. Like their dad, he could convey what he felt in the way he looked at you in the simple act of spending all the cash he had on a flight. But then she came crashing out of the memory, and her thoughts darkened, and she remembered the last day of the season. She remembered how he told her that the island shut on the 31st of October when it actually closed the day before. Even though she'd been confused the night she'd made it to Helena in the rain, questioning her brother's motives, a man she thought she'd known better than anyone, she'd eventually put it down to a mistake, not deceit. Mixing up dates, forgetting the fine detail, those were traits of his, and always had been. He was a dreamer. His mind wandered because he was creative. She trusted her brother. He wasn't capable of deception, of cruelty, of such damage. But then that trip to London crawled back into her head. It had been perfect for two days, the pair of them as happy as Rebecca could remember them being. They went to museums, ate fish and chips beside the Thames, talked for hours and laughed even more. And then, on the third night, they went out with Rebecca's friends. She'd been so desperate for them to meet her brother. She'd been so proud of him. It turned into one of the worst nights of her life. The Stranger There didn't seem like there was anything up with Rebecca. Travis shuffled forward to the edge of the couch, pen poised above his notebook. Opposite him, Noella Sullivan shook her head and glanced at the camera he'd set up. Honestly, she seemed fine. She was a little stressed, I guess, you know, leaving the kids, having to make it over to John's for a certain time, but nothing that would have made me concerned. They were in Noella's living room, small but homely, paintings of Irish vistas on the walls. There were shelves with a few photographs, all of her with the Murphy family, and in particular, her with Rebecca Murphy's girls. Travis gestured to the pictures and said, You were obviously the designated babysitter. He said it with a smile, but her reaction was small and stoic. Yes, she said. I love those girls. It's important now for them to have some stability. Travis nodded trying to work out if there was something to interpret in her choice of response, then took a sip of the drink he'd asked for. He winced. Noella had made him a mint tea. It was something Gabby had put him on to, and that he'd frequently lapsed from drinking, but four days out from retirement, he was giving it another go. Why are you drinking something you don't enjoy? He glanced at Noella, who seemed amused now, he hadn't seen her smile before. She was pleasant, appeared concerned for the well-being of her friends, but it was clear she'd developed a tough hide. He knew she was thirty-six, but she was graying, looked older, more fortified. He wondered what had happened in her life to make her that way. He smiled again and said, My daughter tells me I need to cut back on my coffee intake. He looked down at his notes. So Rebecca never said where she and Johnny were going. It was such a rush. All I got out of her was Long Island. If it was a rush, that suggests they had to be somewhere for a specific time, Travis said. But it wasn't really a question, more a statement. Johnny had an interview lined up. Did he say with who? No. Beck just said it was for the book he was writing. Noella paused thinking, her expression pensive. I guess they had to leave early to meet whoever Johnny had set up the interview with. And you said you heard from her later on? Yeah, a couple of times. And she didn't say anything then? About where she was? Noella shook her head. No. When I say that now, it sounds crazy, but it just never came up. 
She was having a hard time being so far away from her girls. The furthest she'd been from them was the hospitals in the city, one shift at a time, and I don't think it ever dawned on her that she might feel so heartsick for them. So we were dealing with that. And then there were a lot of problems with reception. The calls kept dropping out. Dropping out or just dying? Travis was quiet as he made some more notes, trying to think about places on Long Island where the reception might be unreliable. It was hard to imagine there were many. Almost three million people lived in Suffolk and Nassau counties, seven and a half if you factored in Brooklyn and Queens. The island was big. It was populated and connected. He tapped his pen against the notebook thinking about the early start Johnny Murphy and his sister had made. Did Rebecca mention anything about getting a boat? Noella frowned. A boat? Maybe a ferry. She shook her head. No, nothing like that. Travis put a question mark next to the word ferry. He'd have to look into it some more. He knew there were hundreds of islands in the Long Island Sound, but a lot of them weren't accessible and even those that were you could normally only get to on ferries that sailed from Connecticut, not Montauk. Plus, so far, there was no evidence that the Murphys had got a boat anyway. Can't you just check her cell phone records or something? Yes, he replied. I've made a request for them. Then you can see where she went. He nodded. That's the hope. He forced down more of his tea, then changed tack. You were rushed into the ER back in September, is that right? She frowned, thrown by the change of direction. And Johnny came to see you at the hospital that night. He did, yeah. He was brilliant. Travis flipped back in his notebook to the timeline he'd written down, including the two hours and twenty-eight minutes that Murphy had had his cell switched off. Do you know if Johnny was there the whole time? He asked. She frowned again. He didn't leave to go anywhere else? No, she said. Not that I remember. Were you conscious the whole time he was there? She was trying to think. I'm not sure, she said eventually. Did any other friends or family come to see you that night? My boyfriend was away, and my dad is very sick and frail. So it was just Johnny, she said, and a sadness seemed to press on her. Travis glanced at the photos in the living room again. Her father was her only family. Rubbing the side of her face, Noella said, They put me out, she shrugged. So I guess I was unconscious for a part of the time John was there. Why are you asking me that? It's just a loose end, that's all. A loose end to do with my appendectomy? Travis smiled. She was smart. I'm just trying to get an idea of the type of person he is. Noella eyed him as if she still didn't really believe him. But then she gestured to a photograph on the wall of her in the center with Murphy, his sister and two other men, one younger, one older. Travis knew who they were because he'd already built a background on the entire Murphy clan. He'd even looked into the death of the younger brother Mike, but there had been nothing suspicious in it, just stupidity a young man driving an expensive car way too fast. You want to know what type of person Johnny Murphy is? Noella said, a little distance in her voice now, her eyes locked on the photograph of her with the family. Just ask around. Everyone will tell you exactly the same thing. He's basically the kindest, gentlest, most generous person you ever met in your life. Travis got home and watched the interview with Noella, then cooked some pasta, because it was easy and he was tired. At 7 p.m., he set up his laptop and waited for a Zoom call. It came through at 7.15. I'm so sorry I'm late, 
Kirsty Cohen said. She was a plain-looking woman in her late thirties, with auburn bangs and a pale complexion. Travis remembered from the first time he'd interviewed her, in the weeks after Louise had gone missing, that she was also energetic, helpful, and talked a lot. She'd clearly come straight from work. She still had her ID around her neck. It's no problem, Travis replied, and flipped to a fresh page of his notebook. What's the weather like down there in Baltimore? He'd asked the question to put her at ease, but Kirsty didn't stop talking for ten minutes about all the snow they'd been having in Maryland. Eventually, Travis had to cut her off. Something's come up, he said, and I wanted to talk to you about it. Oh, okay. Is there news on Louise? He paused, trying to figure out how much to tell her. He decided to give her the truth. I don't know if you've heard this, but your friend Rebecca Murphy and her brother Johnny, they're both missing. Her face dropped. What? So you didn't know? No. No, I had no idea. They disappeared seven weeks ago. What? She said again, and brought a hand to her mouth this time. Are you kidding? That's awful. What happened to them? I've only been working their case for a day, Travis said, his eyes drifting to a calendar on the wall, and he thought, I'm only going to be working it for three more. Detective Travis? He pulled himself back into the room. So I take it you haven't heard from Rebecca? No. No, not at all. I tried calling her a month ago, maybe more. Kirsty faded out. Actually, it must have been around the time they went missing, if you're saying it's been seven weeks. I tried calling her, and she didn't answer. So I called again a couple of times. I wanted to talk to her. About what? Well, you know. She was stumbling over her words. Travis waited her out. Well, you know, about Johnny. What about him? This time there was a flash of guilt in her eyes. Kirsty. You were asking me questions about him, about what Louise thought of him when they went out on those dates. And it only occurred to me after that, well, you must be thinking, you know, that he's a suspect in all of this. Travis let her carry on. I just wanted to talk to Beck about it. Why? I don't know. I guess I just wanted... She grimaced a little. Then the connection dropped for a second, her image juddering. I wasn't trying to warn him about anything, I promise. I just wanted to... Again, Travis said nothing. Just waited. I wanted to hear what she thought, that's all. I mean, she knows him better than anyone, and for him to have possibly been involved in something like Louise going missing. She stopped again. It just seemed totally crazy. I know Johnny a little bit, and I knew Louise would love him. I mean, I was right, because she told me after their first date that he was a really nice guy. He could be shy, quite introverted, but he was a real gentleman. To me, to Louise, to everyone. Rebecca always spoke real highly of him, too. But then, I don't know, I just kept... I kept going back to... She faded out. Travis shuffled forward in his seat, wanting to hear what had gone unspoken. When she didn't say anything, he prompted her. What? You kept going back to what, Kirsty? I don't know she said again. I just kept thinking about this one thing Beck told me, when she was really drunk, back when we were in college. Travis leaned even closer to the screen. What thing is that? he said. There was this incident, way back in the late nineties. An incident? In London. London? Travis frowned. London, England? Yeah, Kirsty said. Beck said that Johnny went a bit... 
She faded out, grimaced. Travis waited. She just said that something happened that night, and when she looked at him, it was like looking into the eyes of a stranger. Before Rebecca had chosen the pub because she knew Johnny, as a big fan of the movies, would love it. It was on Holloway Road, less than a mile from her halls, and built into the side of a beautiful grade two listed art deco cinema called The Regal. The pub was housed inside the cinema's original foyer, and it gave the decor a wonderful bygone elegance, with its hardwood stairs, marble floors, and geometric and sunburst patterns. On the wall behind the bar, there were huge posters for Double Indemnity and the Maltese Falcon, which was another reason Rebecca had chosen the place. Johnny had loved both movies, watching them on repeat growing up. Wow, he said as they entered. This is so cool. I thought you'd like it, Rebecca replied. Because they'd arrived at the pub early, it was relatively quiet, and they got to pick the best spot. A curved booth with a metal table built from the bones of an old film projector. This is amazing, Johnny said as they slid into the seat. Thanks so much for bringing me here, Beck. I love it. Rebecca's friends started to arrive just after five, and although Johnny was never great in crowds, particularly with people he didn't know, he put on his best show for her. He was sweet, funny, let Rebecca tell stories of when they were young, listened politely as the conversation moved to school, to the teachers there, to gossip about other students. At one stage, maybe four drinks in, Rebecca leaned in and asked if he was all right, and he told her he was enjoying himself. That wasn't entirely true, she knew. A few of her friends would bring him back into the discussion sometimes, but most of them, like Rebecca herself, were seventeen, armed only with fake ID, bravado, and a youthful belief that their story was the funniest and most important, and the only one that deserved to be heard. As the night went on, the pub became busier, eventually filling with Arsenal and Spurs fans. A North London derby was kicking off at Highbury at 8pm, and although uniformed officers were stationed all the way along Holloway Road, principally in an effort to keep the two sets of fans apart, some had scurried into the regal, unseen, and were shoulder to shoulder at the bar. Forty-five minutes before kick-off, Rebecca offered to get another round of drinks, because the Regal always stopped asking for ID once the crowds were too deep at the bar. As she was waiting, a guy in his late forties, his gut straining against a Spurs shirt, backed into her, spilling his pint on his boots. Fuck's sake, he muttered, turning angry, his expression fierce. But when he saw Rebecca, his ire instantly dissolved. He looked from her breasts to her face. You all right, love? She just nodded. You gonna apologize then? For what? What do you think? He gestured with the pint glass, lager sloshing around inside. I spilled half my beer on my shoes cause you backed into me. You backed into me. <laughs> Behind him, a friend peered over his shoulder. What we got here then? The friend said. A stuck up bitch by the look of things man said, and winked at Rebecca as if she should lighten up. Just messing. You out in mates? What's that got to do with you? The man looked beyond her, his eyes scanning the pub, trying to find the table where Rebecca was sitting. And then he spotted it. It wasn't hard, because, aside from Johnny, it was filled with seventeen-year-old girls. Bloody hell, the man said, catching his friend's attention and pointing at the table. Get rid of that queer boy and we'd do a bit of damage there, would he? Rebecca shook her head. Piss off, will you? What was that? The man said, leaning into her. I said, she responded, facing him down, even though he was almost twice her size. Why don't you two just piss off to the football? The man grinned again. You got a filthy mouth, Woody, the friend said, but the man shushed him. He and Rebecca were still staring at each other, his smile still there. Just leave me alone, she said. Women with mouths like yours are only good when you give them something to fill it with, the man said, sinking his beer. As he drank, he didn't take his eyes off her. 
You good on your back, love? This time, Rebecca chose not to reply, hoping her silence would diffuse the situation. She glanced over her shoulder and could see everyone on the table deep in conversation, unaware of what was going on. But then Johnny looked out across the pub, searching the crowd for her, and they found each other. I could teach you if you like, the man said. Drop dead, she muttered. Oh, yeah, he fired back, looking at his friend, deliberately creasing his face into an expression of faux ecstasy. All day talk, I love it, darling. The two of them burst out laughing. I bet you take it up the arse. The men wailed like hyenas. Rebecca tried to get the barman's attention. Please come and serve me. Seriously, though, do you take it up the arse, love? Please. The men erupted into laughter again. You all right, Beck? Rebecca turned to find Johnny standing at her right shoulder. He looked at the men, then at her. Johnny was no fighter, but in that moment she would rather have him at her side than not. He shuffled into the space between Rebecca and the men. Cover your ass, Woody, the man said. They laughed again, but the mood had changed. Looks like it's queer o'clock, Woody chipped in. Why don't you guys just give it a rest, Johnny said. Hello, it's G.I. Joe. He tried again. Just give it a rest, guys, okay? The man leaned all the way into Johnny, stopping so close to him that their noses were almost touching. I'll give it a rest whenever I fucking want to. He pushed Johnny in the shoulder. Johnny stumbled back into Rebecca, who stumbled into the people next to her. Straight away, she could tell that Johnny hated this that it scared him, that he was so far out of his depth he could barely see dry land. But he did what he had to do as her big brother. He stepped forward again into their space. I think you need to calm down. Or what? The man growled. Just... Johnny glanced at Rebecca. Or what? You gonna fight me? Saliva speckled Johnny's face. You gonna fight me? Just leave her alone. Johnny repeated meekly, wiping the saliva away from his cheek. Just go enjoy your soccer match and leave her alone. It's football, you fucking bender. Whatever, just leave her alone. Or what? That's enough. Enough? I'll tell you when it's enough. Johnny grabbed the man by the neck, clamping his fingers around his throat. It happened so fast, the movement so quick and unexpected, that for a second Rebecca barely processed what was happening. She didn't remember the last time Johnny had even so much as raised his voice in twenty years. She was pretty certain he'd never raised his fists. When he was picked on at school, pushed around, he never fought back. Mike would tell him he needed to, but he wouldn't. Except now he had. He was shoving the man to the floor, sending him crashing into a nearby table, stools toppling over, glasses smashing, the background music drowned in gasps and shouts from the bar staff. Rebecca looked down at the man splayed on the floor, his face a mix of shock and anger. And even as Johnny saw the bouncers rushing over, he wasn't done. He went for the friend, Woody, grabbing him by the hair, by the excess skin at his neck and throwing his head against the bar. Woody folded like a piece of paper, his pelvis hitting the hardwood, his face smashing against the countertop, nose breaking instantly, blood spattering. Johnny leaned over the man on the floor. I'll fucking kill you. He spat the words, violent, destructive. And of all the things that stayed with Rebecca about that night, two faces remained most vivid even years on. First Johnny's. There was corrosiveness behind his eyes, a rage that she'd not only never seen before, but had believed he simply wasn't capable of. It so shocked her that, in the hours afterwards, she convinced herself she must have been mistaken, that the emotion of the moment had skewed her memory. And then there was the second, that of the man on the floor. Rebecca saw the fury in him, the violence he was capable of, but the moment he went to get up, the moment his eyes found Johnny, it vanished. Johnny had made him cower. As soon as the bouncers arrived, one grabbing Johnny's arm, the other hauling the man up off the floor, everything altered, a fracture repairing itself. 
Johnny glanced at Rebecca and said, I'm sorry, Beck. He was her brother again, panicked, worried, his voice small. He repeated himself as he was marched away, one of the bouncers already on the phone to the police. But Rebecca never forgot that night. Or the stranger who had been her brother. Chapter 44 The gas station was pitch black. She flooded the forecourt office with light from the Cherokee, then hurried with Roxy around to the back. Once inside, Rebecca cranked on the generator, listened to it rattle out of its slumber, and then, as bulbs flickered into life above her, she went through to the front office. She'd come armed with Stelzik's laptop. There was no juice left in the battery, so when she tried powering it on after plugging it in, she got no response. Tapping out an impatient rhythm on the desk, she felt Roxy brush past her legs, sniffing her way around the floor of the office. Rebecca looked down at her, and then her eyes drifted back to the denims she was wearing. She'd returned to her own clothes, and for the first time saw what a state they were in. Blood, mud, grass stains. She'd torn one of the pockets on her first day here so that it just flapped against the top of her thigh. As she thought of that, her mind went all the way back to what Johnny had told her. Tomorrow was the last day. She didn't know any more if it had been a mistake or a lie. She switched her attention to the laptop and tried powering it on again. This time, it worked. The black screen turned white and it began to load. As soon as it was done, she went to Stelzik's email. When she'd used the laptop at the hostel, his inbox had already been open, presumably because it had been left that way the last time the PC had gone to sleep. Now, though, because she'd been forced to reboot the laptop, she had to wait for the browser to fire up. Once it had, she clicked on the shortcut for Stelzik's Gmail and started scrolling through messages again. She wanted to make sure she'd been right the first time and there were no emails between Johnny and Stelzik. There weren't. She checked sent and trash, then went through some of the colour-coded folders that Stelzik had created and in which he'd stored things like important messages, research and scans. Again, she found nothing. Next, she went to the browser history. The last three entries were all related to his email, and there was one entry each for inbox, trash and sent. Rebecca looked at the dates and times. Saturday, 30th of October. 1445 through to 1503. She flashed on a memory of getting to the Cherokee after being left for dead in the forest and of seeing 1458 on the car's clock. At the same time as she was bleeding, scared and confused, as she was wondering where her brother was, someone had come here to Stelzik's room and spent 18 minutes in his email. Between 1445 and 1456, they were in the inbox. 1456 to 1500 in scent, and the remaining three minutes were spent checking trash. Had Johnny's emails to Stelzik been deleted in those 18 minutes? It made sense. If you were looking to delete emails, you'd go through the inbox first, then check sent, and then you'd make sure trash was empty of them as well. But who had deleted the emails? Lima? Hain? Johnny? If it was Lima and Hain, why haven't they just taken the whole laptop or, at the very least, wiped the browser history? That would have meant fewer questions. As it was, it was still possible to track what had been happening on the PC that day. There was another mystery, too. Wasn't anyone missing Stelzik back in New York? He, like Rebecca, hadn't come home on the last day of the season, so why hadn't anyone he knew, or might have been in contact with, raised the alarm about him. Unlike in Rebecca's case, the people he worked with would have known where he was. He'd have told them he was going to Crow Island. But then she got her answer. She'd missed it the first time, but now as she looked again, she saw an email in the sent folder she hadn't paid attention to. It had gone out at 14.57 on the 30th of October. The timing coincided exactly with what Rebecca had already discovered in the browser history. More than that, it meant whoever had used the laptop hadn't just been deleting emails. They'd been using the account to write them, too. 
Chapter 45 The email was to someone called Gideon Burroughs at the Museum of Natural History. Stelzik, or whoever had pretended to be him, had told Burroughs he'd decided to extend his stay on the island for a while longer, into the winter months, because he was on the verge of making a big, very exciting discovery. I've arranged transport back to New York for when I'm finished. I'll be in touch. Sooner or later, when Stelzik didn't resurface, someone would start to ask questions about what had happened to him. But maybe that was the reason why the laptop had been left. If it was still here, browser history intact, along with Stelzik's clothes and belongings, it looked much less suspicious. His body was buried next to the tree roots in the forest, but if it was never found, there was no evidence he'd been murdered and, given his apparent decision to stay during the winter alone on the island, if he went missing, the only logical conclusion was that he'd had an accident. She could hear her dad for a moment, ticking off the obvious outcomes people would reach. He'd slipped somewhere and knocked himself out. He fell into the ocean. Maybe they might even think he killed himself. Rebecca found herself nodding, as if her father were in the room with her. Whatever Burroughs and the rest of the staff at the museum thought was the reason Stelzik hadn't returned. It tied into something else Hayne had said to Lima on the night Rebecca had followed them to the beach. You brought the wrong car back. He'd wanted the Cherokee, not Stelzik's Chevy. If the Chevy had been left behind, it would have played into the whole idea of Stelzik staying on, then perishing unexpectedly in some accident. Rebecca checked through the inbox again, through his address book, some of the folders he had with photographs in them, trying to figure out why no one except Gideon Burroughs might miss Stelzik. But then it started to become clear. Stelzik wasn't married, and he didn't have kids. A family wasn't looking for him. She leaned back on the stool, away from the screen, disturbed by what she was seeing. Could Johnny really have been involved in this deceit? Rebecca shook her head, wanting to rid it of the thought. But she couldn't. Not quite. There were just too many truths. She'd never seen her brother after she'd fallen into the gully. All the timings on Stelzik's laptop lined up perfectly with the idea of him coming here. And the memory of what her brother had done that night in London still burned brightly. There was something else, too. Something to which she'd barely given any thought since it had happened. Kirsty's call to Rebecca before she and Johnny had come out to the island. She'd said she wanted to talk about Johnny, and when Rebecca had asked Johnny about it on the ferry over here, he'd told her he had no idea what Kirsty might have wanted. But was he lying about that too? Why would Kirsty want to talk about Johnny? And then, as she looked at the laptop again, at the folders in Stelzik's email, she remembered she hadn't checked the spam. She opened it. Inside, there was one message she hadn't seen. It had been sent to Stelzik on the afternoon of the 29th of October, the day before Rebecca and Johnny had arrived on the island. When they'd found Stelzik in the forest that first day, Rebecca had guessed from the condition of his body that he'd already been dead for 24 hours, so it was possible that Stelzik had never read this message. That would certainly explain why it was still in his spam. Not that there was much to read. The email was empty. Confused, Rebecca's gaze went from the message window up to the sender and their email address. It took her a second to recognize the name. And then her world fell apart. Doubts Travis had breakfast at his desk, his last ever Friday on the force, and spent three hours on the phone to the Metropolitan Police in London. Eventually, after being put on hold for what felt like the thousandth time, he landed up with someone who offered to help him. Inside a couple of hours, a copy of a two-decade-old arrest report dropped into his inbox. He started reading. Johnny Murphy had never been charged, so the report was light on detail. But the bottom line was that he'd put one guy in hospital and had told another that he would kill him. 
Kirsty Cohen had told Travis that Murphy had been like a stranger, according to his sister, and the report backed that up. Murphy didn't deny things that got out of hand, and that he'd gone too far, even accepted the blame for everything, but said the two men had been aggressive and inappropriate towards Rebecca, and it was clear that she was struggling to deal with it on her own. For some reason, Travis thought of the moment, right at the end of the video interview he'd done with Murphy, when he'd tried the old trick of prolonging the silence. Travis had made it uncomfortable and awkward, feeling certain that Murphy was the type of person who would hate stuff like that. But all Murphy had done was sit there quietly and wait for Travis. He'd tried to play Murphy, but maybe Murphy had played him. The doubts had their nails in him now. There was no denying the arrest report, no denying that somewhere in Murphy there was a man capable of violence. If you accepted that, you had to accept that he might have abducted Louise Mason. Because that was what this was, an abduction. It had been three months since she'd last been seen at the fundraiser. There had been no sightings of her at all. It was impossible to believe that this was a decision taken of her own free will. Yet Travis had dismissed Murphy as a suspect back in October. His instinct at the time was that Murphy was telling him the truth. Character witnesses then, and character witnesses like Noella Sullivan even now, all said Murphy was a good guy. Travis had spoken to the hospital where Noella had been taken, and they'd confirmed that they encouraged patients and their families to switch off their phones in certain areas of the building, which was exactly what Murphy had done. That explained the missing two hours as well. Something else bugged Travis, too. Why leave the hospital to go all the way back to the hotel? Geographically, it was a huge hassle. It didn't mean it hadn't happened, but Travis was wavering. And at the back of his head, there was something else nagging at him. All of this revised focus on Johnny Murphy had started with an anonymous call to his phone at work in the middle of the night from a man who didn't want to leave his name or stay on the line. But because Travis had been so desperate for a break in the case, and because he was so short of time, he'd run with it. Now he didn't know who was telling him the truth. He didn't know who was lying and he had only four days left to get to the answer. Chapter 46 Rebecca stared at the name of the sender, at the email address of the person who'd contacted Carl Stelzik with an empty message. Willard Hodges. That was the name Gareth had been using on the cell phone she'd found in the car the same email he'd been using to book hotel rooms on wine estates and buy clothes for another woman in high-end stores. His alias, his secret identity, the name he'd used for his affair. She stared at the email, unable to process what it meant, tears welling in her eyes. Are you really doing this to me? She said quietly. First Johnny, now this. Are you really all doing this to me? She moaned the question into the silence of the gas station, then put a hand over her eyes, burying herself in the darkness. But all she could see now was Gareth. It was that day in the brownstone when she'd got home and found him alone at the kitchen table with a bottle of bourbon. I'm sorry, Beck, he'd said to her, and then he told her Willard Hodges was just a name he'd made up. Random. Unimportant. She opened her eyes again and looked at the screen. Except it wasn't unimportant at all. Gareth had contacted Carl Stelzik, but why? How would he have known Stelzik in the first place? She calmed herself, tried to get her thoughts into some sort of order. It had to be through Johnny, surely, although she was uncertain of how. He and Gareth had never been close even during the best times Rebecca had had during their relationship, and that had been exacerbated after Gareth had turned up late to their father's funeral. They definitely hadn't been in touch since the split. That you know about. 
She tried to shake her head free of interference. Could Johnny and Gareth really be working together? Why would either of them want to see harm come to Rebecca? And what about the message? It was empty. There was no message. So what was it? A test to see if Stelzik's email worked? What did that mean? That Stelzik was involved too? The day Lima had tried to kill her and Johnny, he told Rebecca that Stelzik was just a loose end. That suggested Stelzik was ancillary to all of this, not central to it. Or maybe it didn't. She stared at the email again, then snapped the laptop shut. She didn't know what was going on, but she was going to find out. Chapter 47 Over the next few days, while Roxy lay next to her or roamed the empty corridors of the hostel, Rebecca wrote everything down on the pad she'd found in Stelzik's room. She put hours of effort into finding direct tethers between Gareth and Stelzik, but she could only get from Gareth to Stelzik via Johnny. She couldn't figure out if Stelzik and Johnny had been working together to lure her to the island, and if so, why, or whether Johnny and Gareth were plotting, and Stelzik was some sort of patsy. But that raised just as many questions, given the relationship between her brother and her ex. So if she discounted Johnny, Gareth was the person she should be looking at, which returned Rebecca to an idea she'd already had, that Gareth wanted her out of the way and Noella might even have been the reason he had invented the name Willard Hodges. But did she really believe that? Her husband was capable of deceiving her, that much was true, but did she really believe he wanted her dead? Did she believe Noella, her best friend, basically her sister, would be complicit in an affair with her husband and in a plot to get rid of Rebecca for good? And what about Johnny? Something held on inside her, a tiny flicker of light, a certainty that the man she'd grown up with, even the man she'd glimpsed in London that night, simply wasn't capable of something as insidious as this. And if she believed that about him, she must believe it about Noella too. So that just left Gareth. That was when she saw her mistake, when she saw she'd overlooked two people in this jigsaw who were definitely involved. Hain and Lima. As soon as they pulled back into focus, she started to find a logical path through some of the questions, particularly the lack of emails to Stelzik from Johnny. Although a whisper of doubt about Johnny wouldn't leave her, two nights later she had paper all over the room, stuck to the walls, the front of the closet, even to the door when it was closed, and she could see clearly. It was far more likely that Hain and Lima had deleted Stelzik's email chain with Johnny, not her brother. Stelzik had been dead for at least a day by the time she and Johnny had found him, and she remembered something else. As he'd pointed his gun at them both, Lima had said, I've been trying to find that frigging dog since I offed Stelzik. If Rebecca was right and Stelzik's body had been 24 hours old, it meant Roxy must have been loose in the forest for at least the same amount of time and that Lima had been on the island the day before Rebecca and Johnny arrived. He must have come to take care of Stelzik first. She looked at one of the notebook pages she'd mounted. It had a solitary question written on it, the question her father had always said was the starting point for every case he'd ever worked. Why? Number one. Coming a day early gave Lima time to take care of Stelzik, the loose end. If Stelzik had been left alive and was then questioned by cops looking for Johnny and Rebecca, he could have discussed the fact that he'd been in contact with Johnny. But there was more to it than that. After spending hours opening and closing different files and applications, Rebecca stumbled across an activity log on the laptop. It took her some time to figure it out. She was a long way from being any kind of expert, but she soon started to notice a regular pattern in it. Stelzik's IP address kept changing. The reason landed hard. His laptop was being accessed remotely. He was being spied on. And if Hain and Lima were watching emails between Johnny and Stelzik, it was just as likely 
in fact certain that they were watching all of Johnny's emails. Perhaps even more disturbingly, they not only knew that Johnny had agreed to come to Crow Island to meet Stelzik on the 30th of October, they knew that Rebecca was coming too. And the fact that they'd known that meant they'd been keeping as close an eye on Rebecca as they had on her brother. Because she hadn't even suggested accompanying Johnny to the island until a day and a half beforehand. It had been a last-minute decision, and Hain and Lima had been able to react to it immediately. Even scarier, Rebecca had agreed to go with Johnny during a telephone call, not in an email. It meant that Hain and Lima hadn't just been looking at her inbox. They'd been listening to her phone calls, too. On another piece of paper that she'd stuck to the closet doors, she'd written the words, Perfect Combination, and underlined them. That was what Rebecca's decision and Crow Island had turned out to be. Johnny's interview and her offer to drive him out to it had brought them to an island that was not only almost entirely unpopulated, but more than a hundred miles from the mainland and dominated by a forest, this dense, sprawling burial site where they could easily be disappeared without anyone noticing. And yet there was still the solitary question, why? Roxy jumped onto Rebecca's bed, disturbing her train of thought, and nosed her way under the blankets. Since the middle of December, it had been bitterly cold, so Rebecca let her come in and returned her attention to the walls. For the first time, her gaze didn't land on the why, but instead on Stelzik's calendar. She looked at the days she'd marked off, at what day it was today, and everything else fell away. Instantly, she stopped thinking about why anyone would watch her and Johnny, much less try to kill them. In its place came a powerful, overwhelming and paralysing sense of loss. Christmas Day. In her head, she saw images of her girls around the tree, giggling with excitement, their new toys scattered around them, and as she did, she crumbled. She was overrun by rapid, aggressive flickers of life at the brownstone, and all the doubts about Gareth, about Noella flooded back. She curled over, sank into herself. She sobbed, saying the names of her girls out loud, as if it would draw them closer, as if she was back home with them again, as if none of this had ever happened, as if no one had tried to murder her, and as if she'd never had to ask why. Before. Why? She shook her head. Why? They were standing outside the gates of Rebecca's boarding school, a tube train rumbling across a series of empty railway arches further along the street. There was a charge in the air that had nothing to do with the rain. It was the morning after Johnny had been arrested. I'm so sorry, Beck, he said, head down. You and me both. I know I embarrassed you. You embarrassed yourself, John. He nodded, looked up at her, didn't say anything. I didn't even know you were capable of that. Is this who you are? He frowned. No, he said. Then how the hell do you explain what happened? He looked at her, then away, as if he didn't know how to articulate himself. The train disappeared from view. Do you remember my freshman year? Rebecca stared at him. What? My freshman year. He stopped and took a breath. When those kids at school picked on me. Do you remember I told you, Mike, and Dad about it? What has that got to do with anything, John? The type of person I am, he said, was forged in those moments. I told you guys some of it, but not all. Most of it I try to forget. I was 15 with this dumb accent I've never been able to shake off. Not American, not English, not one or the other. I came to hate it. His eyes flashed. He was hurting. Why was he telling her this? You'd have been all right if you'd been in America, at school with Mike and me. Kids would have heard your accent and thought, she's English, and that would have been the end of the story. Maybe it would even have marked you out as cool. Mike, he always did fine because he sounded like he was born and bred in New York. 
but me, my accent got me noticed. Kids would accuse me of being a fake, of trying to put on an English voice or an American one. It got so bad I stopped speaking some days. I kept my mouth shut and walked around school in total silence. But that got me noticed too. The things I loved doing, not sport, not math or science, but reading, writing, art, they became another difference. All I tried to do was fade into the background in everything I did. From the second I got into school, and none of it worked. He glanced at her, his eyes wet. Johnny, I... It was just utterly relentless, he said, the words catching in his throat. I got cornered in the bathrooms. I got pushed around at the lockers. I got my books stolen and ripped up, or they toss them in the trash, or they flush the pages down the can. I'd be walking home and they'd throw garbage at me. They'd dance around mimicking my accent, calling me a retard and a fag. It got so bad, no one wanted to spend time with me. I was a contaminant. If you ever got caught with me, he faded out. I didn't really want to talk about it at home. I just wanted to be home. I wanted to be somewhere safe. So last night at the pub, it all just came out. There were so many times I wanted to do that. So many times I dreamed about it. I always backed down. I was always Johnny, the kid who took it on the chin. Johnny, the quiet one, or the arty one, or the lonely one, or the pathetic one. He looked at her. Those two assholes back. I didn't want to take it anymore. Johnny, Rebecca stopped. I didn't, you didn't know because I didn't want you to know. I didn't want any of you to know how bad it got for me. Why? I felt weak, I guess, alone. The only times I ever felt normal was when I was with you, Dad, and Mike, when we were a family. I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want you to treat me differently. The normality kept me sane, but as weird as it sounds now, I think a part of me... I was jealous of you, Beck. Of me? She frowned. Why? You know what the difference is between you and me? He waited for an answer, but she couldn't think of one. She had no idea why he would ever be jealous of her. You don't survive and flourish through luck, or some vague hope that it'll get better, or the occasional big idea paying off like I do. You do it through logic. You get a problem, you work it out, you succeed, and you move on. You're so much like Dad, it's, it's kind of scary. I think he was right. You would have made a good cop. He forced another smile, but it was like it pained him to do it. So, you want to know why I'm jealous of you, Beck? The rain was getting heavier. The city was louder than ever. But all of it seemed to fade away. It's because you know how to fight back. Chapter 48 it's because you know how to fight back. She remembered Johnny's words just before she went to bed on New Year's Eve. By the time she woke up the next day, something had changed in her. It was subtle, but there, a determination she hadn't felt in a long time. I need to be ready. January was so cold she didn't go outside unless Roxy needed a toilet break. It barely crawled above zero for weeks, frosts and sleet almost every day. She used her time indoors to lay everything out, expanding into the first floor corridor, sticking pieces of paper to the wall there as well. Every piece was a slightly different size, most taken from Stelzik's blank pad, but she found some coloured card downstairs too. When that ran out, she started using old pages from browning newspapers and magazines that had been left behind. She used the card originally in an attempt to colour code her thinking, but her system soon fell apart. There wasn't enough card, and nowhere near enough colours, so she just wrote in big letters using the thickest pen she could find, so she could see everything clearly and precisely, even at distance. In February, the skies brightened, but it was still freezing. 
the hostel like an icebox during the day and even worse at night. That was when it finally dawned on her why people abandoned the island during the winter. The caustic cold, the relentless wind, the storms that would roll in three or four times a week and feel as if they were about to lift the entire hostel from its foundations. It was brutal and ferocious. But the weather didn't stop her working. If anything, being indoors so much helped her. By the end of February, she'd filled one side of the corridor end-to-end -end with all the things that needed doing before the first day of the season. Most days, after supply runs, after she'd ensured they had enough food for another week, her focus would shift. She'd drag a chair out into the corridor, swathe herself in blankets, and go over the question of how. How was she going to get off the island on the 1st of April? How would she do it without being noticed? How far away should she get before calling the cops? The idea of calling them straight away, of finding someone on the ferry who'd brought a cell phone with them and not trying to make it off at all, was magnetic. She kept coming back to it, and many nights she'd wonder if she even needed a phone. After Hain and Lima had headed out to the forest to try to find her body, she could make a scene in Helena, scream and head to whatever passed for the authorities on the island. The way the two men had talked when they'd come back to the island together, it was obvious they didn't want anyone to know what they were up to. And yet she couldn't quite let go of the doubts. What if they weren't working alone? The idea that Hain and Lima had someone on the island they knew and worked with wouldn't dislodge once it had entered her head. If there was even a remote possibility that it was true, it meant asking for help was a risk. So, in the end, she decided to stick to her original plan. Get off the island. Raise the alarm on the mainland. Except even then, even when it was clear in her head, she still couldn't relax. It wasn't just that two murderers were coming back to the island for her. It wasn't that she was so scared of their return she could barely breathe. It was that there was only one way to flee the island, and that was on the ferry. When it left at five o'clock, Rebecca would be on it. And once they failed to find her body in the forest, once they knew she wasn't dead, so would Hain and Lima. Chapter 49 The corridor of paper wasn't Rebecca's only project. She also started running again. She used a pair of jogging pants that Stelzik had brought with him, one of his T-shirts, and the old woolen sweater she'd found in the gas station. To begin with, she could manage a mile and a half, which wouldn't even have been a warm-up for her in her youth. But gradually, as the days and weeks passed, she got faster, going longer distances, running on the deserted, frost-peppered roads, knowing she had to get faster and stronger. At the beginning of March, she cut her hair short, sitting in front of the mirror in Stelzik's room with a blunt pair of scissors she'd found in one of the kitchen drawers. It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. It made running easier because her hair no longer got in her face when the wind picked up, and from there she pushed herself further. On Sundays, she would run the entirety of the loop, all 23 miles of it because it made her feel in control of something powerful and purposeful. For three and a half hours, she wasn't thinking about anything else. When she ran, she was just moving forward and with one solitary goal in mind. She needed to be unbreakable once the island reopened. Sometimes when she got back to the hostel, she could hear the echoes of her father as if his voice were in the wind. She could picture her and Mike in the front yard of their place on 81st Street after they'd finished a run and see their dad standing on the porch, repeatedly telling Mike to stretch properly. If you don't stretch, he would say, I promise you'll be walking like John Wayne in the morning. And then Mike would stretch half-heartedly, and the next day, like clockwork, he'd come down to the breakfast table, pretending everything was normal, even though he could barely move. She upped her running again in March, going even further, making use of the milder weather and the candy bars in the store for energy. She knew she needed to change herself and prepare for what was coming. And the more she ran, the more it helped her focus when she returned to the hostel. Her heart pounding in her chest, 
her clothes soaked with sweat, she would sometimes sit and look at the paper she'd stuck to the wall of the corridor, mismatched and overlapping, sticky tape everywhere, scrawled, untidy writing that only she could understand, before she did anything else, including stretching. Sorry, Dad, she'd say quietly, her routine pushed aside so she could study everything she'd collated. Very quickly, the why became the most important part of the corridor, the area she spent most time in, and the area she continued to add to. And within the why section was the area she focused on most of all. To a stranger, it would look like an untidy waterfall of names. To Rebecca, it was a suspect list. Chapter 50 the list had started in January with just five pieces of paper, all torn from Stelzik's notebook by hand. The edges were imperfect and the sizes all slightly different, but it didn't matter. She'd knelt in the corridor, laid the pieces of paper out in a row on the floor in front of her, and written a name on each one. Johnny, Gareth, Noella, Hain, Lima. Under each one, on a fresh piece of paper, she wrote a possible motive. For Hain and Lima, it was difficult. She still had no idea why they wanted her dead, didn't even know who they were and how or when she might have crossed paths with them. So instead, she concentrated on what she did know, what they looked like and what she could remember them saying the night they'd come back to the island. Beneath that, she posed the same question below their names. Are they working alone or with other people? She turned her attention to the other people. Writing, working with Hain and Lima, under each of the three names, she set about coming up with possible motives for Johnny, Gareth, and Noella. Using a ball of string she'd found in the general store, she began slicing off lengths of twine with a cooking knife, then mooring the suspects to one another, the string indicating a confirmed connection. That became easier as she added more names to the wall. There was a confirmed connection between Gareth and Carl Stelzik because of the email. There was one between Johnny and Kirsty Cohen, whom she added as well, based not only on the fact that Johnny had known Kirsty, but that Kirsty had called asking to speak to Rebecca about Johnny the day before they'd left for the island. Over the course of the days and weeks that followed, she added more and more names to the walls. Doctors she'd worked with, other mothers she knew, friends from college, a few people she'd fallen out badly with down the years. She'd even written Daniel at the top of a piece of paper and the names of other men she'd slept with before Gareth, trying to remember if there was anything that might be worth thinking about further. There wasn't. One of the last names on the list was her father's, although he'd already been dead for over two years, so it was hard to imagine how he could be connected to any of this. Maybe someone he'd arrested? Maybe someone out for revenge? Even though some of it felt like a stretch, under each name she listed things she'd done with that person, major events or memorable occasions that might be linked to what had happened to her on the island. She tried especially to think of times when both she and Johnny had done something as a pair with that person. That looped back in Gareth and Noella, perhaps Kirsty as well, but Rebecca struggled to think of many other mutual acquaintances. But still, it was reasonable to assume that the catalyst for Lima wanting them dead was something that Rebecca and her brother had done together. After weeks of collation and study, she kept coming back to the same five names. The first three were the people she was closest to. Gareth, because of the email to Stelzik and the affair he'd had with a woman Rebecca had never wanted to ask about. Noella, because she described Gareth as good-looking, confident and charming, and because of that weird last phone call in the forest when she'd stayed silent on the line before appearing to hang up just after Rebecca had told her they were on Crow Island. And then there was Johnny. In her heart, she still believed her brother had had nothing to do with what had gone on. But there were small questions she couldn't answer or deny, the way he'd simply vanished after Rebecca had fallen into the gully or getting the last day of the season wrong, or the way he'd said to Rebecca as they stood waiting to be shot, that everything was his fault. The fourth name on the wall was a separate reason she couldn't dismiss her brother yet. 
Kirsty Cohen. Because under both her name and Johnny's, pieces of string coming from each and joining at the top of a fresh piece of paper, there was another name. Louise. The woman Johnny had been dating, the woman he and Rebecca had briefly talked about on the ferry over. Rebecca remembered how reluctant Johnny had been to discuss Louise, although she knew it wasn't unusual for him to be guarded about his love life. In fact, it had happened many times before. He didn't make a big deal of dating until it looked like it might actually be going somewhere. He and Louise hadn't gone anywhere. Rebecca had never met Louise, didn't know anything about her, even her surname. But still, for some reason, she decided she didn't want to see Johnny anymore, and it was Kirsty who'd originally set them up, so there remained question marks. More often, though, her gaze would be drawn to the same part of the wall, to a fifth name she'd added much later than the others. She'd been awake one night, unable to get warm, a rainstorm buffeting the hostel windows, when she'd begun to think about the why again. And that was when she realised she'd missed someone her mother. Rebecca knew nothing about her, barely even remembered what she looked like, but that only added to her sense of disquiet. Was it more likely that all of this stemmed from the actions of someone like Johnny, whom Rebecca had trusted and known her entire life, or from the type of person who would just abandon three young children? With sympathy cards don't count. Rebecca thought, remembering the envelopes that had turned up in the mail after Mike and her father had died. She couldn't imagine where her mother's life and whatever she'd done with it intersected with hers and Johnny's, let alone why someone would want them dead because of it. But of all the people she'd put up on the walls of the hostel, all the names she'd added, all the theories she'd constructed and tried to shackle together into a cohesive argument, she knew the least about her mother. To Rebecca, Fiona Camberwell was a total stranger. Midwinter Pier She watched Axel from the living room, all the lights off, the only glow coming from the television which was playing reruns of old shows. He was letting himself into the house, being as quiet as he could, and he paused, the door still open, snow flittering inside, and looked up the incline of the stairs. He was trying to figure out if he'd woken her, seemed genuinely concerned about it. Most of the time, that was what he was like. Hey, she said. He looked in her direction, became aware that the television was on, that light was dancing along the corridor towards him, painting its walls and floors, and he turned, the soles of his shoes squeaking on the parquet. Oh, he said. Hey, I thought you might be asleep already. Just watching some TV. He came forward, stopping in the living room doorway, the TV bleaching one side of his face so it looked like he was wearing half a mask. Have you had a good day? she asked. Long. Even though it's late, I thought we could get takeout. Okay. He smiled. That sounds nice. You choose. But he eyed her. He could see something was up. Are you okay? He asked. I'm fine. You just seem a little... They looked at each other, and he didn't say anything else, because he knew what was wrong with her, and it didn't need repeating. Instead, he came further into the room, eyes switching to the TV, to the L.A. Law rerun that was silently playing. Oh, I love this one, he said, eyes lighting up, looking at her as if they were in the middle of a conversation about something else entirely. It was like he didn't have any cares in the world. This is the one where Rosalind turns around and just steps into that elevator. She watched him. Oh, this is it, Axel said, smiling again to himself, moving closer to the TV. Blobs of snow were melting on the hard wood floor now. This is where she drops. He chuckled, perching on the edge of the couch. Here we go. 
On screen, the doors to an elevator opened, and one of the characters, not realizing the car hadn't arrived, stepped into the empty shaft. Damn, he said quietly. What a way to go. He glanced at her and smiled again. She smiled back. And when his eyes returned to the television, she kept looking at him, turning things over in her head. She started thinking about relationships, about how they evolved over time, and about how sometimes, hard as it was, they left you no choice. You just had to walk away. Early the next morning, Tillman was waiting for her on a bench at the end of Pier 15. The city was in deep freeze, the sky gunmetal gray and hanging like a ceiling on the verge of collapse. With the wind whipping off the river and the snow staying in and out of existence, it was a smart place to meet. As she made her way off the esplanade and along the beached wood of the pier, she didn't pass a single other person. No one was brave enough or stupid enough to be out here. No one except them. She sat down next to him, pulling her coat tighter around her. Next to her, Tillman didn't move, just kept his gaze on the river. He sat with his coat collar up and a scarf over his mouth. But his skin was still scoured red and his eyes were watering. He said, Whoever made the decision to meet out here is clearly a moron. It was a joke. It had been his. They stayed like that for a moment because they both knew what they were here for and neither wanted to begin. But then Tillman shifted his weight on the bench, turned to her and said, What do you want to do? I want to try to pretend we aren't having this conversation, she replied, then glanced at him out of the corner of her eye. She smiled, although it was sad, fleeting. We can wait, Tillman said. Will waiting make it any better? Tillman shrugged. His silence was him being generous. It wasn't going to get any better. They had a problem, and it would need to be addressed. Look, Tillman said. After today, Travis has three days left as a cop. From what I hear, he's made absolutely zero progress. The whole case is in the swamp, and he's up to his neck with no way out. There's no chance in hell this is going to be solved before he goes. So we can wait and see if anyone else picks up the reins. It might happen, and if it does, we can delay for now and make the decision then. Tillman paused as the wind came again, colder and harder than before. He tightened the scarf around his chin. But you know, he looked at her, even if Louise Mason gets filed and forgotten, it's still in her drawer somewhere. This whole thing will still be hanging over us. She watched as a plane dropped out of the clouds, like a dolphin diving beneath the surface of the ocean. It was banking in their direction, heading towards Newark. For a moment, she thought of escape of taking a plane somewhere and disappearing for good. Then she said, What was she like? Who, Louise? No. She shook her head. Rebecca. Tillman eyed her. I don't know. You never met her? No. I hear she was a doctor. She could see the concern on Tillman's face. He was worried she was losing focus. Takes a lot to become a doctor. Takes a lot to become all sorts of things. He shut her down, maybe rightly. This was a discussion that wasn't going anywhere good, and even if she ignored him and kept asking questions, she'd end up the only casualty. She'd look weak and indecisive in front of him when she needed to be ruthless and single-minded. Rebecca wasn't the reason they were here. Neither was Louise. This was about someone else entirely. Just give him a little longer, she said.
Chapter 51 On the 10th of March, the gas station ran out of fuel. Rebecca had never expected there to be enough to last until her final month on the island, but even so, as the lever on the nozzle clicked empty, she felt an acute sense of loss. There were twenty-two days still to go until the ferry came, and during the awful protracted nightmare of her enforced stay on the island, only the jeep, her running, and Roxy had brought her any joy at all. She had enough in the tank to get the car back to the dig site, so, as Roxy sat watching from the back seat, sensing Rebecca was upset, they took the loop east, pulling off onto the pothole track that took them down to Simmons Gully. At the bottom, she parked the car where it had been on the final day of the season, turned off the ignition, and sat for a while. On the passenger side, the plastic wrap bound to the door popped in the wind. I know, Rox. It's dumb to be upset about a car. Rebecca put her hand on Roxy's head. But for a few short hours every day, as ridiculous as it sounds, being in the car felt like I'd been set free. I had choices. Small as it was, I had a life. She got out and started ripping the plastic wrap off the window, then cleared the jeep of debris of things she knew hadn't been left inside on the day she and Johnny came to the island. Then she and Roxy headed back to the hostel on foot. Using the bicycle to get around, Rebecca began making repairs to the things she'd broken. Some were beyond fixing, like the padlocks she'd smashed, but she worked around them. She wanted things to look relatively normal for when Hain and Lima docked. She got rid of the SOS sign she'd painted on the board at the general store and gathered up all the messages she'd laid out at the harbour with rocks. She got rid of the pile of pebbles she'd been using to count the days off before she moved to the hostel. There was nothing she could do about the boats she tried to commandeer. The one with the engine had been carried out about a half a mile and had stayed there ever since. The rowboat had been tossed back into shore by one of the storms, part of its hull smashing as it crashed against the concrete walls of the harbour. She'd tried to drag it up the slipway, but it had been too heavy. After that, she started preparing a backpack. The essentials she'd need. There were candy bars and bags of chips in the store that still had a couple of months to go before their expiry date, and she dumped a load of them in the side pockets of a bag Stelzik had left in his closet. She emptied two bottles of Mountain Dew into a sink and filled them with rainwater, which she'd collected in one of the fishing buckets. She added a first aid kit and some freshly washed clothes. They were her clothes, the outfit she'd originally come to the island in. For the trip back, she'd decided to wear Stelzik's pants and the sweater she'd found at the gas station. There were two reasons. Lima knew what she'd been dressed in on the last day of the season. Her hoodie, her denims, her sneakers. Or if he didn't recall exactly, seeing her again would remind him. And the clothes might act as a disguise. It was part of the reason why Rebecca had cut her hair short. It was why she'd pushed herself so hard with her exercise, running more, using bricks and old pieces of masonry as makeshift weights. She needed to appear bigger and more powerful because she wanted to disappear in plain sight. She was going to try to pass herself off as a man. Chapter 52 but there was one thing she couldn't bring herself to sort out. Roxy. As much as it hurt her to admit it, the second Hain and Lima came off the ferry, the dog would put Rebecca at risk. Lima knew what Roxy looked like. She had attacked him and he'd never managed to locate her afterwards. He'd tried to shoot her and failed. He'd searched for her and failed. In all probability, as long as he didn't see her, he wouldn't even consider her. He just assumed Roxy was dead, unable to survive by herself through the hard winter months. Rebecca wavered for days, thinking about all the ways in which she could take Roxy with her, in which she could attempt to hide her. But as much as she'd grown to love her, Roxy was an animal, and that meant she was unpredictable. Unpredictability would get her caught. It would get her killed. And so the night before the island reopened, the evenings lighter, the air a little warmer, 
Rebecca called Roxy into the bedroom opposite the one they'd been staying in. In it, there was a bed full of blankets, two big bowls of franks and a bucket of water. I can't do this in the morning, Rebecca said quietly. She had tears in her eyes. Roxy looked at her, at the food. I can't even stand to do it now. She dropped to her haunches and held out her hands, and Roxy came to her. I love you, Rox, she said, her face buried in the back of the dog's neck. Without you, I never would have made it this far. Roxy turned her head and tried to nuzzle Rebecca's jaw. I'll come back for you. I promise. But there was a reason she couldn't say the last two words out loud. She couldn't promise. She didn't know if she'd make it back. In all the preparation she'd done for when the ferry docked, all the things she'd repaired, all the ways in which she'd try to disguise the fact that she was still alive, there was an unspoken truth that she could never quite bring herself to face. She'd survived five months, almost entirely alone, on an island 101 miles from anywhere, and by the next morning, it might all have been for nothing. By the next morning, she might be dead. Crying, Rebecca stood again, and then she locked Roxy inside. Waiting Game Before bed, Travis finished reading Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Gabby had told him on the phone the night before that she was studying it this semester, and in their production of it, she'd been given the part of Maggie. She sounded excited, so he'd told her that was great even though he had no idea what sort of part Maggie was or even what the play was about. At lunch, he'd walked a couple of blocks to a bookstore on Broadway, bought a copy, and taken the play, a shredded beef sub, and a soda to the break room. It turned out that Maggie was one of the two lead parts, so he'd sent Gabby a WhatsApp with a selfie of him holding up the play and wrote that he was so proud of her. She'd read the text about ten seconds after he'd sent it, but hadn't replied. Travis imagined she was busy, maybe in rehearsals, maybe out tonight in Chicago having a good time before she flew home for Christmas, so he didn't send her a follow-up. He didn't want to annoy his kids, especially as he saw so little of them. Mark still hadn't replied to the text that Travis had sent two days before, although, like his sister, he'd read the message. That wasn't especially unusual. He'd always been more independent than Gabby, much more flighty, even when he'd been living at home, so Travis tried not to take it personally. Even so, if there was a worse invention than the two blue ticks in WhatsApp, he didn't know what it was. He put the play down, removed his reading glasses, and watched the snow fall outside on the street. It had been cold today, the city freezing in the chill, subway grates breathing, vents spewing. Travis hated winters in New York, despite having lived through fifty-nine of them, and, as he thought of that, he again thought of his retirement, of how he had friends in the South who would help him set up down there if he wanted to. For a moment, he wondered what Naomi would think if he did something as spontaneous as that, if he called her one day from Charleston or Myrtle Beach and told her she'd been wrong about him. But then he looked to the nightstand, to the play, to his cell phone, his texts still unanswered, and wondered what would be worse, being lonely here or being lonely there. His attention switched. Next to his phone was a file with pale covers that he'd brought home with him. It was a missing persons report. Actually, it was two. One for Johnny Murphy, one for his sister. Today was the 20th of December. They'd been missing since the 30th of October. Seven weeks and two days, and there had been no sign of them at all. Travis reached over and picked up the file, flipping open the front cover. They'd left early that morning to head to somewhere on Long Island, where Murphy had an interview lined up for a new book he was planning to write. 
His sister had decided to go with him only at the last minute. Noella Sullivan had told cops in the 68th precinct at the time that Rebecca had needed a break from being a full-time mom and had been looking forward to spending time with her brother. Travis didn't know whether to read anything into the sister's decision to go with Murphy, especially because it had been last minute. He flicked through the pages of the file again, knowing the answers weren't likely to be there. The initial missing persons report was a box-ticking exercise, and the subsequent search had never got off the ground. The officer who'd taken the details had left the force two days after filing it, so the search instantly fell through the cracks. Neither Murphy nor his sister raised any red flags. They weren't vulnerable, and they didn't have mental health problems, so it had been treated as low priority from the go and had only become less important over time. Even basic due diligence hadn't been done. Before Travis had got involved, not a single interview had been conducted other than the initial one with Noella. No requests had been made for cell records, and there'd been no attempt to contact any of the Long Island Police Departments to see if they might have something. Travis had set all of those things in motion and while he'd hit some walls already, especially out on Long Island, he'd at least been able to narrow the search. He'd even got a warrant for Murphy's house on 81st Street, where he'd found reference books and notes on the novel Murphy had planned to write, although no direct link to the person he'd gone to interview. There was no laptop, so Travis assumed Murphy had taken it on the trip to Long Island, which would make sense if he was researching a book. He'd found very little in the life of the sister, Rebecca, either. Her ex-husband gave Travis access to a brownstone in Brooklyn, where they'd both lived before their split, and he'd been through her emails, using a laptop she'd left behind. He'd found nothing. If Rebecca and her brother had discussed the details of their trip, it was over the phone or in person. That made it a dead end. It was the same story with the lab. Before Travis had got home, they'd called him. He'd swabbed toothbrushes for Murphy and his sister, but his contact at the lab said it could take up to 12 weeks to get DNA profiles completed for missing people, probably more. That meant three months minimum before their profiles could be compared to others in the system. He didn't have three months. From tomorrow, he didn't even have three days. He put the file on the bed and thought about quick workarounds. He could call the Met again in London and ask if they had a set of fingerprints on file for Murphy. That he could then compare with ones they might have on the local and national databases here. But he knew it was more than a long shot. Murphy was never charged. So that was one definite reason there would be no fingerprints retained on file. Another was that Murphy had only been in the UK for a week, the week he'd spent with his sister, since the family had moved to New York. So there was no chance he'd been printed at some later date on another similar trip. The last was that his arrest was over two decades ago and the cop he'd spoken to at the Met had told Travis that the details of Murphy's attack on the men was only on their system because the man Murphy had punched in the pub that night had a rap sheet going all the way back to 1995. It was the reason the man had chosen not to press charges against Johnny. He didn't want the police looking too hard at his own life. Travis tried to think, and as he did, reached to the nightstand for something else he'd been keeping there, a small red leather-bound journal, Louise Mason's. He began flicking through the pages again, as familiar with what was written there as he was with the case file. He traced the lines of Louise's hand and quirks in it, the repetitions. She'd replicated all of this in her cell phone, all the meetings and social events, but her family had told Travis that she kept a physical journal in case she ever lost her cell, and because she loved to write. She was an old soul in that way, her mom had told him, tearful, 
unable to go more than a few sentences without crying, and when he'd walked the spaces of Louise's studio, then the rooms and hallways of her apartment, he saw exactly that. Hundreds of pens, as many pens as paintbrushes, including antiques and boxes. He took photos of a couple and searched for them online. Some were worth a thousand bucks. His phone pinged with an email. He picked up the handset, not expecting much, but then felt an instant charge of electricity as he saw the subject line. He'd been warned the cell phone records for Johnny Murphy and his sister might take three to five days. They'd taken thirty-six hours. He didn't wait, didn't try to transfer them to his laptop where he'd be able to see them better. He just opened them there and then. Taking a cursory glance at the actual calls that had been made in the two weeks before the disappearances, he then went straight to the last page. That was the one he really wanted. It was where the cell tower pings were listed. And it would tell him exactly where the Murphys had gone. Chapter 53 Rebecca's recurring dream started to emerge from the dark in the week leading up to the 1st of April. It began in snatches, there and gone again, as she finally drifted off to sleep. She recognized the imagery, but didn't feel any of the dread. The dream was more like blinks of light, never quite fully formed, as if a part of it was still growing and taking shape in the shadows. It didn't help that the closer she got to the first day of the season, the harder she found it to sleep. She would go to bed at night and lie awake for hours, listening to the creaks and groans of the hostel, plagued by images of failure, of not making it to the ferry, or of making it, only to find Hain and Lima waiting for her inside. And when she did sleep, other nightmares filled her head, a torrid and dysfunctional stream she struggled to escape from. She saw Johnny stumbling from the forest, bloodied and injured, and was never quite close enough to grab him. She saw Noella and Gareth lying in bed together, the sheets twisted around their bodies. And she saw her mother, little more than a blur except for a flash of red hair, and always running, even as Rebecca called for her to come back. One night, Rebecca dreamed she was in the house on 81st Street, a place her mother had never been to. She came in to find her at the kitchen table talking to Johnny, and when they saw Rebecca, they stopped talking, and her mother, faceless, simply got up and left. Rebecca would wake soaked with sweat and breathing hard, and the longer the dreams went on, the more they began to repeat, to merge with one another, then mutate into something else. And in the final few days before the ferry was due to return, Rebecca finally knew what they were mutating into. Something more familiar and more terrifying. I think you should stay, Rebecca. She was back in the high-rise building, in apartment 127. Unable to escape. The nightmare came on her last night. Instantly, it felt more frightening than any version of the dream she'd had before. For a moment, Rebecca couldn't understand why. She was in the same corridor as always, looking at the same cream walls and tan carpets. But then she realized what was different. This time, Roxy was at the end of the corridor, half concealed in the gloom. The dog was looking at her, and as Rebecca approached, as she got closer to the open door of the apartment, Roxy began whimpering. It was an awful sound the same sound she'd made when Rebecca had locked her into the room hours earlier, and now here, in this place, it was even worse. Every whimper squeezed Rebecca's heart. I'm so sorry, Roxy, she heard herself saying. I'm so sorry. But then Rebecca got to the door of the apartment. She glanced at the 127 on it, at the 7 that was askew, and she had the same thought as always, that 7 was supposed to be a lucky number. And by the time she looked for Roxy again, she'd vanished. The corridor of the apartment block was empty. Roxy? Music started playing inside the apartment. 
She couldn't tell what type it was, had never been able to tell, it was just there. But this time it seemed louder, more obscure, and way more painful on her ears. As she pushed the door wide and stepped in, she felt the fibres of the carpet under her bare feet. They started to squirm and move. They wrapped around her feet, binding her to the floor, climbing up her ankles, inching up her calves to the inside of her thighs. And then the voice behind her, genderless but ugly, started repeating those same words. I think you should stay. Except this time it wasn't just words, it was a harrowing rasp. I think you should stay. She so desperately didn't want to stay. I think you should stay, Rebecca. Please let me go. I think you should stay. Please let me wake up. And then finally she did, gasping for breath, as if she'd just climbed from the bottom of the ocean. She looked around the bedroom, expecting it to be a trick, a second nightmare concealed within the first. But she was awake, her skin slick with sweat. When she caught sight of herself in the mirror, she could see her vest was soaked through and there were fine tear trails on her cheeks. Light poured in through the window. Rebecca looked across the hallway to the other door, to the room she'd put Roxy in. She wanted to call out to her, to see her and put her arms around her, but she didn't. Instead, she planted her feet on the floor, her skin still tingling as it had in her dream. On her right hand, along her palm, there was an arc of tiny red gouges. She'd been clenching her fists so tightly she'd drawn blood. She closed her eyes for a second, breathing. Relax, it's over. It's over. She checked Stelzik's clock on the nightstand beside her. It was 8.56 a.m. She'd set the alarm for nine. The ferry was due in at eleven, and on the practice runs she'd done the previous two days, it took thirty minutes to get from the hostel to the harbour on the bicycle. That meant she had at least an hour to ready herself, change, and check she had everything she needed. Switching off the alarm, she climbed out of bed and started to prepare, washing herself, dressing, making sure her hair was styled in exactly the way she'd practised. She'd gone for a side parting, Moulded it into shape with some hair paste Stelzik had kept among his things. She knew her features didn't look particularly masculine, but the hairstyle disguised that just a little, and when she pulled on the men's clothes, they helped blur the lines even further. She stood in front of the mirror and stared at herself, fear like a ball in her stomach. She'd pictured her death so many times in the lead-up to this. She wasn't certain if she was more frightened of dying on the island before she ever got close to the ferry, or making it a distance, feeling a fleeting sense of success and of freedom, and having it torn away from her. There was even a strange part of her that was scared to leave the island. It wasn't home, it never would be, yet she'd made something of it in the end, especially after she'd found Roxy. There was a kind of safety in the routine she had here. But then she thought of her girls, and she began checking her hair again, her clothes, her backpack, laying the items inside it on the bed. That was when she glanced at the calendar. It was pinned to the wall. Before today, for weeks, it had been circled by scraps of paper, a trail that had led out into the corridor, a pathway she'd built to help her figure out the why and the how. All of that was gone now. She'd taken it all down, her suspect list, her string tethers, her attempts to connect all that she knew, had folded it and put it into her backpack. All that remained on the walls was the calendar. It was from the Museum of Natural History and had belonged to Stelzik, and each month was represented by an animal. She hadn't turned the page to April yet, so it was still on March, a striped hyena. Except it wasn't the animal that had caught her eye this time. It was the dates underneath. It was something printed next to the 13th of March. She hadn't noticed it 19 days ago, not only because the print was so small, but because she'd been so deeply embedded in building her lists, in taping her pieces of paper to the wall, in moving string from area to area. But as she stared at it now, she froze. Under the 13th of March were two words. 
She glanced at the alarm clock and saw that it was 10.15 a.m. She should have had plenty of time to get to the ferry if she left now. She should have been able to get there well ahead of when Hain and Lima arrived on the island. But she'd made a mistake. A terrible mistake. She looked again at the two printed words. DST starts. Daylight saving time. She'd missed the switch on the 13th of March, and that meant it wasn't 10.15 a.m. right now. It was 11.15. Hain and Lima were already here. Book Two Part Six Open Season Chapter 54 Ahead of her, Helena was being stalked by sea mist. Rebecca approached from the north using a series of off-road trails instead of the easier, smoother asphalt of the loop. She didn't want to chance being seen by Hain and Lima. They were almost certainly at the forest by now, but she wasn't going to take the gamble. As she crossed to the open road of the town limits, she tensed. She could see two people on Main Street, but neither were the men who'd come to bury her. One was pointing towards the front of the store, the door Rebecca had broken, and another was gesturing in the direction of the harbour. She tried to steer clear of them, conscious of being seen, but then one looked over and away again. He didn't seem interested in her, probably assumed she'd come over on the ferry. Yet every face she saw, every time someone glanced in her direction and made something as simple as eye contact, seemed like a huge moment. It felt like she'd been on the island forever, trapped alone in this hinterland, silent, invisible, forgotten. A memory of a woman who went to Long Island one day and never came home. She sucked in a breath, trying to focus on the only thing that mattered, getting home, and found a space on a sloping grass bank to the west of the town. She scoped it out in the days before. It gave her a clear, uninterrupted view of Helena but it also had enough cover to step into, should she need to. Her eyes fell on the harbour master's shack. She remembered, months ago, looking through its window in her search for a radio, unable to get inside. But now a man stood at its entrance, staring out at the docked ferry, the door propped open beside him. Rebecca followed his eyeline and glanced towards the ferry, its ramp open, its interior empty of vehicles, then back to the harbour master. He was in his fifties, silver bearded, his belly resting on a belt that was holding up a pair of baggy denims. Then her eyes were drawn to his belt. Something was clipped to it. She felt a flutter behind her ribs. A cell phone. She looked at the signs on the shack. In case of emergency, call 911 and first aid. And knew, even if he hadn't had the cell phone on his belt, the harbour master would have access to a VHF radio. He'd have multiple ways of contacting the mainland, multiple ways of calling the cops, without delay. No, stick to the plan, she told herself. You don't know who you can trust. She ripped her eyes away from the harbour master and looked at the ferry again. It had emptied, foot passengers, if there had been any, gone, any vehicles, apart from two pickups in the harbour parking lot, already somewhere else. Was it possible one of the pickups belonged to Hain and Lima? She didn't see them anywhere, and she remembered them saying they were going to bring a trailer with them so they could transport her Cherokee back to the mainland if necessary. It seemed much more likely that the pickups belonged to the two men talking outside the general store, or the harbour master. She looked at him again. He'd reached inside the shack and had brought out a coffee cup. He was now checking his phone. He's got a signal. Rebecca looked along Main Street, out to where it connected to the loop. There were no cars out there, no sign of Hain and Lima. She could make it to the harbour master, to his phone, in seconds. All it would take was one phone call for her to be rescued from this. No. She closed her eyes. Stick to the plan. A couple of minutes later, she unzipped her backpack and took out Stelzik's alarm clock. 12.17. The ferry didn't go until 5 p.m. Was she really going to wait almost five hours when there was a usable cell phone less than 400 feet away? She looked at the harbour master again. 
She could call the cops on the mainland now. She could already have called them, and they could already be on their way. Fear, courage, indecision, it all hit her at once. Hain and Lima aren't here. Stick to the plan. They're occupied on the other side of the island. No, stop it. You're not going to get this chance again. You could grab that phone and make the call. No. This could all be over already. No, it's too risky. This could be over and you could be speaking to your girls. Her body was moving before her brain had caught up. She sprang to her feet and took off, leaving the bike where it was on the grass bank, then headed down onto Main Street and in through the gates of the harbour. As soon as she did, the harbour master saw her. She was hurrying, almost stumbling. The closer she got to him, the more concerned he looked. You all right, sir? he asked. But as she got closer, panic gripped her. She was disguised as a man, but the instant she spoke, her voice would give her away. She'd never practiced for this. She'd never thought about having to make conversation. What was she going to do now? Put on an accent? Drop her voice an octave? You idiot! All of a sudden, she felt overwhelmed by her stupidity, her impulsiveness. You fucking idiot! You should have stayed where you were. Sir, are you okay? She looked at the harbour master. As she stopped short of him, breathless, tears welled in her eyes. The kindness in his face and the smile at the corners of his mouth disarmed her. She hadn't seen evidence of another person's kindness for so long, she was barely even able to remember what it looked like. I, uh, my name's... She stopped. Her voice had come out sounding exactly like her own. What do I do? How do I speak? A frown bloomed on the harbour master's face, and Rebecca realised that, despite her clothes, despite the hair, despite all the hours she'd put into the disguise, the instant she talked, he'd known she was a woman. Ah, uh, he didn't know how to address her. Miss? My name is Rebecca, she said. It meant nothing to him. She could see that. Are you okay, Rebecca? he asked. No, she replied. I've been trapped here. He put his coffee aside. What? I've been trapped here for five months. He looked like he wasn't sure if she was joking or not. You've... He glanced out to the ferry. You've been on the island since Halloween? She nodded, swallowed. The harbour master looked flawed. What? How? Her breath stalled, her eyes blurred. Tell him. You need to tell him. Someone tried to kill me. Chapter 55 The harbour master told her his name was Caleb. Inside the shack, the shelves were laden, but her attention was drawn to a handheld VHF radio. It was on the desk, clearly brought over that morning, because it hadn't been there during the winter. An orange distress button was on top. We need to call the cops, he said, watching her, curious, perhaps even wary, still struggling to comprehend the extent of what she was telling him. You've really been on the island this whole time? She frowned. Why would I lie? He held up a hand. I ain't accusing you of lying. I know, I just... Rebecca took a breath. I'm sorry. I came here with my brother and I don't know where he is. You two got separated? In the forest, when they tried to kill us. I don't know if Johnny's dead or alive. I don't know if he's in a grave out here or if he made it back home. But the question she'd asked herself every single day for five months was, if he had made it back home, if he was still alive, why hadn't he sent help? The guy who tried to kill me, he's here right now. On the island? Rebecca nodded, but there was something in Caleb's face. Was he just humouring her? Did he not believe her? Should she have trusted him at all? She started to panic again, her chest tightening, her throat shrinking, but then she forced herself to calm down, to breathe, to think. For now, she had to run with this, make it work. She'd made her choice by not sticking to the plan. Caleb glanced through the window to the empty lot and the ocean beyond. Okay, well, the most important thing is you're safe with me now. Rebecca wasn't sure if that was true or not, and Caleb didn't seem entirely certain either. 
He was obviously trying to think about the best course of action. You said the guy who tried to kill you took your cell? At the mention of a cell, she switched on again. Can I use your phone? She asked. I need to call home. I need to speak to my girls. Caleb unclipped his phone from his belt. As he did so, Rebecca thought of Hain and Lima. The ferry had docked almost an hour and a half ago, so given the fact that, unknown to them, they'd never find her body, it seemed likely they'd still be out there, among the trees somewhere. Likely, but not certain. She glanced out of the window, into the mist that was hanging over the harbour, and then down into her lap at her hands. Dirt and grime, the stains of existing here for five months, of finding out how to survive with no help, marked her fingers, ingrained in them despite a thousand washes. There were fine cuts everywhere, bruises on her arms and legs. There was a constant throb in her head and neck, worse some days than others, from when she'd fallen into the gully. She'd repaired the cut, stitched it, dressed it, and removed the stitches after it had healed, but it was always there. And as she saw the blemishes, every reminder of what had happened, the doubt started to gnaw at her again. This man can't protect me. I should have stuck to the plan. Miss? She looked up at Caleb. He was holding out a cell phone to her. She took it from him. Thank you, she said, and as she looked down at the screen, her doubts vanished. The name of the network was in the middle. At the top were four bars. This is real. It's actually happening. She could finally call home. And then someone knocked on the door of the shack. A New Life Travis woke to the sound of wind at the windows. For a while he lay there, adrift on the edge of sleep, listening to the weather, its rhythm, the hum of the neighborhood. Then he rolled over and checked the time. It was 9.20. In a past life, he would have been at the office for two, maybe three hours already. The early starts had been part of his routine, one that went all the way back to his first days as a detective. The earlier the start, the longer the quiet lasted. The quiet had always helped him focus. Sometimes an investigation had taken him so deep in those first hours of the day, he would look up after what felt like thirty minutes, and it would be afternoon. But not anymore. He moved to the edge of the bed, staring at himself in the mirror. His shoulder throbbed. He rolled it, feeling the normal spark of aches and pains in his hip, and then he stared at the sixty-year-old in the mirror. There had been a slow creep of excess around his belly and face for the last couple of months. His hair and beard were still mostly black, although the thicker he'd let his beard grow, the more gray he was starting to see. The biggest difference was less easy to pin down. He was diminished somehow, less impressive, as if he'd left a part of himself behind or lost it entirely. If he were on the other side of a table in an interview room, the cop that Travis had been would have looked at this version of himself and seen a man who carried sadness like a bruise on the skin. It was as if he were grieving for someone. Or something. Dad? He tore his gaze away from the mirror. Gabby was leaning against the doorframe, a frown on her face and he realized she must have been there for a while, studying him. Morning, honey, he said, trying to clear his expression. You okay? I'm good. How are you? Gabby shrugged. She was dressed in one of Travis's old robes, way too big for her, and her hair was damp. She was a tall, blonde, 21-year-old, who looked like her mother. Only her smile belonged to Travis. Sometimes it was unerring, and was why he'd always liked to make Gabby laugh. 
Her laughter completely changed her face and helped erode the reminders of Naomi, the countless ways in which Travis's ex-wife had screwed with his life since the divorce. It was a bitterness he'd let fester and flourish, even if he'd tried his best over the years never to articulate it in front of Gabby and Mark. For the last ten days, though, it had been especially important to gain control of it to sink the enmity he felt for Naomi and try to forget it, because if he didn't, he knew it would drive a wedge between him and his children. Mark, maybe not as much as Gabby. His son had already returned to L.A., and he was built more like Naomi, sober, pragmatic, sometimes a little aloof. Gabby was different, more like Travis, much more demonstrative and temperate. She didn't need to hear Travis recounting the ways in which Naomi had made his life a misery, how much of his money and security she'd taken, how every barbed comment hurt. Not so soon after Naomi had died. I might go to the cemetery today, Gabby said. Travis nodded. Put some lilies on Mom's grave. Sure, honey. She loved lilies. That sounds nice. Gabby eyed him. You don't want to come with me? It's not that, he said, though that wasn't entirely truthful. I'm happy to drive you down there, but I'm meant to meet Amy Hauser for lunch at twelve. Your friend from the force? A smile twitched at the corner of Gabby's mouth. Is she attached? Travis laughed. I'm old enough to be her dad, kiddo. And no, I don't know if she's seeing anyone. I don't ask about her love life. It would be creepy. But even if that wasn't the case, I'm pretty sure Amy, or anyone else under the age of 55 come to that, isn't interested in an old man who spends his days watching ESPN in a sweet terry cloth robe. Gabby laughed. Travis enjoyed the sound. I just want you to meet someone, she said. It had become a familiar refrain over the years, and one that he never let annoy him. It came from a good place. He loved his daughter, and he knew the thing that bothered her most was the idea of him being alone for the rest of his life. The truthful answer would have been that some people just weren't destined to be plural, only ever singular but he reverted to his stock response. I'm happy, honey. You really don't need to worry about me. But every time he said it, he was never sure if he was lying to Gabby or not. He didn't feel unhappy per se, just a little lost. He missed the work, and he pined for the routine desperately. It was why he felt and appeared to himself in the mirror like a man in mourning. Because he was. It was three months to the day since he'd retired. He was grieving for the job he'd lost. Chapter 56 Rebecca was so consumed by the cell phone Caleb had handed her that for a second the knock on the door didn't even register with her and by the time it did, Caleb was already pushing the door open. She looked from Caleb to the window, through the glass, to the man waiting outside the shack, and then to a photograph he was readying. How you doing, pal? At the sound of his voice, time slowed down. It was him. Oh, shit. It's Lima. I'm doing all right, Caleb replied. Cool. You recognize this woman? Rebecca's heart stopped. Lima's hand appeared inside the shack, the photograph of her out in front of him. She was close enough to see that it was the photo from her driver's license. She looked from the picture to Caleb and slid off the chair onto her knees, shuffling as far under the desk as she could go. By the time she realized what a dumb move it was, she'd boxed herself in and made herself an easy target. It was too late. Caleb was replying. Nope, he said. She don't seem familiar. Who is she? She glanced at Caleb. He didn't look back, 
not with his head, not even with his eyes. He didn't adjust a single part of himself. He's trying to protect me. No one's been asking about her? Lima responded. You haven't seen a car before? A blue Jeep Cherokee? He'd avoided Caleb's question, but that wasn't the only thing that had lodged with Rebecca. Why was he asking about the Cherokee when he would have already seen it parked in Simmons' gully? Nope, Caleb said simply. You haven't seen her? No. A pause. Something had already changed. It was like the air had become heavy. Lima knows something's up, Rebecca thought. Her throat began to pulse as if an insect was trapped in her windpipe, and then she looked down at the phone. Call 911. She pushed nine, and it made a soft beep. Inside the shack, it was like a scream. Rebecca muted the volume, but by the time she was done, ready to put the rest of the numbers in, Lima was talking again. You sure no one's come asking about her or her car? I'm sure, Caleb replied. Her car again? Why was he asking about the car? Then a second later, it hit her. Shit, the tire. On the last day of the season, Lima had slashed it with a knife, but then Rebecca had replaced it. That was why Lima wasn't still in the forest. It was why he'd come back to Helena so quickly. It was why he was here, because it had taken one look at the new tire on the jeep to know something was up. What are you? Caleb said. A cop? Yeah, something like that. Something like that? What does that mean? That's enough, Caleb, she thought. Don't push him any further. Just let him leave. Above her, through a window to her left, she could see the high point of the grass bank she'd been on before coming down here. Why the hell hadn't she stayed there? Why hadn't she stuck to the plan? She pushed one on the phone. So are you a cop or not? Caleb said. He was trying to help, trying to get Rebecca some answers, but all he was doing was making it worse. Stop asking him questions. Another one. If you're a cop, where's your ID? Her finger hovered over call. She couldn't have a conversation with the cops without Lima hearing it. She stared at the 911 on the screen. Where's my ID? Lima repeated from the doorway. Rebecca looked around the room for a weapon. On the shelves between her and Caleb was a wrench. It wasn't heavy, but it would do enough damage if it came to that. She started shuffling forward on her knees. Halfway out, she stopped again. There was a set of shelves immediately to Caleb's right. Out of sight of Lima, his hand was moving. No, Caleb, no, please don't do that. He was reaching for a hammer. Chapter 57 Where is it then? Caleb said again. Where's your ID? Rebecca had got far enough to see part of Lima's profile. As Caleb asked him for ID, he glanced behind him into the parking lot. It took her a second to grasp why. He's making sure no one's watching. But before she'd even finished the thought, it was already too late. In the blink of an eye, Caleb stumbled back against the shelves he'd been trying to grab the hammer from and crashed into the far wall. Pots of nails emptied over him, chunks of old machine parts, oil skins. He'd barely hit the floor and Lima was inside the shack, bent over, grabbing hold of his neck. His other hand was inside his coat. He's going for his gun. Rebecca rocked forward, springing to her feet. She saw the surprise in Lima's face as he looked at her, the horror, his bronzed skin blanching at the sight of a dead woman. Then his eyes went to the shelves next to her. He had no idea what was missing from them. He just knew she'd grabbed something. He tried to adjust, to turn, to pull out his gun, but Rebecca got there first. The wrench connected with the side of his head. It made a dull slap, like raw meat dropping onto a chopping board. Then Lima lurched awkwardly to his right, collapsing into one of the shelving units. He had hold of the gun now, but he was dazed. He looked for her, eyes drifting and failing to focus, his hands unsteadily trying to gain purchase on the floor. Rebecca kicked the weapon out of his grip, his fingers springing open as it clattered against the wall. His arms gave way and he hit the floor. 
he landed in a blanket of roofing nails, crying out in pain as he pierced himself. Almost instantly, he attempted to get to his knees again, but he was woozy. He couldn't focus. Rebecca pressed her foot into his back and pushed him down. She had no plan, no idea where to go from here, and for the first time, she remembered Caleb. He was still slumped against the shelves, motionless. In the frenzy, a chunk from an old boat engine had landed on his head, and now he was bleeding from his scalp. He was unconscious. Lima had started moving again. Shit. She looked between him and Caleb in the parking lot. Coming down from Main Street into the harbour was a black Dodge Ram pickup, pulling a trailer, with another vehicle loaded on it. Her Cherokee. Her eyes met those of the driver inside the Ram. Hain. Rebecca grabbed her backpack and sprinted out of the shack. Behind her, she heard Haynes pick up gun into the lot, but she didn't look back. She scrambled up a concrete slope, a sea defence built to protect the town during storms, and thirty seconds later, as she reached Main Street, began looking for help. To her horror, no one was around. Helena was deserted. Help! She screamed in desperation. Help! She headed towards the store where she'd slept for months, thinking of the men she'd seen outside that morning. She'd assumed they were the owners. She'd assumed they'd open the store on day one. But she was wrong. The store remained closed and neither man was around. She went to the bottom of Main Street, where the bait and tackle store was. That was shut too. Panicked, she glanced out to the rest of the town, at the two rows of boarded buildings on either side of her. Nothing was open. There was no sign of life. It was just Hain, Lima, Caleb, and her. But then she came out from behind the bait and tackle place and looked down the ramp to the harbour parking lot, two hundred feet away. The ferry! There were two men behind the glass of the bridge. Help! she screamed, frantically waving her arms above her head. Help me! I'm being attacked! Neither looked in her direction. They couldn't hear her from this distance. Help me, please, help She stopped, struck silent. Hain had emerged on foot at the bottom of the ramp. Their eyes met, his expression dark as night, and then he mouthed something. She couldn't hear him, but she understood. You're fucking dead. She sprinted back the way she'd come, up the incline of Main Street, as Hain made a dash to his ram. She could run. She was fit. She could go on for miles without stopping, but there was one thing she couldn't do. She couldn't outrun a car. Behind her, she heard the rev of his engine, heard the weight of the ram's tires hitting the harbour ramp, and then an idea struck her. A desperate, stupid idea. The Fix Travis showered and headed downstairs. Naomi's funeral the day before was the major reason why he was so late in getting up. After dropping Mark at the airport for a 9 p.m. flight, he and Gabby had gone to meet a bunch of old family friends at a bar on Hillside Avenue and had drunk too much. Booze didn't mix with bereavement, and Gabby had got home and burst into tears, crying about her mother's death. She'd already been sobbing pretty much nonstop for the previous two months when— completely out of the blue, Naomi had been diagnosed as terminal, and the kids had started to travel back and forth at every new diagnosis, on every occasion when the doctors had said it wouldn't be long before Naomi passed, only for her to rally once more. The three times Travis had been to see his ex-wife, because it had been the proper thing to do in her last weeks, she'd told him he'd been a shitty husband— airing the same criticisms over and over. And he'd sat there and let her talk, because another argument would have been worth nothing. It was the reason, even if he hadn't already arranged to meet Amy Hauser, why he didn't want to be at Naomi's grave today, playing nice in a dreary cemetery on the shoulder of the Long Island Expressway. After showering, he headed downstairs, sitting opposite Gabby at the kitchen table. They ate eggs and drank coffee and talked about everything Gabby had coming up. And at 10 a.m., 
Mark texted to tell him that his flight back to L.A. the previous night had been fine, that he was already in work, and that he was missing them very much. Travis archived the text, putting it alongside some of the other messages Mark had sent over the years, where he'd said unexpected things, or been uncharacteristically expressive. Travis had always had to work harder with Mark than with Gabby, but these moments, although small, made all of it worthwhile. Do you think people get what they deserve, Dad? Travis looked up from his cell phone. I mean, you had a lot of cases over the years, right? Gabby shifted some egg around her plate. I don't know. With Mom and everything, it made me think about the kind of work you did. He watched her for a moment, waiting for her to continue. It must have had you asking some big questions about life, she said her words a little harder to form now after the impact of the last week. She put down her fork. I mean, how do you rationalize it all? Travis shrugged. I don't think you do. You never tried to? He reached across and took his daughter's hand, squeezing it gently. At first, he thought about planing the edges of his response to give her an answer that, twenty-four hours after she'd buried her mother, wouldn't entirely crush her. But he didn't want to lie to her. Not now. Not today. So he squeezed her hand again and looked her in the eyes and said, I joined the NYPD in 1983, and in thirty-six years I did as a cop in total I saw stuff that didn't make sense. I'd go into these places, these crime scenes, and you'd see some of the things one human being was capable of doing to another, and you'd have to take a moment to try to clear your head, because it would be impossible to understand. I mean, all the rules we set out, not just on pieces of paper, but in life, Laws we don't write down and make a big show of, we just know. And those crime scenes, they've all been broken. You're just standing there thinking, how did we even get here? To start with, there was always a small part of me, a voice in my head that said, you won't solve this because you can't comprehend it. This crime is so heinous, so immeasurably, unfathomably awful, and you're too ordinary. So you're saying nothing can be rationalized? I don't know what I'm saying exactly, honey. But I can tell you what I learned as a cop. Because I think it's pretty close to what I learned about life. It was incredible and terrifying. It surprised and delighted me. And then, in the next breath, it didn't just pull the rug out from under me, but collapsed the entire floor. I loved it and hated it. It made me feel like a million bucks, and then would deeply and profoundly hurt me. In all those years, a ton of cases passed across my desk, and I think overall I did a pretty decent job. I made mistakes, but I did some good things, too. But I'll tell you, it's a hell of a lot harder to remember the good things than it is to remember the things that caused you pain. The cases that got away and I didn't solve. They still hurt. After that, he told her he loved her, and he knew what Gabby must have been thinking. The things he'd talked about, the things that being a cop had taught him about life, was all an allegory for the way she would feel about her mother. She probably thought his line about the unsolved cases, the way they still ate at him, the way they overwhelmed any success he might have enjoyed, was really just an analogy for the grief she was carrying. The death of people we love hurt more than a million astonishing moments. But it wasn't an allegory. It was a literal description of how he felt. The frustration of failure, the way he'd had to retire before he wanted to, and how he'd left three people behind. Louise Mason, Johnny Murphy, his sister Rebecca. 
The Murphy disappearances had fallen into his lap in that last week, and all he'd hit was roadblocks. Even their cell tower pings, his greatest hope for finding out where they'd gone that day, were dead ends. He remembered the night he'd got that data through, the way he'd been so excited, so charged about it, then had crash-landed. The pings had charted a course for them both, from their homes in Brooklyn, out across Long Island to Montauk at its tip, and then to a small outcrop called Crow Island, a hundred miles off the coast. Travis had known then that the island tied into some of the cryptic research notes he'd found at Johnny Murphy's place. It had also confirmed something Travis had been thinking a lot about. The two of them had gone to Long Island to catch a ferry. Yet later that day, Johnny and his sister had returned on the ferry and back along the expressway. Then, for reasons that Travis couldn't work out, they'd taken I-95 north to Connecticut, where both of their phones went dead outside Stamford, approximately fifty miles from their homes. Why had they gone in the other direction? What was in Connecticut? They appeared to have no connection to the state. He'd put out a bolo with state troopers for the sisters' Cherokee, but it had never been sighted in or around Stamford and neither of the phones came back on again after they'd gone off. That night, three days before he retired, was when the case died. He couldn't figure out what had happened to either of them. He couldn't fix it, nor could he fix Louise Mason. He'd tried for three months with her, and had tried even harder after Johnny Murphy disappeared, knowing in his heart the two cases were connected that one fed into the other. But in the end, he'd failed Louise. He couldn't find her, and worst of all, he never got to give her family an answer. Louise, Murphy, his sister, they just became three people he'd had to let go. Until today, perhaps. He got ready to go and meet Amy Hauser. Chapter 58 A desperate, stupid idea. It was so risky, so profoundly reckless, Rebecca almost tripped as she considered it, like her legs were fighting the images forming in her head. Turning, trying to ignore the reasons not to do it, she kept to the side of the buildings on Main Street, obscuring herself from Hain in the parking lot, and returned to the top of the ramp that led down to the harbour. At the bait-and-tackle store, she stopped and peered around the right angle of its wall. The pickup was almost upon her. She whipped back, pressed her spine against the wall and waited. As she did, doubt put her in a chokehold, an almost hysterical fear following in its wake. She was shivering. There were tears in her eyes. Her head was on fire. As she heard the ram coming, the rattle of the trailer behind it, she realized she'd been pressing her nails so hard into the bricks one had snapped off. The pickup swung around the corner without stopping and headed in the direction Rebecca had been going. She launched herself off the wall and into a sprint, following directly behind the trailer so that if Hayne checked his mirrors, he wouldn't spot her. She had to push herself hard to keep up, teeth gritted, heart pumping. On the island, she'd been averaging six miles per hour tops. Now she was having to do way more just to keep pace with the pickup and the trailer as it bumped its way slowly up Main Street towards the crest of the slope. She reached out, brushing the steel cage of the trailer with her fingers. Come on! Once the ram hit the flat, it would be over. She tried again, tried to grab hold of a bar, breathing hard now, pulse crashing in her ears. You can do it! Come on! You can do it! She tried again and again, her hand getting hold of the bar, then slipping. She felt herself stumble, thought it was over. And then she had a hold of it. She almost lost her footing, the tug of the vehicle so strong, but she managed to use the momentum of the pickup to launch herself off her feet. She crunched the flats of both shoes against the back of the trailer, her backpack slapped against her spine. Climbing over the back gate, she paused, trying to gain control of her breathing again. To her left and right were slide bolts keeping the rear gate of the trailer in place. She released one just as the ram hit the flat at the top of Main Street, 
Inching across to the other, she swung her backpack around to her front and went to the zip pouch on top. Inside were her car keys. She released the other bolt on the gate. It hit the asphalt with a clatter, sparks kicking up, and immediately she felt the pickup break. Hain knew something was up. He could feel it. Rebecca didn't waste any time. She moved to the left-hand side of the jeep, opened the door as far as it would go before it hit the sides of the trailer, and slid in at the wheel. She looked at the smashed passenger window, the glass still dotted in the footwell. She saw Kyra's pink giraffe and Roxy's hair on the back seat. And then she pulled her door shut and hit the ignition button. The car fired up. She glanced at the instruments to check just how low on gas the jeep was. There was less than a fifth of a tank left. She tried not to let it weigh on her. If I can get clear of the town, I can find the people I saw this morning. I just need enough gas to buy me time and get help. She slammed the car into reverse. It lurched backwards and hit the road almost instantly. The impact was so hard, Rebecca crashed forward and smashed her head against the top of the wheel. For a second, she was dazed, could feel the car swerving out of control. She hit the brakes. Again, she jolted forward. She watched the trailer's brake lights come on and everything whip to a stop. Then... In her mirror, a figure appeared behind her at the top of the harbour ramp by the bait-and-tackle place. Lima. She swung the car around using the road and the grass either side of it to pull a full-lock U-turn and hit the gas. The Cherokee arrowed back down the street, Lima not moving for a second, maybe disbelieving what he was seeing, maybe still unsteady. And by the time he understood what was happening and started going for his gun... Rebecca had almost hit him. He leapt out of the way, rolling across the blacktop, and when he was on his feet again and had the gun up in front of him, Rebecca was turning a corner. She was heading out of Helena the other way, in the opposite direction to the forest and the hostel, towards the lighthouse on the west coast. She gunned the jeep past the mist-shrouded echoes of old properties, knew she was driving too fast, knew it was foolish on these roads, but she kept going, her foot flat to the floor. The further north she travelled, the more the mist thinned, until finally she broke from its grasp. Sun appeared, blue sky, the marbled sweep of the beach to her left, then the lighthouse. There were rock pools in a ragged line at its base, and she could see that the door was still open, flapping in the wind. She slowed slightly, leaning forward, eyes narrowing. She thought she'd seen movement at the door, inside the darkness of the lighthouse's interior. But had she really? Or was she just hoping? She looked in her mirror, checking for any sign of Hain and Lima, and then her attention pinged back to the lighthouse. Should she go and check? Should she ignore it? She was conflicted now, unsure what to do. As she got to the turning, she made the decision. She bumped off onto the peninsula the lighthouse was on, stones pinging off the underside of the Cherokee, and sounded her horn. She jabbed it to start with, but the further down the track she got, the longer she kept her fist to the centre of the wheel. No reaction. No sign of movement inside. Then she heard something. A distant vibration, a hum hidden by the crash of the ocean. It took her a second to work out what it was. She started turning the car around. As she did, she glimpsed it in the mist, there and gone again, drifting in and out of existence like a ghost. And then finally, it emerged from the fog. The pickup. They dumped the trailer. They were coming for her faster than ever. Chapter 59 She hit the gas. In her mirror, she watched dust kick up behind her, a whirlwind of grey-brown earth, and then she was heading back to the loop. To her right, as the car bumped and shifted on the fractured ground, the ram appeared out of focus, a blurry black shape, but she could tell they were moving way quicker now, could hear the growl of the engine behind the boom of the sea. As soon as she got back to the loop, she veered left, away from them, in the direction of the north coast. She didn't even break. The car fishtailed, the turn too sharp and too fast, forcing her from one side of the road to the other. For one long, awful moment, she was unable to gain control.
the engine vibrating like it was about to explode, its nose facing off towards a grass bank that dropped into a thin cluster of trees. If one wheel went over, the whole vehicle went with it. At the last second, she saved it, writing the direction of travel. As soon as she did, she jammed her foot to the gas again, and the jeep stuttered, jumped, then started to pick up speed. She'd lost precious seconds, could see the pickup had gained on her, but she was back in control of the Cherokee. The faster she went, the more the engine began ticking, as if there was something defective under the hood, a bomb counting down to detonation. She tried to ignore it, checking her mirror. The ram had gained on her again. It was close enough for her to see both of them clearly, their faces, their features, and something worse. Lima was leaning out of the passenger window. In his hands was his gun. A shot rang out, cutting across the afternoon like the roar of a jet plane. She felt the jeep buck under her, thought for a moment that a tire had been hit, then realized that in her panic, her foot had slipped from the gas to the brake. She looked again, saw him lining up another shot. Do something. Do it now. Ahead of her, the road was starting to arc to the right, looping around the lines of the old sawmill, long shuttered, that she'd been to once after she'd first found the map. In front of the mill was a narrow line of pine trees. Another shot, a third. Something pinged off the bodywork, the noise like the ting of a cymbal. When she looked back, Lima still had the weapon out in front of him, his wrist resting on the black frame of the mirror trying to steady his aim. Rebecca knew that if he got one in the tire, she'd instantly lose control of the vehicle. She could hit the pine trees on her right. She could flip. She needed to stop Lima getting the shot in. She needed to disrupt the pursuit. Their car was faster, newer, more powerful. It was gaining on her the whole time. Her foot was flat to the floor. She couldn't go any faster. And then a thought came to her. Maybe I don't have to. She slammed on the brakes. She hit the pedal so hard, everything in the Cherokee propelled forward, the pink giraffe hitting the windshield in front of her. The seatbelt locked hard between her breasts, pain lightning forked across her. Quiet. And then it shattered. Brakes screamed, tires squealed, a car howled as it tried to change direction at the last second. They'd got so close to her, it was impossible to avoid her. The ram swerved violently to the right, smashing into the jeep and exploding a tail light. A shudder passed through the cab, and the Cherokee lurched forward, rocking and resetting. On her right, through the smashed window, she watched the pickup leave the loop, and then, a split second later, it collided with a tree. Ten feet from the road, in the shadow of the sawmill, it stopped, dead, its hood crunching and folding like paper. As it did, the two men slammed forward, airbags erupting into their faces. And, like a video pausing, everything stilled. Only steam continued to move, hissing from the crushed hood. Haynes' head was slumped against the door, eyes shut. Rebecca didn't know if he was dead or alive, but he was definitely unconscious. Next to him, Lima was still awake but dazed. She checked her mirror. Should she turn round? Should she head back into Helena? She needed to call the cops before the men came around properly, and there was an easy way to do it. She could see a cell phone in a charging slot on the centre console of the ram. It was still in place, despite the crash. If she could grab it, she'd have her escape route. She'd have her immediate call to the cops. No delay, no waiting. But she'd have to get inside their car to take it. Life Raft Travis let Gabby have his car, so she could drive to the cemetery, and got her to drop him at the subway on 46th Street. As the carriage rattled through the earth towards the city, he thought about the conversation he'd had with his daughter that morning, and about where it had ended up, with the cases he'd failed to see through. He reached into his pants and wriggled out his old notebook, the one he'd used at the NYPD after starting in the missing persons squad. It was full, first page to last. 
After he'd finished talking to Gabby, he'd gone up to the bedroom and dug through a tower of shoeboxes. And it had been there, buried in one, alongside every other notebook he'd ever bought and filled. They were a 36-year record of success and failure, a testament to his life as a cop, engraved in black ink. He'd gone through a couple, recalling other cases he'd worked and closed, and then, wary of becoming distracted, had entombed them in the closet. All except one. This one. The one that contained his notes on Louise Mason. And on Johnny and Rebecca Murphy. Now, as people moved in and out of the train, as stations passed, Travis barely noticed anything else. It had started with Louise, and for now that was where he began again. So much of her case he knew off by heart, the details of her disappearance tattooed on him. Mostly, though, what endured in his mind was how close Louise had been to her parents, and how crushed they'd been when in the days before his retirement he'd been to see them again to tell them he still hadn't found their daughter. Often at night, when he couldn't sleep, Travis would look up into the dark of the bedroom and find himself in their shoes. And it would be Gabby missing, and he'd feel everything Louise's parents were experiencing. The failure felt immense. Murphy and his sister he didn't know as well. But whatever had happened to them, Travis was convinced it was connected to whatever had happened to Louise. He still couldn't prove that Murphy wasn't behind all of this, but in his gut, Travis knew he wasn't. It didn't feel right. Murphy didn't fit the profile, and his sister would never have abandoned her kids. And then there were the cell tower pings, the way they traced a path to Connecticut for reasons he didn't understand. And the less he understood, the more the frustration burned. After he'd ceased to be a cop, he thought about asking for a favor from someone, an old colleague who might be persuaded to do some hunting around for him to chase paper trails and exhausted leads— but Louise and the Murphys were both long-term disappearances. They'd been missing for months. There were hundreds of other cases ahead of his, confirmed crimes, murders, rapes, robberies that were way up the list. And perhaps, if he was honest with himself, there was another more compelling reason that Travis couldn't pass the torch. No one knew the cases like he did and he didn't trust anyone to work them like him. But then Amy Hauser had called. She'd called him in the days after Naomi passed, in part to send her condolences to Travis and the kids, but that hadn't been the only reason. She'd also asked Travis if he'd be interested in some freelance work. They needed some cases reviewed, to see if anything had been missed, and Travis had been the first person Hauser had thought of. Travis had said yes straight away. He needed the money, and he wanted the distraction. But he said yes for another reason, too. Amy Hauser was going to be his life raft. Travis waited for Hauser on a bench at the southern end of Columbus Park, next to some kids playing on the jungle gym. It was cold, but they were having a ball— and as he watched them, smiling as they squealed with delight, he wondered if he would ever be a grandparent. Maybe Gabby in a few years, but not Mark. He'd already made it clear that he didn't want kids, and when he told Travis that, Travis had felt a weird stab of guilt, as if the reason might be down to him. Mistakes he'd made as a father, times he hadn't been home when he should have been. Ways in which he'd neglected his children without ever knowing it. He'd always thought he'd been a good dad, even with the demands of his job. But Mark's confession had stayed with him, started to embed itself. And a few times in retirement, as he woke up to another day on his own, he'd wondered if his loneliness might not be a kind of punishment. You okay, Trav? He hadn't seen Hauser approach. How you doing, Ames? All good. She checked her watch. Sorry I'm late. 
got caught up in the world's longest and most boring meeting. Let me pay for lunch to say sorry. Travis stood. You don't have to do that. You got to help the elderly where you can, she said, winking at him. And as they headed up Mulberry Street into Chinatown, she slid a gloved hand through the crook in his arm and started filling him in on all the office gossip. He loved it. It made him feel normal again, reattached to something he understood. Eventually, as the snow continued to fall, Hauser said softly, I was really sorry to hear about Naomi. Travis nodded. Thanks, kiddo. How are you feeling about it all? I don't know. He shrugged. Conflicted, I guess. Hauser just nodded. Travis had told her about his marriage. They ate dim sum at a place on Mott. Over lunch, they talked a lot about the force, about the changes being pushed through by the brass, and then Hauser surprised him with the news that she'd had a promotion, swapping major crimes for the cold case squad. That's amazing, Ames. She smiled warmly at Travis. Thanks, Frank. You're gonna kill it in that squad, you know that? She looked at him for a moment, the admiration clear in her face. And not just for his work as a cop. And Travis realized how much he missed the force, the people he'd worked with, and especially Amy Hauser. He missed seeing her every day. Save for the one drunken night when she told him about the father she'd never known, Hauser had never been big on sharing, but Travis had learned enough down the years. She was divorced. She liked going to the gym. She ran a kid's softball team for the police athletic league. And she had an almost encyclopedic knowledge of 80s action movies. A part of him had always liked not knowing everything, because as time had gone on, they'd continued to learn new and interesting things about each other. Thirty-seven, and already a lieutenant, Travis said and whistled for effect. You'll be running the whole damn place before long. What can I say? I learn from the best. They carried on eating for a while. Then Travis asked her more about her promotion. Is that what you got lined up for me? Cold cases? Yeah, Hauser said, picking out a sliver of prawn with her chopsticks. It's 99% signed off. I just got to take you back to the plaza for introductions. You're going to need access to our system again, obviously. So a few people need to make sure you're not a total charlatan. She winked at him again. But Travis hardly noticed. His thoughts had lodged on what Hauser had said about access. That was what he needed. That was how she was going to be his life raft. As much as he denied it, because he liked Hauser, wanted the work, and felt guilty about carrying an ulterior motive into this lunch with her, access was the major reason he was here right now. He needed to be back in the system. He needed the police databases. They were how he could find the Murphys. They were how he could still find Louise Mason. Chapter 60 As Rebecca approached the ram, neither man seemed to be aware of her. Haynes' head was still down, eyes on the steering column that had shifted towards him. Lima had a hand on the crushed dash, trying to swivel his legs to the door. The cell phone was between them, in a charging slot at the midway point of the center console. To get it out, she'd have to lean over Hain. What if he grabbed her? What if Lima had his gun close by? She stopped dead, but then forced herself forward again. They still didn't seem to have noticed her, but with every attempt to exit the vehicle, Lima was getting stronger. After a while, he switched tactics. He leaned back and kicked at the passenger door with both feet. She hurried towards the bed of the ram so that she'd be approaching Haines' open window from the rear of the vehicle. She could see him in the side mirror, head still down. He looked as if he'd slipped back into unconsciousness. 
His eyes were closed and blood was leaking from his shaved head, a perpetual drip, drip, drip that carried threads of it down the side of the car. She'd almost got level with Haynes' shoulder when Lima sprang his door. As it came back at him, he stopped it with his boot. The second he did, it was like something changed. He seemed to become aware of where he was and how he'd ended up here. He started looking at the damage around him, at Hain, then out at the Cherokee. He's searching for me. Rebecca dropped to her haunches. Below the level of the windows, she was blind. She could only hear. He was shifting inside the car again, probably trying to haul himself out. She looked both ways along the loop. All she wanted was to see another car now. Then towards the sawmill, knowing help wasn't going to come from there. Further out there was a tangle of buildings, grey at this distance. They were a mile away at least. Could there be someone in them? Lima was outside the car, in front of the trees. If she was going to grab the phone, she had to do it now. She crab-walked the rest of the way to Haynes' smashed window and peered through. She had a clear view of Lima's midriff on the other side of the pickup. He was moving, shifting from one foot to the other, as if he was trying to get a better view of the Cherokee and of Rebecca. When he moved to his right, she could hear a slight drag of the foot. He damaged it. She turned her head, double-checking on Hain. He was in exactly the same position as before, except his eyes were open. It took her breath away, and as she froze, his arm came up from his lap and tried to grab her by the neck. She managed to lean away from him, hitting her head on the top of the window, but avoided his grasp, then jammed the flat of her palm into his face. The impact vibrated through her wrist. Hain? Lima ducked, looking through the passenger door. His eyes met Rebecca's. You bitch. He couldn't get around the front of the car without weaving through a knot of pine trees, so he started hobbling towards the back, dragging his foot. Quickly, Rebecca leaned inside and tried to grab the cell. It didn't move. She tried again, realising there were identical buttons on either side of the slot that the phone was clipped into. She pressed the buttons and pawed at the cell for a second time. It still wouldn't come out. Checking on Hain, she saw he was coming round again. She leaned even further in, her heart pounding inside her chest, and as she got her fingers around the phone, as she popped it from its station, she started to wriggle back out. Hain tried to grab her again. No! she screamed. Let go of me! Don't let that bitch go! Lima shouted from her right. He was at the back of the car somewhere. She could hear his foot dragging. Rebecca thrashed at Hain with her spare hand, trying to hit his face, his throat, anything, and as she did, he jerked, avoiding her attempted blows. He gripped tighter. No! she screamed again, lashing out with her elbow, and this time she caught him in the throat. He instantly released her, his body pivoting sideways, but as his arms went with him, they connected with her hand, and the cell spun out of her grip. She watched it hit the wheel, bounce off the dash, and exit through the open passenger door. No! It came to rest outside among the pines. No, no, no! She pulled herself out of the pickup, across Haines' slouched body, and searched for Lima. He was in view of her now, teeth gritted at the tailgate of the car. In his hand was the gun. She turned on her heel and looked at the jeep. It was too far away. She would have covered barely half the distance between her and the Cherokee before Lima was all the way around the pickup. By then, she'd have a bullet in her back. That meant there was only one option left. Run. Chapter 61 She passed from the road to the grass and then into the trees, the light changing, the wind dying. Behind her, Lima was shouting again, and then a gunshot rang out. Its sound was ruinous, a noise that ripped through the air. A second shot, a third, a fourth. He couldn't see her and had no idea where she was. He was panicking. Rebecca flashed on the mirror image of this moment. She and Johnny running for their lives five months ago, and then she picked up her pace again. She could feel electricity charging through her veins the air against her face. She was back at school, between the white lines of the athletics track. 
Just then, the pines began to thin out again, and the sawmill rose out of the ground like a titan breaking from the earth. It was hardly standing, its windows shattered, its corrugated metal rusted. In front of her was a huge sweep of uneven, pockmarked ground, awash in tall grass, in places almost as tall as Rebecca, and piles of moss-covered timber. Before she became swamped by the grass, she looked out to the left of the mill, to the dirt track she'd driven down in the jeep when she'd come here looking for dry wood in the winter. For a vehicle, it was the only way in and out of this place. It would also be a shortcut onto the loop's northern flank. If she used it, she'd be closer to the buildings she saw earlier. There might be someone in them. She headed for the dirt track. Please let there be someone. That was when it appeared. The Cherokee. She stumbled to a stop. Lima had predicted her plan. He was coming down the dirt track, using her own car to cut her off. Shit. Rebecca looked around, scared, desperate. The last time she'd been here, it was winter, when the temperature had been in the twenties, when anything the frost hadn't compacted was being blown sideways by the merciless squalls howling in off the Atlantic. Now in spring, it looked completely different. She headed back to the long grass. It was so tall, the scrub so thick, it dragged at her legs and arms as she tried to hide in it. The further she went, the harder it became to see through, and the more her sense of direction skewed. Without the snow and the frost, there was nothing to inhibit the grass. When everything stilled, she could just about see through to the dirt track the Cherokee accelerating along it. When the wind picked up, the grass acted like a flash flood, washing around her, confusing her, trapping her. Her stride stammered. She tried to reassert her control. Above the whisper of the grass, she could hear the ocean and the rattle of the Cherokee, and she knew she could use them to re-establish her sense of direction. The ocean was behind her through the pines. The Cherokee was to her left, the north, the mill was straight in front of her, and she could see a ramp at the side of it, old and collapsed, where the timber had once been moved to the lumber yard out front. It was a way inside. If she could go through the mill, she might be able to exit at the other end and get back onto the loop further down without Lima ever realising. But then suddenly she fell. She'd hit the ground before she knew what had happened. The impact so hard it was like a fist to the centre of her chest. Winded, she looked back, retracing her footprints in the mud, trying to see what had tripped her. It was a log half covered with grass, four feet away. Her whole body hurt like hell. She jarred her shoulder, her ankle. She got onto all fours and scrambled to her feet, pain shooting up her leg. Along the crown of the grass, as the wind stirred it, she glimpsed the jeep. It was parked. Its doors were open. No one was inside. He's already looking for me. She tried to hide, the grass moving around her. All she could hear was the thump of her pulse in her ears, a drumbeat that overwhelmed every other sound. She didn't know what to do because she didn't know where he was. Those moments in the pines, the fleeting seconds of victory, the freedom she'd felt as she'd escaped from the car wreck into the trees, knowing she was faster than them, seemed a million miles away. Rebecca? She chilled. It was him. And he was right next to her. Meetings When they got back to Police Plaza, Hauser had to sign Travis in. Even such a small act felt weird, a little dispiriting. He'd been coming to the building for eleven years, ever since rejoining the NYPD as part of the missing person squad, and he'd never had to stop at the front desk. Now he was just another member of the public. Some freelance work and a couple of database logins couldn't disguise that. They took the elevator up to where the cold case squad was based. It was a small team, and Travis knew only one of its members. Hauser introduced him to the rest. When she was done, she said, Time to go and meet the captain. They headed back to the elevators. Why is the captain on a different floor? 
Travis asked. She's been in meetings all morning. She only joined a month ago, so she's playing catch-up. She's from Queens, but she was a lieutenant over in Newark. Hauser hit the button for the tenth floor. A female captain, and now a female lieutenant, Travis said, after the doors had slid closed. This is progress. No wonder they got rid of a dinosaur like me. They shouldn't have gotten rid of you, and you're no dinosaur, Hauser said, shoving his shoulder gently with hers. You're more like a Neanderthal. Travis was laughing as the doors pinged open. They headed down to an office on the right, all glass with metal blinds. Inside were two women of about the same age. One he recognized, the other he didn't. You know the COD? I met her once in an elevator. Travis said, looking through the glass at the chief of detectives, Mackenzie. She was at her desk, writing something. On a chair to the side of her was Hauser's captain, talking to Mackenzie, but with her gaze already fixed on Travis. Even from where he was, Travis could see the fiery color of her red hair and how blue her eyes were. They were beautiful, like a summer sky. But they were at odds with the rest of her face. She looked fierce. You said you met the chief once in an elevator? Hauser knocked on the office door, then wriggled her eyebrows comically. Travis, you sly dog. Come in, Amy, Mackenzie said before Travis could respond to the joke. Hauser and Travis entered, Hauser closing the door behind her. She introduced Travis to Mackenzie, then to Captain Walker. Walker didn't offer Travis her first name. Please, Mackenzie said, sit down. Travis grabbed a chair next to Hauser. I think we've met before, Frank, Mackenzie said. He remembered again the stories about her, the nickname she had among some of the male cops, the Dyke, and particularly the observation that she never smiled, or perhaps was physically incapable of it. A few days before you retired, Travis nodded. I remember, Chief. It was early in the morning. That's correct. Did you manage to close the case you were working? Travis looked between Mackenzie and Walker, and then very briefly at Hauser. They all knew the answer, because they would already have been through his file, his history, the cases he'd worked, and the ones he'd failed to see through. That meant they were just looking for the right response. No, he said. Unfortunately, the day I left the force, I had to go to the parents of the woman I was trying to find and admit that I hadn't been able to locate her. This wasn't the time for reputation-saving bullshit. It was a test. Mackenzie just nodded. Captain Walker. Walker came forward in her seat. I know you were here a long time, Frank but I appreciate you coming in like this. I've only been here four weeks, so I'm still finding my feet, still getting to know everybody. I don't know you yet, other than what I've read on paper. And to be totally honest, at Newark PD, I wasn't a particular fan of outsourcing investigations, even to former cops with experience like you. Her face barely moved as she spoke, like her skin had been starched and Travis thought he could hear the faint trace of an accent. Not New York, even though Hauser had said she was from here. Not Jersey, either, where she'd worked before this. It was an accent from somewhere further afield, but it was so soft he couldn't be certain where. She went on. All that said, I hear you were an excellent cop. I like your honesty, and Lieutenant Hauser says she trusts you. So for now, that's enough. We've been given a federal grant to pursue cold cases that stand a good chance of being cleared, which is obviously positive news. But we've also got over 12,000 unsolved murders in the cabinets downstairs, going all the way back to the mid-80s, which is not so great. We need you to start closing some. Yes, ma'am. Walker, like Mackenzie, just nodded. And then Mackenzie went over the terms of the work he was about to agree to, including how much Travis would be paid. It didn't amount to much, 
but that was okay with Travis. The money wasn't the real reason he was here. Okay, thanks for coming in, Frank, Mackenzie said, putting an end to the meeting. She got up and shook his hand. Walker opened the door for him and Hauser, and before he knew it, the two of them were back in the elevator. Well, she seems fun, Travis said, once the doors had closed. Hauser smiled. Which one? Walker. They're both serious women. No shit. You've still got it, though, Trav. He frowned. What do you mean? You know that thing they say about Mackenzie? Well, one of the things they say about Mackenzie, that she's physically incapable of smiling? Hauser shrugged. Well, she smiled at you. I think she likes you. He laughed. Bullshit. I'm serious. Would you ever date a cop? The doors of the elevator sprang open. She's ten years younger than me. So? And she's the chief of detectives. So? He thought of Mackenzie and remembered the way she'd smiled at him in the elevator that morning, the week before he'd retired, how it had suited her, and how she'd made clear that she didn't agree with him being forced out. She was attractive, smart, and despite his protestations, he had to admit there was something about her that he liked. I thought she was gay, anyway. That's the assumption. So she's not? I don't know. Hauser said. No one's ever been brave enough to ask. They arrived back at the cold case squad cubicles. Hauser took Travis to the filing cabinets and started digging through them. What about Walker? Travis asked. What, you prefer her? No, I mean, where's she from? I told you. She came from Newark, PD. No, where's she from? She's got an accent. Oh. Hauser pulled some files out of the drawers. I don't know. I think someone said she moved out from England back in the 80s. Chapter 62 Rebecca Lima sounded so close he must have been almost on top of her. Slowly she put her hand flat against the muddy ground, steadying herself as the wind passed out of the pines from the sea and washed through the long grass. Rebecca! His voice sounded like it came from behind her this time. But when she turned back to where she thought he would be, she couldn't see anything. I can't let you go home, Rebecca. Now it sounded as if he was in front of her. What the hell was going on? She looked in all directions, realizing he was using the wind to his advantage, its ability to carry sounds and obscure their origin. She started moving, inching forward. Every time the breeze picked up, she went further in the direction of the mill. Every time it calmed, she stopped, put a hand to the ground, not daring to move except to scan her surroundings. She looked ahead of her to the wooden track at the side of the sawmill, watched it flicker in and out of view every time the wind roused. It was about a hundred feet from her. Should she make a run for it, or stay put? Terror spread like wildfire. She tried to stop the vibration in her hands, tried to claim back some of her composure, and, as she paused, almost on all fours, she happened to look to her left through a V-shaped gap in the grass. It was him. He was less than thirty feet from her. His back was to her, his profile in silhouette against the sun which was casting butter-coloured light across the top of the sawmill. At his side, facing down and pressed against his leg, was the gun. As the grass moved, it began to obscure him again. She didn't shift a muscle. She just watched, trying not to make a sound. A step to his right, then another, and once more, he was gone. Rebecca! His voice was almost lost in the wind. You know I can't let you escape. She started to move slowly, lifting her hands off the ground, her palms perfectly captured in the mud, as if they'd been set in bronze, and inched away from where his voice was, away from the sawmill. 
She did the first part on her knees because it kept her as low to the ground as she could possibly get, and then she got onto her haunches again. As she moved, she spotted something lying in the shadow of a massive, trunk-sized piece of wood, a rusting piece of metal. It looked like a tool of some kind. There was what appeared to be a wheel at the end and a sharp-toothed blade along the underside. She didn't know what it had been and didn't much care. All that mattered was it was a weapon. Sidestepping through the grass, she yanked at it. Where are you, asshole? Around her, the grass seemed to pulsate. Come on. It towered above her as she crouched on the ground. Come on, I know you're... She stopped. Something was wrong. The wind of a moment ago had died out completely. But if there was no wind, there was no way the grass could still be moving. And yet it was. It was still swelling behind her, on her shoulder, because someone was moving it. She spun on her heel, propelling herself 180 with her hand, but it was already too late. He was right on top of her, a shadow in the grass, a gunshot ripped through the air. Chapter 63 Rebecca staggered backwards. The second she landed, she expected pain, the excruciating agony of Lima's bullet tearing its way through her. But she felt nothing. When she looked down at herself, at her chest, her stomach, there was no bullet wound. Had he missed, from only four feet away? She looked up, the grass like a wall around her. Lima was gone. She couldn't see him anywhere. She pushed herself to her feet, still crouched in case he was near. What the hell had happened? That was when she saw the blood on the grass, a slather of crimson on some strands to her left. She saw footprints too, male, big, in eleven or twelve. They looked like they were going backwards. She glanced behind her at the place she'd landed and saw the rusted piece of metal she'd been about to use as a weapon. Scooping it up, she gripped it tightly, then faced the grass ahead of her again, the spot where the blood lay like a marker. Something moved. She saw it out of the corner of her eye. She swiveled on her heel in the direction of the Cherokee, pulse throbbing in her ears. No sign of Lima there. No sign of anyone. She looked towards the blood again, took another step, a second. The blood was fresh, running in thin red tresses. She reached out, slowly parting the grass, gripping the weapon harder than ever. As soon as she did, she saw him. Lima was lying next to some rotting timber. He'd landed awkwardly, propelled backwards by the bullet that had passed through his face. Rebecca took another step forward, his blood swapping the grass for her arm, but she hardly noticed. It was him on the ground, his eyes like glass, the bullet wound a dribble of treacle an inch above his left eye. Startled, she looked back the way she'd come and suddenly glimpsed the shape of another person. As it moved, she remembered how she'd never been able to get a handle on Lima's position, how she'd thought he'd tricked her, looped around her somehow. But now she knew it hadn't just been Lima out here. It had been Hain, too. She backed up slowly, one deliberate pace after the next, trying to make as little noise as possible, gripping the weapon so hard it was cutting her skin. Hain was coming towards her. She could see him now. She raised the chunk of metal she was holding. She had to get him before he saw her clearly. She had to strike before he ever got the chance to pull the trigger. Come on, you son of a bitch. And then a hand pushed through the grass, an arm reaching out for her, a face, a body. And it wasn't Hain at all. It was a man she'd never met before. His gun was at his side, the barrel pointing down, and the second he saw her properly, he stopped dead and held up a hand to her. It's okay, Rebecca, he said, almost whispering it. He slowly placed the gun on the ground. It's okay, I promise. I'm not here to hurt you, kiddo. <laughs> Thank you.
The Crossing That evening, after Travis had washed up the dinner plates and Gabby was busy FaceTiming a friend in Chicago, he sat at the living room table with the ten cold cases Hauser had given him. They were all murders. With the temporary user ID that Hauser had organized, he grabbed his laptop and logged into the NCIC and found all ten replicated in the system. Most of what was in the physical files broadly mirrored what was on the computer, but some of the digital versions lacked the fine detail of the paper notes he had to hand. That wasn't unusual. Over the years, he'd worked alongside lots of cops who treated the physical file as a Bible, the absolute authority on a case, and the NCIC version as a simple box-checking exercise. Travis had always tried to do both well, but there was little doubt that there was a heartbeat to the paper records, a clarity that the computer could never duplicate. You okay, Dad? Gabby was in the doorway behind him. Yeah, I'm good, honey. What are you doing? Just looking at some of the stuff Amy gave me today. He glanced at the TV remote in her hand. You watching something? The thing is on at nine. Oh, man. A literal stone-cold classic. There's something wrong with Blair. Travis laughed. When the kids still lived at home, he'd carved out a corner of his home life entirely for the three of them by watching classic horror movies with Mark and Gabby. Naomi had never shown much interest in cinema, and that had been fine with Travis. When she was out, or even sometimes when she wasn't, he'd curl up on the couch, his son and daughter either side of him, and watch films like The Thing. Even now, the kids would talk about it. A couple of nights before Naomi's funeral, the three of them had been talking about Stephen King novels, and it soon turned into a Misery, The Shining, and Carrie movie marathon that had gone on until 3 a.m. Shall I make some popcorn? Gabby asked. Oh, you bet. I'll be through in a second. Travis turned back to his laptop, closing the NCIC login page and going to a folder marked Montauk on his desktop. He'd created it an hour earlier, after Amy Hauser had come through for him yet again. Three or four years ago, she'd worked a case, a rape and murder, with a detective from Suffolk County PD but he'd only remembered it because she'd mentioned it at the first lunch they'd shared, four weeks after he retired. As soon as she started talking about working with the cop out on Long Island, Travis had thought about Johnny and Rebecca Murphy. So before he'd left Police Plaza, after Hauser had handed him the ten files he now had spread out in front of him, he'd asked her if she'd be prepared to call in a favor on his behalf with the detective at SCPD. Why? Hauser had asked. I need some video. She'd eyed him suspiciously. It's okay, he said. It won't affect what I'm doing for you. So what's the case? But almost as soon as she asked, the answer had come to her. Wait, are you still trying to work that thing with the artist? It probably won't lead anywhere, but it might. Travis shrugged. It might. Her eyes had stayed on him for a moment, a conflict playing out behind them. I gotta ask, Frank. You're not gonna screw this up for me, are you? No, he said. I'd never do that. Because I just took you up there to Walker, to Mackenzie, and vouched for you. You know they'll have me on traffic duty if anything blows back. It won't. You have my word. And he'd meant it and that had been enough for Hauser. Travis refocused on his laptop. In the folder marked Montauk, there were two files. The first was labeled October 30th, 21 a.m., and when Travis double-clicked on it, it opened onto a shot of Montauk Harbor, the parking lot, a ticket office fringed with a green awning, a jetty extending out into the water, and a boat with crow line printed on the side. The video started at 7 a.m., an hour before the ferry left for Crow Island, and for the most part, the parking lot was empty. 
Putting the speed up to two times and then four times, Travis watched the image. He could see the ferry's ramp, its interior big enough to take between twenty and twenty-five vehicles, depending on their size. He could see crew members milling around, and at the edges of the shot, he could just about make out some cars waiting to get on. At 7.30 p.m., he switched back to normal speed, pulled in his notebook, and flicked through to a page somewhere near the back, where he'd written the cell tower ping locations for Johnny Murphy and his sister. They mapped a trail all the way along the expressway to Montauk, then out to Crow Island. On screen, the ferry started to load. There weren't many vehicles going out, because the 30th of October was the last day of the season, which made it even easier to spot the one he wanted, a Jeep Cherokee. Using another temporary login that Hauser had set up for him so he could gain access to DMV records, he double-checked the license plate, making sure the Cherokee was definitely the same one that was registered to Rebecca Murphy. It was. Her DMV entry listed her by her married name, Russo, but he knew, from talking to her friend Noella, that she'd switched back to her maiden name after splitting from her husband. The jeep disappeared into the bowels of the ferry, and then, just before 8 a.m., the ramp was raised. Pretty soon, the ferry was chugging out of Montauk. The video ended. He opened the second, marked October 30th, 21 p.m. The time code said it was 7.30 p.m. After a couple of minutes, the ferry started its slow emergence from the darkness, forming like a monster from the seabed. Just before 8 p.m., it began maneuvering into its slot at the same jetty. Travis slowed the video right down. The ramp dropped revealing all the cars and vehicles that had come back to the mainland for winter. He watched them emerge, guided out by one of the crew, and each time one appeared, Travis would take a note of the license plate. More had come back than had gone out. The last ferry of the season would have returned people who had been staying on the island. But there was no Jeep Cherokee. This was what he'd spent his retirement thinking about the hunch slowly forming at the back of his mind. Johnny Murphy and his sister had never come back. It was why the bolo he'd put out had never got any hits in Connecticut. It meant, if they actually went to Stamford, it was in another car. But more likely, they'd never left the island at all. It was just their phones that had. It was a setup, an attempt to throw the cops off the scent, and have someone like Travis looking in totally the wrong direction, and for a long time it had worked. His blood hummed into life as he minimized the video and returned to his browser. He went back to the DMV records and inputted the license plates for all the vehicles he'd seen come off the ferry on the 30th of October. Every time he brought up a new person, he returned to the video to compare and contrast the photograph on the driver's license with as much of the driver's face as was visible on the video. It was slow work. After a few minutes, Gabby came through from the living room, TV remote in her hands. Are you coming to watch the movie, Dad? Definitely. Just give me five more minutes, sweetheart, okay? The interior of some cars was clearer than others, but most he could see some of, certainly enough to match the driver to the DMV version of them with a fair degree of accuracy. But there was one that didn't fit. It was a white Chevy Traverse. The DMV said the vehicle belonged to a Carl Stelzik, but Stelzik was gray-haired and in his sixties. The man on the video driving Stelzik's car was younger, late thirties, black hair, bright eyes. Travis switched browser windows. Logging into the NYPD database, he put in a search for Stelzik to see if there had been any flags against his name, a record, an arrest, anything. He found something else instead. Stelzik was missing too. Part 7
The Secret Chapter 64 Rebecca sat with Frank Travis in the shadow of the lighthouse and watched as the police got closer, shimmering into existence fifty miles out. There were five boats, one carrying two patrol cars and an ambulance, as well as what Travis said was a mobile crime lab. He was quiet alongside her, as if conscious of not crowding her. After he had shot and killed Lima at the sawmill, he'd guided her away from the body back towards the Cherokee. But as he made the 911 call on his cell phone, Rebecca could hold back no more. She started to sob. Even though Travis was midway through a conversation, he came back, pulled open the door and placed a hand on her shoulder. And when his call was over and the cops were on their way, he remained in the same spot, keeping his silence, letting her cry. Eventually, she asked if she could use his cell to call home. He handed it to her and told her he'd give her some privacy, going back to where Lima's body lay, and she sat there for a moment, just staring at the phone not quite believing no one was going to stop her. I get to talk to my girls. This is everything I've been waiting for. She'd believed the same thing with Caleb, inside his shack, but that opportunity had been snatched from her. This time, there was no one to get in her way. All she had to do was dial. Except she didn't know what she would say. How could she ever explain a five-month absence in the lives of two girls too young to understand? For Kyra and Chloe, it would be black and white. One day, their mother had walked out on them, and she hadn't come home. Just hearing their voices will be enough for now. But she couldn't remember cell phone numbers for Noella or for Gareth, and when she thought of Gareth, she kept thinking of the email she'd found in Carl Stelzik's inbox. She looked up into the long grass and saw Travis wading through it. She didn't know him, but there was something about him she trusted, and that meant she didn't need to worry about what Gareth might or might not have done. Not for now. Travis would protect her from Gareth, from anyone else who might still want to hurt her, or why would he have come all this way? Why work her case? Why stop the men who were trying to kill her? She looked at the cell again and put in the number for the brownstone. Her thumb hovered for a second above call and then she dialed. It just rang. No answer. Heart beating fast, she hung up, wondering what the lack of an answer meant, panicking that it meant something bad. And then she calmed herself and called directory assistance. She didn't know Noella's number off by heart. The operator rerouted her, and Rebecca listened again to a long line of rings until, this time, it hit a machine. Hey, this is Noella. Leave a message and I'll get back to you. The sound of No's voice made her tearful again, but Rebecca hung up before the tone, not wanting a recorded message to be the way in which No, or anyone else in her life, found out she was still alive. As a last resort, she dialed assistance again and asked to be connected to Mendelssohn, the ad agency Gareth worked for. When an operator picked up, Rebecca asked for him. I can't connect you, ma'am, the operator said. Why not? I'm afraid we don't have anyone of that name here anymore. Rebecca frowned. What? Gareth Rousseau left the business at the end of February. What? Where did he go? I don't have that information, I'm afraid. Rebecca killed the call, her head swimming, a flutter of nausea in her throat. Gareth had left his job. For another? Or did it mean he'd left New York entirely? Had he taken the girls with him? She tried to recall the name of the place Noella worked at, tried to think of anyone else in the life she'd had before this one whom she could possibly call. You all right, kiddo? Travis asked as he got back to the car. I can't get hold of anyone. She didn't want to break down again. She knew she was so much stronger now, so different from the person who'd first been abandoned on the island. But now she was so close to going home, to seeing her girls, so close to this nightmare finally being over. Her whole body felt like it was trembling. It's okay, Travis reassured her. I just want to speak to them. I know you do.
I can't get hold of my ex or my best friend. Don't worry, we'll get hold of them for you, okay? They said Gareth moved, and I don't know if they mean Rebecca. When she stopped, he smiled, told her to breathe. It's all right, he said. You don't need to worry anymore. You're going home tonight. Going home, just without my brother. Do you know where Johnny is? No, Travis said, not yet. It looked like he was desperate to add something else, some theory that might explain what had happened to Johnny, some small sliver of hope. But he obviously couldn't come up with anything. Across five months, Rebecca had allowed herself to taste some of that hope. She'd even allowed herself to picture an escape, a courageous act of survival on Johnny's part, where he'd made it out alive. Except it had always felt like a fantasy. Once she'd made the decision to drop her suspicions about him, to embrace what she knew in her heart was true about her brother, she realised there was no way that Johnny would ever have left her behind. Even if he feared she was dead, he would always have come back for her. The reason he hadn't was obvious. Chapter 65 Travis told her they should go and fetch his car from where he'd left it, on the loop, north of the sawmill, and then they drove back to the lighthouse, where he'd told the cops to arrive. Soon the Dodge Ram emerged into view at the edge of the road, its crushed hood, its shattered windshield. As Rebecca saw the empty driver's seat, she felt a sudden flash of alarm. What about Hain? Travis looked at her. He's missing. Missing? He was already gone from the pickup when I drove past earlier. Travis was right. There was no Hain, only the evidence of him. A faint trail of blood led away from the driver's side door, across the road in the direction of the lighthouse. When they parked up and got out, Travis swept the building for any sign of him, but all he found was more blood, heading past the lighthouse to the edge of the water. Was a boat ever docked here? He asked Rebecca, clearly thinking Hayne might have commandeered one, except Rebecca couldn't remember. She'd been past the lighthouse so many times, but she'd either never seen a boat or never thought to look for one. Boats had quickly become a reminder of her failure and a symbol of her fear. They stood there for a while, looking in the direction Hain might have tried to head, searching for any evidence of a wake or a hint of a swell, but the sea was vast and grey and entirely untouched. He could still be on the island, Rebecca said, horrified at the idea. And if he is, they'll find him, Travis replied, gesturing to the water, to the police boats coming towards them. If he's injured, he won't be able to get far. And if he's hiding out, they'll use the dogs. His scent's all over the pickup. At the mention of dogs, Rebecca thought of Roxy, of locking her inside the room at the hostel, of her still being there, and her heart plunged. Barely able to get the words out fast enough, she told Travis about her, where she was, and Travis assured her they would go back for her once the authorities had arrived. We gotta wait and see how the cops want to play at first, he added. They were quiet for a time, their silence comfortable, and then slowly they started talking about the island, about the events that had led up to Rebecca being left behind, about how she'd survived alone for so long. They talked about the night that Hain and Lima had come ashore, looking for a body to bury, and then of Caleb, and Rebecca remembered that she'd left him injured at the shack. Travis called one of the cops he'd been in contact with and told them to send a paramedic straight to Helena, and soon after, they saw one of the boats veer off towards the harbour. How did I get left here, Frank? He nodded as if he'd been expecting the question. I called around, and the people here at the harbour, they're supposed to keep records of the license plates that enter and leave the island so they know who's gone and who still remains. I mean, that seems a pretty essential tool when you're this far from the mainland in a place that closes for five months of the year. But from the calls I made, it seems those records stopped being taken some years ago. The vast majority of people who come here are fishermen, and they all have their own transportation, so the island authorities became sloppy. Rebecca's head dropped. I'm sorry, kiddo. 
So how did you find me? She asked. You heard of someone called Louise Mason? Her thoughts went to the corridor in the hostel, to the wall of paper she'd mounted. She'd never known Louise's surname until now, and she'd never been on Rebecca's suspect list, but a piece of string had branched out from Louise to a name that was. Her brother's. She was the woman Johnny dated. Right. She disappeared back in September. She's missing too? Travis nodded again. Your brother was one of the last people to see her alive. For a time, I'll admit, I thought Johnny might have something to do with it. I got this anonymous call that kind of turned everything on its head, so I went back in and looked at him again. That was when I found out that he, and you, had been missing since October 30th. Three disappearances and two of the people unaccounted for. Louise and your brother had a clear and obvious connection. He grimaced as if he didn't like having to remember some of the theories and decisions he'd made before this moment. I'm starting to wonder if my anonymous caller might have been one of the two men who came here to find your body today. I can't imagine why, but maybe they felt I was getting too close to them. Maybe they needed to shift the blame to Johnny to protect themselves. Travis then started telling her about the cell tower pings. Something always bugged me about them. Why Connecticut? You two had no links there, far as I could tell. I got no hits on your Cherokee up in Stanford or anywhere nearby. I even checked in with the state troopers after I retired, and that was still the case in February and March. So I started to think it might just have been another diversion. I knew I was right when I got hold of some video from a security camera at Montauk Harbor taken on October 30th. Lima came off that boat behind the wheel of Stelzik's Chevy. He took both your cell phones to Connecticut to throw cops like me off the scent, knowing they'd ping towers all the way there. From what you've said, it sounds like Hain wanted him to bring your car, but Lima forgot to get the keys from you before he tried to kill you, so I guess he figured getting rid of Stelzik's Chevy was the next best thing. Either way, the plan would have been the same. Ping the towers and lead the cops to a dead end in another state. He smiled, but it was sad, almost an apology. I watched that video from Montauk a week ago. I'm waiting a week to come out here. It felt like a year. I can't imagine what it's been like for you. If I was still on the force, I could have got boats in the water straight away to come here with the troops and find out what happened. I thought about alerting a friend of mine. She's a cop at the NYPD, but I don't know. She was... It wasn't. He seemed conflicted. Frank? Sorry, it's nothing. Simply that this friend of mine, she trusted me with something unrelated to this, vouched for me in front of the brass back in New York, done a favor for me in getting hold of that video from Montauk. So I didn't want to drag her into this. He stopped again, something remaining in his expression that Rebecca couldn't interpret. Was it to do with his friend at the NYPD? So I've been sitting on my hands, waiting for this ferry, hoping for answers for eight days. And do you know the first thing I saw when I drove out to Montauk Harbor and pulled into the lot? Rebecca shook her head. Lima. I was sitting there in that parking lot, waiting for the ferry, and I saw these guys pull up in a pickup towing a trailer. And one of them gets out to take a leak and when he turns around, I see his face, and it's the same guy I saw in the security camera video, the guy driving Stelzik's car. So you followed them? Best I could without being seen. If one of them made that anonymous call to me about Johnny, then I figured there was a good chance they knew what I looked like. I'd been in newspapers all the way back to my first spell with the department, and it was likely they would have done their homework. I knew I was okay in terms of my car because it was a rental, but I couldn't risk them getting too close and seeing me. That was why I was last on at the ferry, and it was why I stayed in my car the whole time. I didn't go up at all during the crossing. And then when we got to the island, they headed east down to the dig site there. I planned to go to the harbor master first to see if he recognized you, but that was before Lima turned up in Montauk. I had to switch plans. So I waited for them at the top of Simmons Gully, hid out behind this old building. And when they reappeared 90 minutes later, 
they had your Cherokee on the trailer. I felt sick seeing it because I knew what it meant for you and for Johnny. There's only one reason they'd be getting rid of evidence like that. They were arguing, too. I saw it, even from where I was. Of course, I know now that by then they were starting to doubt you were even dead. That was why Lima had come to the shack. It was why he'd shown Caleb her photograph. Hain wanted to get some gas, so he dropped Lima on Main Street, then turned around and went back. That was why Lima was alone. I couldn't keep tailing Hain. The roads were so empty and it was so easy to spot me. And there was nowhere else in Helen to just sit in the car and watch what they were doing without them seeing me. I had no idea you were in that shack or I'd have come. I know you would, Rebecca said. He shook his head, as if the decision was still rule. There was no way they could leave the island until the ferry left. So I knew I had time on my side. And before I came to the island, I spoke to this colleague of Carl Stelzik's at the Museum of Natural History, a guy called Gideon Burroughs, who'd eventually reported him missing, and Burroughs said Stelzik was staying in a hostel on the north coast. So I thought I'd head out there, see what I could find. To me, it was likely Stelzik was buried here, but even though I knew that, even though I'd seen your Cherokee on that trailer, a very obvious sign that you and your brother were dead too, I still had nothing on Louise. Did you find anything at the hostel? No, he said. I didn't even get that far. I was on the loop, north of the sawmill, when I heard this deafening crash. That was when I pulled a U-turn. The crash had been Hain and Lima hitting the tree. Here, Travis said. He was holding his cell out to her, a hint of a smile on his face. He knew where her head was at. Now he was trying to haul her out of the hole she was in. That friend of the NYPD I was talking about, I texted her after you tried to call your girls earlier and asked her to find some numbers for me. He stared at the phone for a second, as if some unspoken message were passing between him and the handset, then handed it over. Rebecca took the cell from him. On screen was a text from a woman Travis had logged as Amy. Her text had two cell phone numbers on it, one for Gareth, one for Noella. I bet there are some little girls who really need to hear from their mom. Her fingers trembling, Rebecca pressed her thumb against the number for Gareth. As it started ringing, she checked the time. It was just before 4 p.m., so probably too early for Gareth to be home. The girls would still be at daycare and he'd be somewhere else. If the girls even did the same hours or went to the same daycare, if Gareth had even moved back into the brownstone in the first place. Maybe he decided to start again somewhere different. What if he really had moved to another city? What if he'd moved in with the woman he'd been sleeping with? What if the girls now saw her as their mother, as the permanent fixture in their lives, as the only... Hello? A voice at the end of the line. Chapter 66 For a moment, everything stopped. Hello? The voice said again. Gareth? A long, agonizing pause. Beck? Beck, is that you? Yes, Rebecca said, elated, unsure, confused about how she felt. The call had rung for so long she'd become certain he would never answer. Now he had. She didn't know what to say. Beck, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Where the hell have you been? His voice wavered, an oscillating lurch between anger and relief. We thought you were dead. You haven't called. You. Someone tried to kill me. That brought him to an instant halt. What? Someone tried to kill me, she repeated, but the words were getting lost now, disappearing as she struggled to hold back the tears. Johnny and me, we came out to an island and someone tried to kill us, and I don't know what happened to John, and I got left behind in this place. I couldn't get home to... She faded out, wiping her eyes. Beck? I've been here alone for five months. On an island? 
Yes, off the coast of Montauk. Shit, Beck. Are you okay? He seemed to realise what a stupid question it was immediately after asking it. I mean, are you hurt? Sh shall I call it? I'm okay. The cops are here. She glanced at Travis. They'd driven about a mile back down the coast in the direction of Helena, where a jetty crawled out into the ocean. It was the closest point to the lighthouse that the police boats could get to without running aground. Travis had left Rebecca in his rental and walked down to meet the cops. Shit, Gareth said again. Beck, I'm so... I can't believe this. I know, she said. Shall I drive out to you or something? No, it's fine. I'll be home soon, she sniffed. I'll be home soon. Even now, it was hard to believe that was true, harder to let herself believe it. I didn't know if you'd be at work or not, she said. And the ordinary nature of the sentence, its absolute banality and how much she'd longed to be able to ask something as simplistic and mundane, brought more tears to her eyes. Beck? I'm sorry, she said. It's okay. I got a new job and do afternoons from home now. You know, since you left, uh, since you dis- He stopped himself. He didn't know how to describe what she told him. Since last year, since last November, the girls go to daycare in the mornings and I pick them up and bring them back here and they constantly interrupt me while I'm on conference calls. There was humor in his tone, a profound sense of love for their daughters. It's actually worked out pretty well, he added, but then paused as if he understood how insensitive that might have sounded. Rebecca thought of the email Gareth had sent Stelzik, of his place on the suspect list, of the questions she wanted answers to. But then it all faded into the background. Can I speak to the girls? Yeah, Gareth said. Yeah, of course. Are they there? Yeah, they're here. But now there was hesitation in Gareth's voice. Yeah, he said again. Yeah, just give me a second. She heard him put the phone down and shout, Kyra, Kyra, come here, sweetheart. And then she heard the faint creak of footsteps, of old floorboards moaning, of Gareth ascending the stairs. And after that, there was a hush. And in the hush, she knew something for sure. He's told them I'm dead. That was why he'd left the cell phone behind instead of taking it upstairs with him. It was where the hesitation in his voice had come from, the thing that had distracted him. Eventually, maybe two or three months in, with no sign of her or Johnny, no indication of where they'd gone and why they hadn't come home, he'd realised he had to tell Kyra, because Chloe was still too young, the truth, or some version of it. He had to tell her why her mum wasn't living with them, why she wasn't at the breakfast table first thing in the morning, and why she wasn't there to tuck them in last thing at night. So he told them she was dead, because that was what it had looked like. Hello? Her voice came out of nowhere. Kai? No response. Kai, is that you, baby? It was deathly quiet at the other end. Kyra? Kyra? Why wasn't she answering? She's not answering because she doesn't know who I am. I'm a stranger. She doesn't remember my voice. Kai, it's okay. It's me. It's mummy. An even longer, more terrible silence. Kai, Rebecca sobbed. You remember mummy, right? Again, there was no sound from the other side, not even the crackle of her daughter's breath on the line, and this time, Rebecca completely fell apart. She leaned forward against the dash, and everything hit her at once. Tears as fierce as every storm that had ripped across the island. Abandonment as brutal as every day she'd been alone. Pain as real as every cut she'd made in her skin, every bruise, every sprain. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Travis staring at her from the jetty. But there was nothing he could do. 
There was nothing anyone could do. Did God send you back? Everything stopped for a second time. Kai? Rebecca wiped at her eyes, her nose. Did God send you back? Kyra repeated, her voice small, reticent, her words edged with an uncharacteristic shyness. But it was her. It was the voice Rebecca had longed to hear every day for a hundred and fifty-two days. Yes, baby, Rebecca said. God sent me back. Because Daddy said you were in heaven, she swallowed. I know he did. Are you still in heaven? She wiped her eyes. No, honey, Rebecca said gently. No, I'm not in heaven anymore. I'm on my way back. I'm almost home. Chapter 67 Investigators cleared a space inside the general store and set up a table, some chairs, and an interview kit. The roof was still leaking, the bucket Rebecca had left there to catch the water overflowing. Islanders had told the cops that the owner of the store didn't usually arrive back until May, but Rebecca overheard the cops talking to him on the phone at one point, explaining what they were doing. Later on, an early season fisherman came in and made running repairs to the ceiling. The whole time, he kept eyeing Rebecca. She watched through the door, a blanket around her shoulders, some water on the table in front of her, as, out on the street, Frank Travis talked to one of the detectives from Suffolk County PD. It had been four hours since he'd found her outside the sawmill, three since she'd got off the phone to Kyra and Gareth, and two since the cops had decided to move her down to Helena to be interviewed. Travis had told her forensic teams were still up by the lighthouse, working on the pickup in the molten orange glow of sunset. Search teams were busy too, scouring the island for signs of Hain. So far they'd found nothing. The detective Travis was talking to was called Bowners, and was a slim, attractive woman in her late forties. Beside her, Travis couldn't have looked more different. He was over ten years older for a start, his body starting to go to seed, his hair just about more black than grey, his beard dark except for the places in which it was thickest, at the chin, along his jaw, where it had tinted silver. Halfway through talking to Bowners, he'd got out a notebook and put on a pair of reading glasses. But the weird thing was, none of it made him seem old. There was an energy to him, a vitality. She'd often seen the same thing with doctors after they'd called it a day. They ended up missing the job, even the worst of it, and whenever they returned to advise, to give lectures, it was like something lit up in them. They cast off retirement like they'd prized open the teeth of a trap. Travis and Bowners broke off the conversation and disappeared from view. A couple of minutes later, Travis returned. There was someone with him. Roxy! As soon as the dog heard Rebecca's voice, she was straining against her leash. Travis smiled, struggling to cope with how hard Roxy was fighting to get free, and Rebecca jumped up from the table. Roxy leapt at her, so excited she barely knew which part of Rebecca to start with. In return, Rebecca simply squeezed, closing her eyes, savouring it. They stayed like that for a long time. A while later, Bowners came in. Hey, Rebecca, she said, sitting down next to Travis. We met earlier. I know you want to get home. Five months alone in this place... She let the rest of the sentence hang. Problem is, we're a hundred miles from the mainland, on an island with one cell phone tower, no internet, and no police station. By the time we've got back to Montauk, we would have lost time and potentially recall. I want to get this first interview down before we leave. Is that okay? I guess, Rebecca said. I'd like to film it, too, so I'm just going to grab a camera. Bowness said, and went outside again in the direction of the harbour, where Rebecca knew a police truck was parked. As she thought of the harbour, she thought of Caleb again, and asked Travis how he was doing. It's too early to say, but they think he'll be okay. She nodded, eyes returning to the window. 
the two of them quiet now. She had something else to ask. She just wasn't sure if she wanted the answer. Have they found Johnny yet? Travis pushed his lips together. Not yet. I'm sorry, Rebecca. But that wasn't all. Frank? His gaze was on an item that Bowness had brought in with her and left between the two of them. Rebecca couldn't make out what it was. When Travis looked up again, he seemed distressed. They found this he said, and placed the item on the table between them. It was a clear plastic bag marked Evidence. Inside was a wallet. Rebecca felt winded. This was Johnny's, I think. She nodded. Where did you find it? At the lighthouse. The lighthouse? Why would it be there? We don't know yet, Travis said. But his body's not there? body. Even now she could hardly bear to describe Johnny in that way. She tried to think of how she might have missed him at the lighthouse, and the answer came soon enough, because she hadn't been looking for him there. No, Travis said quietly. We haven't found them yet. Sorry, kiddo. After that, they were silent for a while. You know, Travis said eventually, I didn't tell you this earlier, but when I was eight, my parents brought me here. He was looking at Main Street, caught in a memory. I mean, I'm an old man, so you can imagine how long ago that was, he grimaced playfully. Back in the 60s, Crow Island was the place to come, and I remember one summer break, my old man surprised me and my mom. He drove us all the way to Montauk in a shitty AMC, rust all along the panels the suspension like a tank's, and he told us we were getting the ferry out here. We were speechless. Crow Island was where rich people came. Oh, don't get me wrong. We stayed in the cheapest, crappiest hotel on the island because that was all my dad could afford, but my mom and me, we didn't give a damn. We were lucky if we got a vacation at all. So a vacation to Crow Island? We were like that. Yeah? Did I tell you my dad was a cop? No, but I knew he was. When I talked to Johnny last year, he said your dad worked out of the 68th precinct. A brief pause at the mention of Johnny. Anyway, Rebecca said, a beat cop's salary, three kids, you can do the math. I lived in England until I was 18, and when I came back for the summer holidays, we used to go to the same place in Jersey at Union Beach. The J, it was called. It was the only vacation Dad could afford, but we loved it. Travis nodded. Your dad passed a couple of years back, right? Yeah. And your other brother? Mike, Rebecca forced a smile. Yeah, he's dead too. And then the full, unadorned picture was laid bare in front of them. Rebecca's dad was dead. Mike was dead. And now Johnny was, too. She was all that was left of the Murphys. You want to hear something weird? Travis asked. He looked older all of a sudden, greyer, more beaten. When I pulled into Montauk this morning, I had this crazy, completely inappropriate sense of nostalgia about returning to the island. Despite everything... The dread in the pit of my stomach, my head was full of images of my mom and me building sandcastles on the beach. There was another flicker in his face. But you know, the second the boat left, it all changed. Everything just pulled into focus. It wasn't just that I'd recognized Lima and knew in my gut that he and Hain were up to something. It wasn't even that I knew you, your brother, and Louise were connected somehow, even if I still can't prove it. And that if the cases are connected, it stands to reason that the same men are involved in both. It wasn't those things. It was more that I just kept thinking you and Johnny were going to be buried deep in some hole somewhere. And the men I was following would get away with it again, just like they did with Louise. The expectation of failure gave me focus, because I felt certain I was going to fail you, like I failed Louise. He glanced at Rebecca, and something moved in his eyes. To start with, she thought it was a kind of 
mourning for Louise. And maybe it still was that. Maybe it was some residual emotion, the echoes of him stealing himself for what he'd thought he'd find here. History repeating. But it wasn't that. I drove out to Montauk this morning thinking I'd never, not for a second, find you alive. But you are, because you fought so damn hard to be. The way you survived here, the fight you've got, it might just be the bravest thing I've ever seen in my life. He turned to her, his eyes flashing. So, I guess what I'm saying is, I know I'm asking a lot here. I know I'm asking a hell of a lot, more than I should be. I know all you want is for your life to be normal again, to be home with your girls right now. But I need you to be brave for a bit longer, Rebecca. Bowners was on her way back. You're the key, kiddo. The key? He looked at her. I don't know why they wanted you dead. I still got zero idea what happened to Louise. But there's one thing I do know. He leaned in a little close to her. Somewhere in your head is the answer. Identities She was in a cab on the way home when Tillman called her on her cell. The day before, he'd given her the number of a new burner he was using, and in the time since, she'd committed the number to memory, so she knew right away it was him. She knew as well that he wouldn't call without a reason. She hit answer. It's 2 a.m. Yeah, well, we need to talk about something. At 2 a.m.? We might have a problem. And this can't wait until morning? It's about Travis. Her breath caught. What about him? And it's about Axel, too. She tried to retain her composure. Okay. Maybe it's better if we do this in person. That meant it was big and potentially messy. She felt herself tense, then tried to think of the best place to meet. She didn't want Tillman at her house. As much as possible, she tried to avoid being seen with him, especially now. She'd worked her ass off to land the new job. The last thing she needed was questions being asked about her judgment when she'd barely got her feet under the desk. She said, I thought all of this shit was sorted. It was a band-aid, that's all. I always told you that. Tillman was on edge. She could hear it in his voice. And now I find out that Travis is back working cold cases. Have you got any idea how fucking dumb that is? The Louise Mason case is dead. And I guarantee you that by bringing Travis back in from the cold, it's not going to stay that way for long. I vetted the cold cases we gave him. You just don't get it, do you? Travis isn't some asshole. He's smart. He knows what he's doing. And you've just given him access to the system. She felt a shiver of panic. I told you from the start. What we did that night with Axel, it was just to stem the flow. Sooner or later, this was going to come back and bite us on the ass. Axel is a big problem. He's always been a problem. She closed her eyes. She'd known this day was coming. Tillman himself had warned her the last time they'd met in person on the bench at the end of Pier 15. But even though she'd asked for a delay that time, and Tillman had honored it, she knew there could be no delay this time. It was inevitable. When she opened her eyes again, in the window of the cab, she briefly glimpsed a reflection of herself, phoned to her ear. Except for her hair, she looked colorless, like a wraith, a pale, tortured soul, tethered to nothing. No person, no home, no family. You think Travis knows about me? She asked. No. You think he knows who you are? Your details? No. Definitely not. How can you be so confident? Because I switched identities after the fundraiser. She glanced at the cab driver, suddenly aware that he would be able to hear her side of the conversation. She lowered her voice and said, 
You never told me that. You switched the night of the fundraiser? Why? Why do you think? It was a stupid question. They both knew what had happened that night. The name Nick Tillman was confined to the trash the minute your precious Axel entered the picture. A damning silence, loaded with the weight of the last six months. Axel is responsible. Axel is the reason we're still running around, months down the line, trying to plug holes in the hull of this sinking ship. Axel is the issue here. She looked ahead of her through the windshield of the cab, into the darkness of the Holland Tunnel. It was like a mouth about to swallow her up. Tillman, I know this has to be done, but... Hain, came the response. From now on, you can just call me Hain. Chapter 68 For the next hour, Rebecca told Bowners everything. By the time she was done, the street outside was black and silent, the ferry gone. The police activity had subsided too. From where she was, she could still see some marked cars, but their light bars were off. I'm sorry you had to go through all that, Bowner said, the nib of her pen making a soft scratch across the pages of a pad. Despite the camera, she'd made notes on pretty much everything Rebecca had told her. I mean it she added and looked up. I've got kids myself. It must have been hell for you. Rebecca just nodded. It had. What else was there left to say? Is Hain still on the island? she asked. No, Bowners responded. We don't believe he is. Something twisted in Rebecca's gut. We believe he may have commandeered a boat. Bowners held up a hand, seemingly recognizing the reaction. It's okay. We'll find him. And until we do, we'll make sure you and your family are protected. I've spoken to detectives at the NYPD, and they've posted officers at your home already. Cops being posted outside the home in which her girls were sleeping. It would have been barely believable before all of this. Something that happened to other people. Now it wasn't even the worst of what she'd been through. The names Lima and Hain, Bowners went on, are aliases. Hain we haven't managed to trace, although there appeared to be some links to the stolen identity of a man called Nick Tillman. The real Tillman's been dead for ten years, so Hain, whatever his real name, was just using it. Lima, we have a confirmed ID on. He was called Lorenzo Celestino. He was born in Lima, Peru, which is obviously why he chose that particular name. We're still running down some leads, but he had a record. He did five years for assault at Rikers, so our assumption is that Hain will have a similar background. He'll have a record. We just need to find it. Of course, this whole thing begs the question of why they chose to use aliases, even when they were alone, or thought they were. The obvious answer was to minimize the risk of them being ID'd at any point. Bowners looked down at her notes. The one thing I can't figure out, she said, and I know has been bothering Frank as well, why did Lima come to the island by himself to kill you and your brother? We haven't found any evidence of Hain on the cameras in Montauk. Rebecca shrugged. I have no idea. You said when they both returned to the island that night, you got the sense that Hain was in charge? That's what it seemed like, yes. So if he was in charge, why leave everything to Lima? Bowners wasn't really asking Rebecca. It would have been a hell of a lot less risky if Hain had come along as well. You definitely never met either man before. No, never. And you never met Louise Mason either, is that correct? Not in the flesh, no. So your only knowledge of Louise was through Johnny. And Kirsty Cohen. Bowners wagged her pen at Rebecca. Right, your college friend Kirsty. She played matchmaker for Louise and Johnny? Yes. But Johnny thought Louise wasn't interested. I know he texted her a couple of times after leaving her at the fundraiser. Maybe he called as well, but never got a response. He didn't talk much about it. About Louise? Was that unusual? Not at all. Johnny kept things pretty close to his chest when it came to relationships. He didn't like to talk about them until he knew for sure it was real. 
and that the woman was genuinely interested. Rebecca thought of the confession her brother had made to her the night after the incident in London. Johnny was always scared of being hurt. I do think he liked her, though. There was a brief, funereal quiet. He liked her. She seemed to like him. And in any other life, they might have ended up together. But not in this one. Travis shuffled forward in the booth. Okay, here's what I know about the night Louise vanished, he said, a notebook out in front of him now. Every inch of it was crammed with scribbles in the margins, diagrams, phone numbers. On September 23rd last year, she went with your brother to a fundraiser at the Royal Union Hotel in the East Village. It was for the children's charity One Life Second Chance. Louise was one of its patrons and had offered to paint someone's portrait as part of an auction they were doing. Anyway, Johnny gets a call from the hospital about your friend Noella having appendicitis just as the two of them are arriving at the hotel. So he drops Louise at the fundraiser, makes sure she gets into the event okay, then heads back to Brooklyn. She goes inside. Travis stopped, a flicker, a long breath. By the end of the night, she's vanished. No one remembered seeing her? Rebecca asked. Plenty of people remembered seeing her at the actual event, but no one remembered seeing her leave. Best I ever got was a possible sighting of her in the hotel bar. He went to the back of his notebook, where there was a pouch bulging with more paper. Snapping off a band, he pulled everything out. Most of the paper was folded, including a glossy printout, fuzzy and dark. A still from a surveillance camera. That's the hotel bar, he said, pushing it towards Rebecca. The camera is out in the corridor, which doesn't help, but I think this might be her head. He jabbed a finger at the indistinct top half of a face, obscured by people and the open doors of the bar. She's talking to someone. Travis's finger moved from Louise to a second face, even more obscured at the edges of the frame. It was a man, white or Hispanic, caught in the middle of a wide smile. She could see the vague profile of his face, but beyond that, it was impossible to be sure about anything else. The shot was zoomed in, blurry. Do you know who that is? Rebecca asked. It could be Hain. Rebecca leaned in closer to the picture. Or it could be Lima. Travis selected another piece of folded paper, opened it out and set it in front of her. These are the best two shots we've got of the bar in the time before Louise disappeared, he said, and pushed over the second. It was another still from the same camera in the same part of the hotel. This one was showing more of the foyer, the bar only visible at the left edge of the frame. The camera must have been on a rotation. Elsewhere, guests milled around or waited in line at the front desk or spilled through the lobby doors. The shot was bleached, the resolution mediocre, grainy. Rebecca's gaze went to the left of the frame. It took her a second to work out what had caught her attention, but then it pulled into focus. A group of men were just inside the door of the bar. Five of them, possibly more, a tangle of arms and legs. One had his hand on the door, holding it open, as if he were getting ready to leave. It was impossible to see who he was, because apart from the sleeve of a jacket, he was behind the partly open door. It was also impossible to make out the rest of the men, certainly as individuals, because their tuxedos and dark suits merged into one homogenous blob, or parts of them were cut off by the framing. All Rebecca could clearly see were two faces, a waiter in the foreground, and someone else. She glanced up at Travis. Who's that? She pointed to a man in the group. The distance between him and the camera had resulted in a faint blurring of his features. Rebecca could tell he was white, his hair was black or very dark brown, and he was one of the tallest of the men. He'd worn a grey suit, white shirt and black tie to the fundraiser. His eyes were just blotches, dark spots obscured by the lighting in the bar. Travis leaned in. I'm not sure. 
There was no way to get a definitive idea of who was in the hotel that night because although I had all the names from the fundraiser's RSVP list, the hotel bar is open to the public. Anyone here could have wandered in off the street. He swiveled his head slightly, trying to get a better view of the man. Why? Do you think you might know him? Bowners used a finger to drag in the original surveillance shot from the bar of what Travis believed was Louise talking to little more than a nose, a mouth, and a wide smile, and turned it so Rebecca could compare the two pictures side by side. Take your time, she said calmly. But she wasn't calm, Rebecca could tell. I don't know if I... Rebecca stopped. I don't think I know him. But then she looked at the man's face again. Or do I? She dragged the picture even closer. She stared at his face some more. And that was when it hit her like a train. Before After she got dressed, Rebecca came out of the bathroom to find him making the bed. He had his back to her, leaning over the mattress, dressed in a white vest and grey tracksuit pants. He didn't notice her to start with. For a moment, she stood in the doorway, uncertain what to do. She looked around at his place. It was nice. Homely, photographs on the walls of old New York, the smell of coffee and bacon coming from the kitchen on their left, the living room through a doorway ahead of them, flooded by early morning sun. Behind the bed was a wall of red brick with an autographed soccer shirt. The name Henri printed above a number 14 mounted on the wall in a frame. You like football? He turned, surprised to find Rebecca there, and then his gaze followed hers to the frame. Oh, he smiled. Yeah, big fan. Terry was my hero. She nodded, didn't know what else to say. She thought again how good-looking he was. She was thirty-nine, and he was at least fifteen years older. His hair and stubble flecked grey, but he looked good on it. He was fit his body strong. He took care of himself. Listen, he said, I'm really sorry again about, he faded out, about all of this, last night getting so drunk we don't remember anything, even each other's names. Maybe we should have a do-over, he added, smiling yet again, reaching out a hand to her, clearly hoping she would take it. Hello, I'm Daniel. She hesitated for a moment, but then she put her hand into his. Hello, she said. I'm Rebecca. They stared at each other, unable to come up with anything else to fill the gap. And then he laughed sheepishly, and she did too, and it seemed to clear the air. I feel I need to be honest with you, he said, and dread welled in her. I do have someone else in my life, as I guess you do too. She grimaced. It's a bit more complicated than that. Okay, he said, and she appreciated that he didn't ask a follow-up. She didn't want to have to explain. I meant what I said earlier, though. I don't do stuff like this normally. It's not who I am. She and I, I don't know, I guess we're in a weird place at the moment, but that's not any kind of excuse. I didn't go out looking for this last night, I promise you. I would never do that. For some reason, even though she knew barely anything about him but his name, she believed him. He seemed so sincere, so serious. She had the sudden compulsion to tell him about Gareth, about their split, because in a weird place at the moment was exactly the definition of their relationship too. They were split up. She was still hurting from his infidelity, but they'd reached an equilibrium where they didn't talk about getting back together but didn't fight anymore and weren't looking to move things on. What was that other than weird? I don't think I'm going to tell her about this, Daniel admitted, his eyes creasing as if the admission hurt him somehow. She didn't know what to say to that, because she didn't know which was better, admitting it or concealing it. She felt more comfortable with the second one, concealing it, burying it, but it would be a decision wreathed with aftershocks. 
She knew what type of person she was, so she knew already that every time she'd start to make some kind of peace with what had happened here, or as close to peace as she could get, a tremor would hit her. It was just how she was built. So she shook her head and said, No, I won't either. It's just too... She couldn't think of anything to define her situation other than the same word. Complicated. It was so prosaic, but it summed it up perfectly. He smiled, trying to lift the moment, and a clumsy, inelegant silence settled between them. They just looked at each other, unsure what else to say. Well, I think I'd better be going, Daniel, Rebecca said. You remember the movie Beverly Hills Cop? She frowned, thrown by the change of direction. Don't worry, he said, holding up a hand. There's a point to this. What I mean is, that film, it was huge when I was at high school in the 80s. I was a teenager and I thought it was so cool. And what was even cooler was that not only could my friends and I quote all the best lines Eddie Murphy had, I actually shared the same surname as the character he played. She still didn't get it. So what? He saw her confusion and shook his head in apology. Sorry. What I was just trying to say, very inelegantly, was that my name's Daniel Foley, if, down the line, things get less complicated. He was saying he liked her, and he wanted to get to know her. She looked at him, how handsome he was, how polite and awkward he could be, how self-deprecating and apologetic, and she felt a momentary buzz. There was something about him she liked, too. But then she shook the whole idea from her head. Her life was already a mess. This would just make it worse. She needed things to calm, not escalate. Okay, she said. Okay, he repeated, seemingly relieved she hadn't balked and run for the door. He smiled again. It was a nice smile. Well, you know where I live now, she nodded. And you know my name. I do, she said. Mr. Daniel Foley. Axel Foley, he responded. What? That was the name of Eddie Murphy's character in Beverly Hills Cop, he said. So that's what everyone started calling me. It's what my friends call me. Rebecca just nodded again. I'm not Daniel to most people, he said. I'm Axel. The back seat, six months ago. The parking garage was quiet. That was one piece of good luck. Hain exited the elevator and started looking for the Lexus. He found it quickly, its hood longer than the car's either side of it, the front end nosing out, like an animal breaking from cover. He checked around him again, making sure that no one else was on this level, then hurried down the angle of the ramp. As he walked, he started going over the back story he'd already invented for the man called Stuart Lawrence Hain. His time as Nick Tillman was done. That ID was finished. It had been finished the second Axel called him and told him what had happened. Tillman, however careful he'd been, was a trail that could eventually lead back to this moment. Hain wasn't. Hain was brand new an alias that was a complete dead end. The front seat of the Lexus came into view. Axel was on the driver's side, his hands on the wheel, shirt unbuttoned at the top, and black tie removed. Their eyes met through the windshield. Under Hain's gaze, Axel shriveled. Hain picked up the pace, his attention switching to the rest of the garage, searching for signs of people exiting the elevator, Arriving, on phones, smoking in corners. He was still in the clear. When he got within sight of the Lexus, Axel buzzed down the window. But Hain didn't wait. He yanked the driver's side door open. Get out, he hissed. Thanks for coming. Get the fuck out. Axel did exactly as he was asked. Button up your shirt and put on your tie. As Axel followed his instructions, Hain took yet another look around the garage. Did anyone see you down here? 
Axel shook his head. No. Are you sure? Positive. Hain glanced inside the Lexus. What am I going to do? Axel asked. Lower your voice. What am I going to do? He repeated, a whisper this time. You're not going to do anything. Axel frowned. What do you mean? Hain ripped his eyes away from the Lexus, then turned to Axel, his face burning with rage. He wanted to break this prick in half, choke him, beat him. Instead, he took a breath and said, I mean, you're not going to do anything. You're going to go upstairs and act like nothing ever happened. They stared at each other. Hain frowned. What? That's a stretch for you? No, I just... You just what? I just don't know what to say to everyone. Hain gave Axel a long, withering look. Are you shitting me? No, I... You're the biggest fucking liar I ever met in my life. You lie to people all the time. It's what you do. It's who you are. So think of this as just another piece of ass, and I'm sure you'll be able to come up with something credible. Okay. Axel muttered again, belittled. People need to believe everything is normal. You need to go up there and be Axel or Daniel or whatever the fuck you're calling yourself tonight. I know. So look normal. Axel straightened his clothes, his hair. If you're not convincing, Haynes said, you screw us both. Axel didn't respond. Hain took a step closer. You understand? Axel nodded. Hain grabbed hold of his neck. You don't look like you're listening to me. He was speaking through his teeth, spitting the words into Axel's face. I'm not going down for this, you hear me? Axel tried to nod again, but couldn't move his head. You hear me? I hear you. He wheezed. Hain held him there for a moment, against the car, digging his nails into Axel's throat. And then finally he released his grip and stepped away. He looked inside the Lexus again. Louise Mason's dead eyes stared back. Part 8 Freedom Chapter 69 in the late evening of Friday, the 1st of April, six months after the disappearance of Louise Mason and twelve hours after Frank Travis took a ferry across to Crow Island and found out that Rebecca was still alive, a body was found in Fort Washington Park beneath the George Washington Bridge. The victim, a white male in his mid-fifties, had apparently committed suicide, scaling the barrier at the edge of the bridge, then jumping two hundred feet to his death. The man's name was Daniel Foley, Axel to his friends. He was unmarried, his parents had died when he was in his twenties, he had no siblings and appeared not to have been in a relationship with anyone at the time of his death. But Foley wasn't a recluse. In fact, the opposite. Within hours, detectives at the 33rd Precinct were able very quickly to paint a picture of who he was, not least via Foley's colleagues at Retrogram, the social media giant where he'd worked for two decades in publicity and had been a hugely popular member of staff. He was called kind and generous, with a fantastic sense of humour, and despite fairly modest academic qualifications, a business degree from Staten Island College, which he'd completed in his mid-twenties after originally dropping out of high school. They said he was very often the smartest guy in the room. Almost universally, the people who'd known Daniel Axel Foley, from school friends he'd kept in touch with to the people at Retrogram, described feeling shocked at the news. One said, If I was asked to name a person less likely to commit suicide, I couldn't think of one. Axel was never anxious, never despondent. He didn't have low self-esteem. He was never tearful, didn't lack energy. He hadn't lost weight. He never talked about his sleep being disturbed. <sighs> I mean, all the things I know about depression, he didn't suffer from. I can't think of one reason why he'd jump. Yet he had. 
So the next day, the cops at the 33rd started pursuing the idea that Foley might have been pushed. If it was a murder, it might better explain why he'd done something so apparently out of character, so drastic. But they couldn't find any evidence of anyone having shadowed Foley to the suicide spot. Traffic cameras around the bridge showed him walking west on 178th Street and taking the south walk on Haven Avenue, a spiral of concrete that corkscrewed around to the eight-lane upper level. From there, he went most of the way to the first suspension tower. In the minutes afterwards, no other pedestrians exited the same way as Foley had gone in, and none went west to New Jersey, so no one was on the bridge with him at the time. When detectives rolled on footage from the rest of the night using three cameras at three separate points, all they found were new angles on the same thing. Daniel Foley leaping to his death. It was 100% a suicide. They just didn't understand why he'd done it. But then 24 hours on from Foley's death, late on the 2nd of April, a cop from Suffolk County PD named Bowners changed the direction of the case when she met with detectives at the 33rd Precinct and told them she might have something. Or more specifically, someone. Her name was Rebecca. Chapter 70 Later, Travis told Rebecca everything about Daniel Foley, about the search for answers in his suicide. But for a while that night, after she'd ID'd Foley in the picture from the hotel, Rebecca had been left to her own thoughts. Travis and Bowners had exited the general store and she'd remained behind with Roxy, stroking her, confused, hurt and embarrassed by having to recount the night she'd slept with Foley, the man responsible for Louise Mason going missing. Maybe the man responsible for all of this. In her time on the island, even as she'd pinned the name Daniel to the corridors of the hostel, she'd never seriously entertained the idea that all of this was to do with him, partly because other theories and other suspects seemed more compelling. Anonymous sex with a stranger seemed so low down the list of motives for wanting a person dead, it barely even registered, and it still didn't make total sense, even now. It had been a one-night stand. There was no mystery to it. Foley had lied to her about being in a relationship, but people did that all the time. It was just that the lie was normally about not being in a relationship. On the drive back to New York, Travis attempted to help her make sense of things, but it was hard because he didn't yet have a full picture himself, and the closer they got to home, the more panicked Rebecca felt. She was desperately tired. She was physically and emotionally bruised, but mostly she was unexpectedly fearful about seeing her girls. She'd lost so much weight had a big new scar on her face, and her hair was shorter than it had been at any point since they were born. What if they didn't recognise her when she walked through the door? What if they wanted to be with Gareth, not her? By the time they exited the interstate in Brooklyn, she could hardly think straight. Roxy was moving around on the back seat, pressing her nose to the glass as the city whipped past, uncertain where they were or where they would end up. Beside Rebecca, Travis didn't say anything for a while, and then started trying to reassure her. It's going to be okay, kiddo, I promise. They pulled up at the brownstone. There was a uniformed cop outside. Rebecca looked at the living room windows, saw the curtains twitch, and then Noella peered out. Their eyes met. The second no started waving excitedly, Rebecca welled up. Travis put a hand on her arm and then Noe was hurrying out of the front door. A second later, Gareth followed, Chloe in his arms half asleep, and then finally, hesitant and using her dad's leg for cover, Kyra appeared. Through the glass, Rebecca heard her say, Look, Daddy, there's a doggy in the car, and she pointed to Roxy. The cop moved aside as he saw what was about to happen, nodding at Rebecca as she got out. Rebecca wiped her eyes with the sleeve of the sweater that Bowness and Suffolk County PD had issued her, and then No broke from the group, sprinting towards her. She launched into a hug. Never do that again, she said into the side of Rebecca's face. 
Rebecca hugging back hard. When she broke off and looked at the house again, Gareth and the girls had come all the way down the steps, Chloe now fully asleep on her father's shoulder. Gareth smiled apologetically. Sorry, I tried to keep her up. He leaned in and hugged her, and as he did, Rebecca put her mouth against the top of Chloe's head, her nose, her cheek, breathing in her daughter. She kissed her over and over again and touched her hand gently to Chloe's face. Her daughter's skin felt so soft, and Rebecca's fingers were so marked now, so bruised and damaged, that she worried she might hurt Chloe somehow. But she kept on sleeping soundly. Hello, Mommy. Rebecca looked down at Kyra. She'd been gently encouraged to come forward by Gareth, had maybe even been told what to say. Rebecca dropped to her knees on the sidewalk so that she was on the same level as Kai. She'd grown so much in five months. Hello, sweetheart. Do you remember me? She nodded once. You haven't forgotten your mummy. What's that? Kyra pointed a tiny finger at the scar on the side of Rebecca's face. Were you in a fight? No, Rebecca said. I just had an accident. Does it hurt? Not anymore. Her daughter's eyes went to the car. Is that your doggy? She asked. No, I'm just looking after her. What's her name? Roxy. Kyra started to giggle. That's a funny name. She's a funny dog. And then they looked at each other again. And Rebecca said to Kyra, You'll never know how much I missed you. And she brought her daughter into her arms. And she didn't let go. Chapter 71 The reason for Daniel Foley's suicide became apparent once Rebecca had ID'd him. Bowners, who were soon jointly working the case with detectives from New York, handed the two security camera shots from the hotel to the NYPD lab in Queens. Using facial recognition software, technicians were able to prove that the man Rebecca had identified and the man who was talking to Louise in the bar were the same person. To make sure, Tex then used a photo of Daniel Foley provided by his colleagues at Retrogram to compare with the man in the hotel bar. It was a match. Foley was the person talking to Louise. Rebecca found out all of that from Travis, who in turn had been given the information by Bowners. He asked Rebecca to keep it between them because he knew Bowners wouldn't approve, but it was clear Travis was struggling in the same way, shackled to unanswered questions. It was one of the reasons why, 36 hours after arriving back in Brooklyn, her second day at home, he returned to see her once again. Roxy greeted him at the door, barking and pawing at him, and as he bent and played with her, Rebecca realised, for the first time, that she was going to keep the dog. There was no question now. Roxy belonged here. She'd take care of the paperwork once this was over. Whenever that is. Earlier, sitting at the windows, watching the sunrise, She'd had the wistful idea that she just had to accept her freedom for it to be true. Now it seemed obvious she was kidding herself. Until Hain was caught, she was confined to the house. Rebecca set the girls up in the living room with a couple of episodes of Dora the Explorer, then she and Travis moved through to the kitchen. Is there any news on the email Gareth sent Stelzik? she asked, keeping her voice down, even though Gareth was at work and she doubted either of the girls could hear. She just needed to know. I asked Bowners and she says one of their technicians traced it to an IP address in California. Rebecca frowned. California? The IP address belongs to a... <clears throat> he checked his notebook. VPN. You know what that is? I didn't until last night. It's a virtual private network. So basically, a wall that shields your real location and your IP address. So we don't know if it was Gareth or not. Do you think it's likely he would use a VPN? She thought about it. It was possible, 
but it suggested a level of caution and forethought that he'd failed to show when he dropped his phone in the car and left her access to his Willard Hodges emails. It wasn't Gareth. It was someone else. She felt an intense flood of relief that she and the girls weren't unsafe in the house with Gareth, that she did know him, that her ex-husband was still the same man she'd left behind, for better or worse. She looked at Travis and, not for the first time, felt drawn to him. It was like, even after a short time together, they understood each other without having to say a word. Travis didn't think Gareth had sent the email either. But there was still the question of why the message had been sent to Stelzik in the first place. If we're to assume Hain and Lima had access to your emails and phone activity, Travis said, I think it's fair to assume they had access to Gareth's as well, including the email address he was using for his affair. My guess, though, we'll have to wait on confirmation of this, is that they sent that email to muddy the waters. In a way, it's clever because it's a type of lead that looks big, that will have you wasting days and weeks trying to chase it down, and by the time you realize it's a dead end, you've given them the time they needed to patch up leaks elsewhere. It's a tactic Haynes employed before. You remember I told you about that anonymous call I got telling me to look at your brother again? Rebecca said she did, but she was more drawn to something in Travis's face, a kind of sadness that had lodged there after he'd mentioned the anonymous caller. She lowered her head slightly. Are you okay, Frank? Yeah, he said, rubbing his chin. I just got a question I need to figure out, and I don't know if I really want the answer. We can talk about it, if you like. Thanks, kiddo, he replied and smiled at her. Maybe later. She nodded, not wanting to press him, but it was clear that it was to do with the anonymous call. Eventually, they circled back to Bowner's. She's running with the idea that Foley murdered Louise the night of the fundraiser, he told her, after she'd made them both some fresh coffee. Or at least shortly afterwards. It seems unlikely, given everything we know about him, that it was a deliberate, premeditated act. If he was that kind of killer, if it was in his makeup, I suspect you wouldn't have walked away from him alive the morning after you... Travis trailed off. It was clear he knew how much it hurt Rebecca to recall what she'd done with Foley. Anyway, that type of guy, single, attractive, successful, is very likely he had his fair share of women, maybe even believed he was irresistible to them. That would certainly explain Louise. She was going out with Johnny, and she didn't sleep around, but she was friendly, personable, and she was beautiful. Maybe Foley read the signals wrong. Maybe he tried to force something that wasn't there. Maybe she didn't like it, and then... Rebecca could fill in the rest. But something didn't make sense. Thing is, Rebecca said, he did try to kill me. Or at least Lima did, presumably under the instructions of Hain and Foley. Maybe Foley wasn't a killer, but he wanted me dead. Travis nodded. So why did I have to die? Because I slept with the guy? He flipped back in his notebook. We found out that your friend Kirsty went to the same high school as Foley. They weren't there at the same time because she was 15 years younger than him, but he was part of some alumni tutoring program and spent time there working with students. She got to know him originally through that, and then I'm told Kirsty and her husband became big socialites up and down the East Coast, and it just happened that they started to move in the same circles as Foley. He looked up at Rebecca. She could see what he'd left unsaid. That explains how you came to have sex with him. In a way, Travis went on, Kirsty's kind of central to all of this, although unwittingly. She'd got to know Louise through the One Life Second Chance Foundation. Louise was a patron and Kirsty was on the board. She knew you through college and knew Foley through being at the same kinds of social functions down the years, and it was inevitable that she, Louise, and Foley would all end up at the fundraiser together, as Retrogram is a big contributor to the foundation. The only person who wasn't there that night was Johnny. He paused, and Rebecca imagined they were both playing the same film in their heads. Noella not calling Johnny from the hospital, Johnny not having to leave Louise at the fundraiser, and then Foley not being able to get Louise alone. Anyway, 
Travis continued, rewind 12 days from the fundraiser to Saturday, September 11th, and Kirsty comes back to New York for the weekend. You and your college pals go out and end up at the Z Club. You said Kirsty suggested going there, and she confirmed as much to Bowners. She knows the owner of the club through some other charity thing. So that's why she and you were there. And the reason Foley was there was because the Z also happens to be close to the retrogram offices, so it's a regular hangout for their staff. Kirsty knows Foley, she introduces you both, then he faded out again. It still didn't answer her original question, though. Why would Hain and Lima try to murder her just because she'd slept with Daniel Foley? Travis was already talking again. Maybe Foley offered to give Louise a ride home, came on to her, things got out of hand, and he stopped. This was the culmination of a half-year search. These were the answers he'd always sought, and yet a part of him didn't want to face them. That theory would fit the end game. Six months after he kills Louise, the same day he finds out you're still alive, the guilt, the potential repercussions, it all gets too much for Foley, so he heads to the George Washington Bridge and jumps. In the living room, Kyra shouted a number in Spanish. Yeah, but still, why did he try and have me killed, Frank? Travis glanced at his notebook with a pained expression. Hain and Lima were watching you. They were reading your emails and listening to your calls. It looks like the whole surveillance thing was a result of a conversation that Hain must have had with Foley after Louise died, maybe asking Foley if there were any other women in his past who might cause him trouble. And he said, me? Correct. Why would I cause him trouble? She felt like she was stuck on repeat. Travis let out an anguished sigh. That's what I was getting to, he said. I don't think they were worried about Foley himself being compromised. They were worried about how Foley's actions, the murder of Louise, his sleeping around, then the night with you, compromised the next rung of the ladder. Rebecca frowned. The next rung of the ladder? Travis nodded. You mean the person above Foley? Right, he said. The person Hain really works for. A message. Two days before getting the ferry out to Crow Island, Travis had to go back to Police Plaza for a meeting with Amy Hauser about the cold cases she'd given him. He'd found it hard to concentrate on anything except Louise Mason and the Murphys since watching the surveillance video from Montauk Harbor. But over the course of six days, he tried to make some headway on Hauser's cases. When he arrived, she was already waiting in the foyer. How you doing, Trav? All good, Lieutenant Hauser, he said, although that wasn't the truth. He was feeling unnerved. He hadn't slept properly for almost a week and could see the missed hours in his face. You look tired, Hauser said. You been up working these all night? You know me, Ames. No half measures. She took him to a meeting room where they went through the files one by one. At the end, they decided that there were two with the potential for re-examination. Afterwards, Hauser led Travis back to the cold case squad. Captain Walker looked up as they entered. She was in a small office in the corner, the blinds up so she could see all the way across the floor. As soon as she spotted Travis, she got up from her desk and wandered over to him. Mr. Travis, she said. He noted the use of Mr., not detective, even though it was technically correct. He wouldn't have minded but she made it sound like a put-down. Captain, he replied. Walker just stood there as Hauser started going through the drawers of the filing cabinets, pulling out new folders for Travis to work on. Walker was making him uncomfortable, but either didn't know it or didn't care. When he glanced at her, he thought she looked stressed too. Her hair, a striking red, had begun escaping from a bun. Her skin was sallow. What part of England are you from? Travis asked. She frowned. 
it was possible she wasn't capable of polite conversation. More likely, she was wondering what she lost by telling him. She struck him as the type of person who didn't like to share details of her private life, which was part of the reason that Travis did it. For some reason, the mister had annoyed him, as well as her standing there and watching him, as if he were unwelcome and untrustworthy and had to be monitored. I'm not, she said eventually. Oh, I thought someone said you were English. Well, whoever told you that was wrong. Hauser slammed one of the cabinets closed and brought back a bunch more files. Just as she put them on her desk, Walker said, Well, it was good to see you again, Mr. Travis. I'll catch up with Amy later and see what you've brought us. She framed that last part like an insult, headed back to her office, closed the door, and dropped the blinds. I didn't know human beings could maintain a body temperature of absolute zero. Travis muttered to Hauser, who burst out laughing. They both looked to the office again, just in case Walker was watching. I'll admit, Hauser said, she takes a while to warm up. So do glaciers. Hauser tapped the files. I've got a couple more to add to this pile, she said but one of the detectives down on major crimes worked both of them back in the day. So I asked him to take a quick look at the paperwork for me yesterday, kind of a refresh-the-memory thing, to see if he recalled anything that didn't make it onto the page. It's a long shot, but you never know. If you wait here, I'll just go grab the cases. Sure. Hauser headed off to the elevators again. As he waited for her, Travis brought the stack of files towards him, and started leafing through the one on the top. It was a murder from March 1999. A cab driver, shot and killed inside his taxi at 5 a.m. as he waited under the elevated tracks on Brighton Beach Avenue. The more pages he turned, though, the more his thoughts began to drift. And pretty soon, all Travis could think about was the ferry in two days' time. What he'd seen on the security cameras and what he was likely to find when he got to the island. What if it was just more questions? The phone on Hauser's desk started ringing. It was external. He glanced at it, presuming that one of the other members of the squad would pick up. But when it still went unanswered, he looked out and saw that they were all on calls themselves. He picked up. Cold case squad. Is Hauser around? A male voice. She's not at her desk at the moment. Can I take a message? Who's this? Uh, my name's Frank Travis. There was a long pause. Travis couldn't hear anything on the line at all. No hint of background noise. No people. No traffic. Nothing. Then the man spoke again. Travis? He frowned. His name had been said in a way that made it sound like the caller might know him. Travis tried to work out if he'd heard the man's voice before somewhere. Yeah, that's me, he said. I'm Travis. Who's this? The line went dead. It was only a split second later, as he took the phone away from his ear and stared at the handset, that a prickle of dread crawled across his scalp. Travis did know him. He had heard the voice. It was the same man who'd called his line the previous December in the last days of Travis's search for Louise Mason. It was the man who'd left the tip about taking a second look at Johnny Murphy. And as he realized that, Travis realized something else. The common factor that connected both of the calls. The person who'd taken the message in December. The person whose phone had rung now. Amy Hauser Chapter 72 There's someone else involved in this. Travis nodded. Someone with much more to lose. He paused, a flutter in his face like a shadow shifting. Foley's crime had the potential to expose this person to compromise them, perhaps professionally, and so did the night you spent with Foley. 
We know why Foley killing Louise would be a problem for this person. A murder is a problem for anyone with something to lose. We just have to figure out why you were such a danger as well. We have to figure out if any other women Foley slept with were targeted in the same way as you. I mean, Foley wasn't married. He had no girlfriend that we know about, so it shouldn't have mattered who he shared a bed with. But it did. It mattered so much that Lima tried to kill you. So there's really three questions here. Why does it matter who Daniel Foley slept with? What makes those women dangerous to the person Hain works for? And who is the person he works for? Again, there was something in Travis's face, a kind of residual pain laced to the end of that last question. And this time it was so much like looking at her father at the expression of grief he'd held in the weeks after Mike died that Rebecca could read Travis like a book. She leaned across the table slightly closer to him and said, Frank, do you know who this person is? He looked up at her and a smile twitched at the corner of his lips. Cops I used to work with, they called me the Sphinx in interviews because I was so good at not showing emotion. Not anymore, I guess. So you do know who this person is? I have a suspicion. Who? His face creased into a grimace. Would you mind if I didn't talk about that for now? I know it's a deeply unsatisfying answer, but I need to make sure that I'm right before I start throwing accusations around. He glanced through the door into the living room, watching the girls. If I'm right about this, though, well, it'll break my heart. Rebecca tried to work out who Travis might be talking about. Someone he knew? Someone he'd worked with? Could it be a cop? Eventually, he pulled his notebook towards him and, turning a couple of pages, slowly began to gather pace again. On Foley's Facebook page, someone on Bowner's team found a photograph of him with some pals at a restaurant. There's a guy in the background. They think it might be Hain. Travis reached into the breast pocket of his shirt. It was a printout of a photo. Foley was in the foreground, along with five men and three women. There were even more faces behind them, including one obscured slightly by the darkness of the restaurant. He'd been circled in red pen. It's not clear if he's there with the group, Travis said, tapping a finger to the face of the man, or whether he just happened to be in the shot, but he doesn't seem to be keen on having his photograph taken either way. That would be exactly the type of behavior you'd expect from a man who uses an alias, even when he thinks he's alone. Bowness has her team calling all of the people in the picture here to see if any of them can ID Hain. That definitely looks like him, Rebecca said quietly, remembering the man on the island, his face feel of his hands on her throat. I think so too, said Travis. The only difference was that both times she'd seen him in the flesh, Hain had had a shaved head and no facial hair. In the picture with Foley, he had the beginnings of a beard and a thick mop of hair. I strongly suspect that Foley and Hain knew each other, Travis said. Otherwise, this picture is the most outrageous coincidence in the history of policing, and if we're to assume that Hain is the type of guy you bring in to clear up a mess, it's likely he helped Foley make things go away after Louise was murdered. As for you and Johnny, I think it's a pretty safe bet now to suggest that you were the primary objective. They decided to target Johnny simply because you and he were together on the island that day, and maybe also because he'd been around Louise on the night she was killed, had spoken to her, texted her. He was a link to her. To put it crudely, it was a kind of two for one. If Johnny was going to be somewhere remote like Crow Island, and especially if you two were going to be there together, it was too good a chance to turn down. If you hadn't gone together, he stopped. Things might have turned out differently. You're saying I got Johnny killed. That's not what I'm saying. If I hadn't gone with him. No, Travis said more forcefully than Rebecca was expecting. None of this is your fault. How could you possibly have known? He eyed her, making sure she wasn't going to break on him, then very slowly picked up where he'd left off. 
Hain is the type of guy who liked to plan. He wants things running like clockwork. What happened with Louise was the opposite. And when things get disordered like that, you start to feel the pressure. That's why he rushed into the Crow Island plan to kill you. It's why he made that anonymous call to me about Johnny. It's why I believe he sent that email from Garrett's account to Stelzik. With no pressure, you can see what desperate ideas those are. With pressure, even smart thinkers like Hain screw up. Whatever his reasons for not being there personally the day Lima tried to kill you, whatever his reasons for not doing it himself, as soon as Lima messed up, Hain was in panic mode. His eyes went to the Facebook photo. Sadly, Lima had no known associates with the name Hain. Maybe we'll have more luck with these people. From the next room, Kyra began singing I'm the Map from Dora, then tried to get a reluctant Roxy to dance with her. Rebecca watched Travis as he gazed at the girls. There was a distance to his expression that Rebecca had never seen before, as if he was recalling something from his past, something that had shaken loose on hearing Kyra. In that moment, Rebecca realized she'd never asked Travis if he had kids of his own, but it seemed impossible that he didn't. The more she looked at him, the more she recognized the expression flowering on his face. He was caught in a memory, a flicker from history where his own kids were this age. Are you all right, Frank? He snapped out of the moment. I'm good, kiddo. He seemed to understand what had sparked the question. It's just nice listening to them in there, that's all. Anyway, maybe I should be asking you that question. Rebecca shrugged. Johnny might still be here if I'd let him go to that island alone. You can't think like that, Rebecca. I know he's not alive, she said quietly, and forced a smile, sad, painful. I do know that. I accepted it months ago. She blinked, didn't want to break down again. We'll find Johnny, Travis said, pushing his coffee cup aside, reaching across the table so that his hands were almost touching hers. One way or another, I promise we'll bring your brother home. Chapter 73 After the girls had gone to bed, Rebecca and Gareth ate together. He'd been living in the house for almost the entire time she was on the island, and now he didn't have any other place to go other than a hotel. He hadn't offered to move out, and she hadn't pushed it. He just shifted his things into the spare room. He had been good to her since she'd got back, thoughtful, attentive, which had made it much easier. She didn't know if that had resulted from him spending such a long time believing she was dead, or if a new job and new hours had given him a different perspective on home and family life, or if all of it was some sort of act, a performance that would eventually wear off. Rebecca hoped it wasn't the latter, and didn't want to think about it too hard for now, even if it was, so she embraced every small moment as it arrived, small moments like eating linguine together. She hadn't told him a lot of what had happened to her, in fact, she hadn't even mentioned Foley's name, let alone the night they'd spent together. She'd tried to confess when they were alone the previous evening. Gareth had seemed more considered and willing to listen, but the words had stuck in her throat. Afterwards, she'd felt like a coward. But then, once dinner was over and Gareth had washed the plates, he came through to the living room, to where Rebecca was sitting and reading, and said, There's something I need to talk to you about. He sat down opposite her, a look on his face she couldn't place. Was he nervous? What's going on? She asked, putting down the book. This is really difficult. She eyed him. You've got to understand, Beck, I thought you were dead. I thought you were never coming back. He pushed his lips together. And before that, before you even went to the island, you and me... We were separated and had been for months. And I know it was my fault, I know that, but I, I just, I, I, he was staring at his feet. I don't know what your expectations are. My expectations for the two of us, 
she frowned. You'd better spell it out, Gareth. But she knew what was coming, and then she realised that when he'd heard from her out of the blue for the first time in five months, when she told him she was still alive, the hesitation she'd heard in his voice wasn't entirely down to the fact that he told the girls Rebecca was dead. There was another reason. I've met someone, he said. Before they'd even had a chance to talk about it, Bowners arrived at the house. Gareth, in a more familiar echo of the man Rebecca had known before the split, saw the opportunity to avoid a difficult conversation and offered to give them space, near sprinting out of the door. Bowners must have believed it was a selfless act, because she turned to Rebecca and said, You really didn't need to leave on my account. But Rebecca looked at her and said nothing, and it seemed obvious that Bowners saw the embers of unfinished business. I'd offered to do this in the morning she added, but I've got to drive back to Long Island tonight. It's fine, Rebecca said, forcing a smile. Being stuck in the house is starting to get to me, that's all. It wasn't the real explanation for the way she looked, but it wasn't untrue. She hadn't left the house in almost two days. She didn't want to be away from the girls, but being trapped inside felt unnatural and oppressive. In a weird way, there were moments when it felt worse than being on the island, because at least then she'd had the freedom of the car. I know it's tough, Bowners offered. No, you don't, Rebecca thought cynically, then pushed aside the animosity. It wasn't Bowners' fault. Until Hain was caught, all she was doing was trying to protect them all. Any news on Hain? she asked. Not at the moment. Do you even know who he actually is yet? No, not yet, but we're making progress. Her reassurances were starting to carry less weight. Rebecca had been back nearly 48 hours, but didn't feel any safer. If anything, she felt less relaxed than ever. It didn't matter that she had cops outside her home, or that, thanks to blurry Facebook photos of Hain, the net might be closing. Hain still hadn't been captured. He hadn't even been ID'd. They went through to the kitchen, and while Rebecca filled the kettle, Bowners checked in with the patrol officer on the back porch. She'd already done the same with the one out front. There were six officers in total, working eight-hour shifts in pairs, and the next changeover was in fifteen minutes at ten p.m., when Rebecca's favourite, Henricks, a silver-haired officer in his fifties, arrived. He had the calm reassurance she'd needed on her return to the city. The officers had a key to the basement, which had access doors at the front and back of the house, so whenever they turned up, they'd use the doors to move from one side of the brownstone to the other. I won't take up much of your time, Bowness said, and came back into the kitchen, closing the door. There's just a few things I need to run by you. Rebecca finished making them some tea. Bowness continued. I saw Frank this afternoon. We got talking about the case and then about a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay. He was telling me about this nightmare you get. Rebecca sat down, failing to keep the surprise out of her face. She told Frank about it on the drive back from Montauk, the sheer terror she felt every time it returned. She described everything, from the tan carpets and cream walls to the way Roxy had begun to infect the dream more recently. She told him about the way the seven of the one two seven on the apartment door was always askew, and how she'd always think seven is meant to be a lucky number. And finally, she told him about the inside of the apartment, the way music would start playing and her feet would sink into the carpet. She told Travis about how she'd be pinned to the spot, as someone behind her, a voice neither male nor female, said to her, I think you should stay, Rebecca. She shivered as she replayed it. Why are you asking me about a dream? Bowners opened a folder that she'd brought with her. Inside were some photographs. She started to spread them across the table, and it took a second for Rebecca to register what they were of, and then, as she did, it was like someone had grabbed her by the throat. Because I don't think it's a dream, Bowners said. Rebecca couldn't breathe. She felt paralyzed. I think it's a memory. 
Chapter 74 Bowners spread out the pictures. The mezzanine level where an office had been set up, the blackened chrome kitchen, the living room with its widescreen view of the city, and then the bedroom, bed, nightstands, walk-in wardrobes, and a shower room. The fine detail had never made it into her dream, a nightmare, but she knew it was the same place, that Bowners was right. This was the apartment that had haunted her. Where is it? Rebecca asked, her voice unsteady. It belongs to the social media company Retrogram, Bowners said. Retrogram, the company Daniel Foley had worked for. Rebecca swallowed her nausea. It's a penthouse apartment they own on Columbus Circle, overlooking Central Park. They clear it for events. When it's not being utilized for that, staff are allowed to book it for one night stays at a subsidized rate. Daniel Foley worked at the company for a long time. What you might not know is that for a three-year period until December last year, he owned an apartment on the 11th floor of the same building, the next one down from this one. This was 127, his was 118. She stopped again, waiting for Rebecca to put it all together. She already had. The morning after you two had sex, Bowness said, not sugarcoating it like Frank Travis had, we believe you woke up in his actual apartment, but the night before, after you left the nightclub, he brought you back to this place. She pointed at the photos of 127. I think you should stay, Rebecca. Why would he do that? Rebecca said. She glanced up from the pictures and this time caught Bowners looking at her differently. Why did he switch apartments midway through the evening? Bowners responded, her neutrality replaced by something less poised. It's speculation at this point, but we think it might have had something to do with the retrogram apartment having a private elevator. It meant he could get up to the top floor without anyone seeing you together. Why would he care if we were seen together? Bowners held up a finger. I'm just getting to that. Rebecca's eyes returned to the pictures of apartment 127. Her dream memory didn't do it justice. The views were incredible. The decor immaculate, the walls of the living room and the bedroom decorated with big retrogram-themed oil paintings that looked like Jackson Pollock's. Shit, she said quietly. I remember being drunk, but how the hell don't I remember him moving me? I need to tell you something else, Bowness said. The tone of her voice was frightening. What is it? Rebecca asked, but she wasn't even certain she wanted the answer now. Bowner's eyes went to the pictures. It's about the night you spent with Foley. What about it? You said you had a hard time recalling any of it. I was drunk, Rebecca said, rattled, scared, but enough to experience a blackout like you had? She stared at Bowner's. It took a second for the implication to land, and then Rebecca felt like she was falling through the floor. No, she muttered, no way, no, no. Oh, please, God, no. She felt like she needed to puke. Do you normally lose time when you drink? No, never, never in my life. Except for the night I met Foley. You're saying that asshole drugged me. The entire room was dropping away. We can't prove it definitively now, Hannah said, trying her best to sound comforting, but we've been speaking to some friends of Foley's via a Facebook post he made. One said he'd been drunk once and started telling them he'd gotten hold of some roaches. Fuck. Rehypnol. I'm sure you know they're illegal in the States, but not down in Mexico, so it means they're coming across the border all the time. Bowness faded. None of that mattered. I'm really sorry. After all, you've... So he raped me. Silence. That's what you're telling me, right? That piece of shit roofied me and raped me. The word was so abnormal, so malignant. It was hard even to form. We can't say for sure after this time, but he did, didn't he? Pounders swallowed. But Rebecca could see the answer. 
And now, finally, they had the reason. Not just about why Foley had switched apartments midway through the night. He'd presumably done that because he didn't want her to recall what had happened in 127. It was an insurance policy in case snatches of information came back to her. If she woke up in his actual bed, it would be in an apartment that bore no resemblance to the one she'd been attacked in, so any memories she had of the assault wouldn't align. It was why he'd felt so comfortable being so honest with her the next morning, even going so far as to give her his actual name. Did that mean a part of him liked her? Was that why he'd appeared to be so kind? Was it his messed up way of apologising to her? Was it all just an act? part of his routine, his M.O. She didn't know, but it had worked. She'd thought apartment 127 was just a place conjured in her head, and she'd left his apartment liking him, despite herself. But that was only part of the explanation, only part of the story, because now they had the reason why Rebecca was targeted, why Hain and whoever he worked for wanted her dead. Daniel Foley didn't just sleep with women. He raped them. Out of Hand The next morning, Travis was invited to a meeting at one police plaza at the request of Bowners. The meeting started at 11.30 a.m. and was still going two hours later. He sat in a conference room with people he barely knew as Bowners, on a video feed from Suffolk County Police HQ, described what she and Travis had talked about the day before. The dream. As soon as they'd realized that Rebecca's dream was a memory, that Daniel Foley wasn't some harmless ladies' man but a rapist, potentially many times over, Travis had floated the idea to Bowners that maybe he should be the one to tell Rebecca. They had established a relationship. It felt to Travis like she trusted him. And it wasn't arrogant to suggest that it might be better coming from him. But Bowners had shut him down, perhaps understandably. He wasn't a cop anymore. At best, he was a consultant. At worst, just a civilian. So Bowners had gone to the house last night, and on the way back to Long Island, she'd called Travis and told him how it had gone. She's in shock, as you might expect. She's angry, confused. I'll give her a call. No, Bowners had said. Hold off for now. It's important we don't overload her. I've spoken to someone on the CVAP team, and she's going to call Rebecca tonight, then go to the house in the morning. The Crime Victim Assistance Program. It was the right thing to do. The correct procedure. And if Travis was still a cop, he would have done exactly the same thing. Even so, he still wanted desperately to talk to Rebecca. He couldn't make any of this better, but he wanted her to know he was around. One of the theories we're running with at the moment, Bowners was saying, her voice bringing him back to the insipidity of the conference room, is that Daniel Foley either didn't give Louise enough of the Rohypnol the night he killed her, or she came around much quicker than he'd expected. Travis looked at the faces surrounding him. Some were making notes, some just staring at the image of Bowners on the screen. He turned further in his chair and looked out at the floor. There was no one he knew out there either. Anyone he knew in this building was on the level below, although, as he thought of Amy Hauser, of his suspicions about her, he realized that might not be true anymore. After that, Bowners was saying, things got out of hand. Out of hand. Three words so insufficient, so utterly inadequate in summing up what had happened to Louise Mason the night she was killed, they were as worthless as no words at all. And even if it had gotten out of hand at the fundraiser, it hadn't gotten out of hand the night Foley raped Rebecca. His actions weren't an accident. They were done lucidly, deliberately, and with premeditation. Travis tuned out the rest of the meeting. And then he started to think about Amy again. Was she involved in all of this? Did he know her at all? Could he trust her? 
At 2 p.m., the meeting finished. Travis took the elevator down to the cold case squad, and as he came down, he almost collided with Captain Walker. Mr. Travis, she said. Mr. again, Travis thought. Captain, he responded. Are you here to see Amy? Travis glanced across the floor and saw Hauser at her desk, hunched over a keyboard. I am, he said, stepping past Walker. Look, um, Frank, I apologize if I was a little short with you the other day. Travis stopped as she ground to a halt again. It was obvious that apologies didn't come easily to her. When you asked about my accent, forget it. It's been a stressful initiation. Honestly, he said, it doesn't matter. She nodded her thanks. New Zealand. Travis frowned. Pardon me? I was born in New Zealand, not England, and moved here with my family when I was eight. Some words still slip through, I guess, although I can't hear them myself anymore. They talked politely for a while longer. Then Travis headed across the floor to Hauser while Walker returned to her office. How you doing, Ames? Hauser startled at the sound of his voice. Trav! She snapped close a file on her desk. Did we have a meeting today? No, I was upstairs on that other thing. Oh, she nodded. Right, the woman on the island. Rebecca. Hauser nodded again. Rebecca, right. They looked at each other for a moment. You okay? Travis asked. I'm good, she said, breaking into a smile. Sorry. You just caught me at a bad time. I had my head in a million different things. She looked at the desk again, and Travis wondered if she was checking to see what she'd left out. His eyes followed hers, pinging between various pieces of paperwork. Nothing immediately registered with him, except perhaps for the file she'd closed. She looked at her watch. You want to take a walk? A walk? He frowned. Around the office? She smiled. No, I thought we could grab a coffee. He looked at her desk again, at the file she'd closed. You're not too busy? She glanced at her watch once more, then stood, sliding the file under another and putting both into the top drawer of her desk. No, she said. I can always make time for you. Chapter 75 The CVAP advocate was called Cassandra, and she sat with Rebecca for an hour as the kids played in the next room. Whenever one wandered through, the conversation would freeze, and the two women would chat to the girls as if everything was perfectly normal. Then, after they returned to their toys, things would start up again, and Rebecca would have to go back to that night. After Cassandra left, it felt like a part of Rebecca had been torn away. She watched the girls through the living room door, the joy in them, the pristine innocence, and rubbed her eyes, expecting to find tears. But there were none. She hadn't cried since Bowness had told her the truth about that night with Daniel Foley. All she felt was hollow, as if a chasm had been carved inside her, a void she would never be able to fill. Her eyes fell on a shelf next to the window. At the end was a snow globe. She hauled herself out of the chair and went to it, picking it up and looking through the glass to the runner inside. A few snowflakes roused. She thought of Johnny, of the day he'd brought it to her, could still see his face as he handed it over. She remembered how he'd told her that the streak of grey under the runner's feet and the patches of green either side were meant to represent Central Park. But the grey strip and the finite boundaries of the glass made Rebecca think of somewhere else instead. The loop, being trapped on Crow Island. She shook the globe and set it back on the shelf, and as she watched the runner vanish in a tiny white tempest, she thought of her brother again. I miss you so much, Johnny. 
please come home to me. Frank Travis didn't turn up at the house that day. Since her return home, the hours had been long and lonely, even though she had the girls. Noella had popped by two or three times, but both she and Gareth had to go to work, and the cops actively discouraged visitation from anyone outside Rebecca's inner circle, or what was left of it, to lower the risk to her. So she'd begun to look forward to the times when Travis came by, not only for the adult company, but because she genuinely liked him. He had a calmness that reminded her of her dad and brought her closer to the memory of him. When Travis was around, it was easy to forget that her entire life had been turned inside out. She tried calling him on his cell phone before lunch, but it just rang and went to voicemail. She left a message the second time, midway through the afternoon. I was just wondering if you were coming round today, she said, then paused, unsure what else to say. In the short time she'd known him, it was unusual for him not to pick up. He told her to call him any time. After dinner, she tried again, and when her cell actually did ring, it was Gareth telling her he was going to be late. Okay, she said simply. I've got this project I need to... It's fine, Gareth. They hadn't talked since his dinner table confession the night before, so he would assume it was about that, but it wasn't. She didn't necessarily blame him for moving on. She even thought a part of her had accepted it would happen before she ever left the island. But she didn't want to get into the practicalities of it now. It felt so utterly trivial. She hadn't spoken to Gareth yet about what Bowners had told her or about Daniel Foley, and both those things weighed on her far more heavily than what was left of her marriage. Noella phoned about thirty minutes later. Hey, Han, she said. I'm so sorry I haven't called today. Work has been a total frigging nightmare. Not that that's an excuse. But tomorrow's my day off, so I'm coming around first thing in the morning, and I'm staying all day. And you and me are going to talk, and we're eating all of this cake. Rebecca smiled. You got me a cake? I made you a cake. It might taste like shit. She was being self-deprecating. Noella was a legendarily good baker. Just put on a loose pair of sweatpants. At 10 p.m., she was dozing on the couch when her cell phone shattered the silence. She sat up, half asleep, and grabbed the phone off the table, trying to clear her head, hoping it might be Travis. But it was Henrik's, the older cop who worked the night shift and stood guard outside her back door. He was letting her know that he and his partner Sanchez had arrived outside. She got to her feet, wandered through to the kitchen, and opened the door to the yard. Henrik's was standing outside on the steps leading up to the porch with his phone to his ear. When he saw her, he hung up, slipped his cell into a pouch on his belt, and said, Evening, young lady, how are you doing? I'm good, she forced a smile. How are you, Jimmy? He told her everyone called him Jimmy because of his surname. All good, he said. You look tired. I am. Well, why don't you go get some beauty sleep? She thanked Henrik's and closed the door. Heading upstairs, she looked through the balustrade to where the girls were sleeping. It felt good to be close to something normal something perfect and uncorrupted. On the walls beside her, there was a cascade of photographs, still including shots of her and Gareth, but many more of the girls. There was the one of her dad, Johnny, Mike, and her in the diner, and then individual pictures of Rebecca's father, her brothers, her friends. At the top on the left was a shot from Rebecca's college days, a blurred, overexposed image of her and Kirsty. It had been taken on a night just like the one when she'd gone home with Daniel Foley. For a second, as she thought of the man who'd raped her, all she could hear was her own ragged breathing. But then, slowly, another noise faded in. A subtle, low hum. She'd never heard it in the house before. Chapter 76 Rebecca went downstairs and looked out of the living room windows at the block. An NYPD car was pulled into the curb at the bottom of the steps. It was the same one that Henriks and Sanchez had brought the previous night, 
It had a dent in the front fender on the driver's side. Sanchez normally stood guard out front. He wasn't as much fun as Henrik's, younger, more stoic, but it was clear he was serious about his job. In the two shifts he'd done already, Rebecca hadn't seen or heard him take as much as a bathroom break. But tonight, Sanchez was nowhere to be seen. As soon as she noticed that, she noticed something else. The door of the squad car was ajar. Why would they leave it open like that? Even in a low-crime neighbourhood, it was simply asking for trouble. Worse, it was careless, and neither Henrik's nor Sanchez was careless. Rebecca looked towards the kitchen, sliding her cell phone into the pocket of her pants. The noise she'd heard, the subtle hum, was getting louder. What was it? Roxy wandered into the living room, but Rebecca instantly grabbed her collar and dragged her out again into the spare bedroom downstairs. Just stay there, okay, Rox? She whispered, closing the door, looking across the living room again. Something was going on. She could feel it, instinctively. Jimmy? She walked to the entrance to the kitchen. The back door was also ajar. Through the gap, she couldn't see Henrik's or Sanchez, only darkness. But on the floor, just inside the door, was the source of the noise she'd heard. An NYPD smartphone. It was facing up, the screen blinking, the messages coming direct from the 911 operator. Every time an alert landed asking for officers in the area to respond to an emergency call, the phone would buzz against the floor of the kitchen, shifting a little. Rebecca looked from the phone to the porch. Jimmy? It was pitch black outside. Jimmy? She was six feet from the door next to the light switch for the backyard, fingers already reaching for it, when something gave her pause. Jimmy? Outside she could see a hint of grey in the dark now. Jimmy, is that you? A shape. A person. She reached forward and pushed the light switch, and that was when the shape moved. It grew bigger instantly, forming out of the gloom like an apparition, a second before light erupted across the porch. She'd been right. It was a person, but it wasn't Henrik's or Sanchez. She backed up, hitting the edge of the counter, stumbling into the table, her legs weak, her body shaking. The table shifted, tilting one of the chairs over. A coffee cup she'd been drinking from earlier rattled and came to rest. And then a moan escaped from Rebecca's throat. Slowly, Hain entered the kitchen. Chapter 77 Rebecca looked from Hain to the back door. The light revealed more than she would ever have chosen to see. Henrik's was lying on his front, his head visible in the gap between the door and its frame, his eyes open, an entry wound in his face. Next to him, slumped on the stairs of the porch, was Sanchez. Rebecca could see his eyes, too, the blood that had pooled under him forming a ruby lake. Rebecca thought of the squad car out front, its open door. Had Sanchez dropped everything to come through to the back? Had he heard a struggle, a gunshot? None of it mattered anymore. They were both dead. Haynes started coming around the table towards the door that led from the kitchen to the living room. He knew that if he blocked that, there was no way out for her. She could escape into the backyard, but she'd still have to go through the basement to get out onto the street, and he would easily cut her off through the front. Rebecca had told Bowners the night before that she was starting to feel trapped inside the house. Now she was. Four days' beard growth, thick enough and dark enough for it to have subtly altered the dimensions and appearance of his face, partly helped cover a plum-coloured bruise on Hain's left cheek. He had cuts all over, too. A dark beanie was pulled down, trying to cover some of them, and his gait appeared to be angled left because he was carrying an injury to his right leg from the car crash. On that side, in his hand, was a pistol, a tube attached to the end of it. Rebecca didn't know a lot about guns, but she knew what the tube was. A silencer. It was why she hadn't heard any gunshots. She felt the hairs on the back of her neck stand up, and then a harsh flutter at the base of her throat as her gaze switched to what was on his jacket. 
a blue and gold badge, an NYPD detective shield. You're a cop? Hain just looked at her. Except Hain wasn't even his real name. Bowners and her team had been looking in completely the wrong place for him. They'd been searching for felons, trawling databases for a man matching his description. Bowners said that Lima had done time in Rikers, and it stood to reason that Hain would come from somewhere similar, but he didn't. He wasn't a criminal, or at least not one who'd been caught. He was a man tasked with finding them. The rest saturated her like a flood. It was why he always disappeared into the background when photos were about to be taken. It was why the only pictures of him were dark or out of focus, or he was at the edges of them, impossible to identify. It was why he used an alias, even when he was on his own. Because as long as he remained that way, if anyone did come looking for him, as they had been for the last four days, trying to hunt him using the blurred photos he'd left in his wake, he had the perfect disguise to hide behind. The blue of the uniform, the gold of the badge. Rebecca thought of her girls asleep upstairs, oblivious to every day of Rebecca's last five months, then saw something else out of the corner of her eye. More movement on the porch, more grey in the shadows. Her blood froze. Another face formed out of the dark, like Haynes had a minute before. This time, a woman stopped in the doorway. Hello, Rebecca, she said. The Plan They were already walking away from Police Plaza, towards the Starbucks on Pearl Street, when Amy Hauser told Travis she'd forgotten her cell phone. I'll meet you there, she said, and didn't wait for his response. Travis stopped, watching her hurry back towards the ugly brown building, and then his eyes went from Hauser to the thirteenth floors of windows. He couldn't see into any of them but he wondered if someone inside was looking back. What have you got yourself into, Amy? He said quietly. A few minutes later, she made the call. He's arriving now, she said. Okay, Hain responded. You sure you got the guts to do this? There was no deference from him now. He still respected her, still owed her, but he was no longer a flunky she could push around. Clearing up Axel's mess had made certain of that. She needed him more than he needed her. I can handle it, she said. Travis entered Starbucks and stood at the end of the queue. There were five people ahead of him, and the place was packed. He looked up at the menu. Hauser would want a flat white with almond milk. And as he thought of that, as he thought of how well he knew Amy, or thought he did, how much he'd always liked her, a spear of pain bloomed under his ribs. He didn't want her to be involved in this. He didn't want her to be dirty. Just get him to the parking garage, Haynes said. The line drifted as he spoke, the wind crackling at his end, and she could hear traffic. He was on the move, heading towards her car as planned. She went over it again. She was going to have to persuade Travis to go with her, get him to believe there was something she needed to show him in the trunk. She'd have to pretend it was to do with Louise Mason or Rebecca Murphy. Whether he would trust her was another thing entirely. He was on high alert, she could tell. Are you there? Haynes said. Did you hear what I said? She'd almost forgotten about him. Of course I heard, she said, trying to reassert some measure of control. I'll do my part. You make sure you do yours. She hung up and looked at Travis. He hadn't seen her when he came in. She was partially hidden on one of the stools, her back to him, watching his reflection in the window. She walked over and joined the queue behind him. He still didn't notice her. She wondered what he was thinking about. Maybe Louise? Maybe Rebecca? Maybe Amy Hauser?
Travis didn't know she was there until she said hello. When he turned, she was already smiling at him. It was warm today, but while Travis felt a little flushed after the walk in the sunshine, she looked immaculate in a navy blue pantsuit and white blouse. Her hair, a striking silver blonde, was tied in a ponytail, and it showed off the angles of her face. He looked at that smile again. People always said she didn't smile much, but she always seemed to smile at Travis. I didn't see you there, Chief, Travis said. Chief of Detectives Catherine McKenzie smiled again. Oh, I think you can drop the Chief if we're in Starbucks, Frank. Chapter 78 She came further in, looking around the kitchen. She was tall, elegant, dressed in a black coat that fell all the way to mid-calf. Her silver blonde hair was clipped away from her face. She wore a dusting of makeup, and her nails were painted blue. She used one to tap out a soft rhythm against the edge of the sink as she passed it. At the kitchen table, she stopped and pulled out a chair, then gestured to the seat next to her. Rebecca didn't move. We've never met, the woman said. I'm Catherine McKenzie. As they looked at each other, Rebecca vaguely recognized her. But from where? Why don't you sit down, Mackenzie said, but again, Rebecca didn't. Instead, she thought, could I scream? Were the neighbors here? Were they even in? You've got a look on your face that tells me two things, Mackenzie continued. One, you can't quite place me, and two, you're thinking about doing something stupid. So, look, here's the deal. Sit down, and as long as you don't do that something stupid, we can discuss where Johnny is. Rebecca's eyes narrowed. Was she playing her? You know where my brother is? From his position on Rebecca's right, Hain flicked the switch from the outside lights, returning the yard to darkness. As he did, Mackenzie sat down, unbuttoning her coat, revealing a black dress with a blue trim. Truthfully, I don't know exactly where your brother is, she nodded at Hain, but he does. And what, he's just going to lead me there? Neither of them answered. Hain wasn't going to lead her anywhere. He'd come here to kill her. Rebecca glanced furtively to either side of her, searching for anything she could use as a weapon. But even if she found something, what did she have in her home that could compete with a gun? The recognition thing, Mackenzie said. That'll be because you probably saw me in a newspaper or on the evening news talking about police work. And that was when Rebecca put it together. Mackenzie was a cop too, but much higher up the chain. She remembered seeing her photo. As if she'd second-guessed her, Mackenzie said, I'm chief of detectives. They were all in on this. Every level. Why are you doing this? Rebecca asked. Her voice betrayed her. This is a nice place, Mackenzie replied, looking around the kitchen as if the question hadn't even registered. Me and Axel, Daniel, I guess you knew him as, we shared an apartment back in our twenties that was about the size of this entire kitchen. Foley had been this woman's partner. Another missing piece snapped into place. I remember the first thing Axel did was buy himself this big leather recliner. Mackenzie continued, forcing a smile that was flat and inexpressive. He could be a selfish prick like that, but I loved him, and back then... I either didn't notice or I just willfully ignored the warning signs. Her eyes came back to Rebecca. The warning signs. Believe it or not, she said, Axel had a comic sense of timing. No, he didn't. Your boyfriend was a rapist. He wasn't my boyfriend, sweetheart, Mackenzie responded. You think I'd be doing all this for a guy I was sleeping with? If it was as simple as that, I'd have just got him, she waved a hand at Hayne, to pull the trigger on Axel the night Louise Mason died. There's no boyfriend, no husband worth this. Rebecca frowned. Then who was he to you? Let me tell you about some of the people I work with first. They think I'm a lesbian. 
They call me the dyke behind my back. They do it for two reasons. One is that it's a defense mechanism among a certain category of male officer who can't accept that women aren't barefoot and pregnant at home. They think lesbian will hurt me or degrade me in some way. I mean, that's the caliber of some of the morons I'm dealing with in that place. She looked around the kitchen again, and her gaze stopped on the shelf next to the window. She was looking at Johnny's snow globe. For a moment, as absurd as the idea was, it was like she knew how important it was to Rebecca. The other reason that people think I'm a lesbian, she said, is because they know nothing about my private life. They see me hiring women and don't see me with men. The reason I hire women is because I trust them more, and the reason people don't know anything about my private life is down to Axel. She ripped her eyes away from the snow globe. Mackenzie's shoulders rose as she sucked in a long, protracted breath. You were right about the rapist part. He was very definitely that. But it didn't stop him having this almost comical ability to ruin things. Take Louise Mason. I only got promoted to chief of detectives just under a year ago, so when she died, I'd had my feet under the desk for five months. Five months and twenty years of trying to get there because I was unlucky enough to be born with a pair of tits. When Louise died, I'd finally started building the team around me that I wanted. I got rid of all the assholes, the misogynists, the racists, the pieces of shit eating away at the department like a cancer. So, you know what? I turned up at that fundraiser pretty pleased with how things were going. And do you know what Axel was doing at the same time as I was arriving at the party? Mackenzie traced a painted nail along a fine gouge in the kitchen table. He was smashing Louise Mason's skull to a pulp. Her words were like an earthquake. It was the first time anyone had admitted the truth. The first time that someone who knew Daniel Foley had confirmed it. Mackenzie seemed to realize as much. You may as well know how we got to this point, she said, the rest of her sentence hanging there between them, unstated but understood. Because when we leave here, you'll be dead. So, no, she continued. Axel wasn't my boyfriend. You can always replace the man you're having sex with. She looked up from the table. But family, she sighed. You and I both know that's different. Family. You got family, Frank? They were still waiting in a queue for coffee. Travis looked out of the window, wondering where Amy Hauser had got to, and then he turned his attention back to Catherine Mackenzie. He smiled at her, thought again how attractive she was when she did the same, and said, Yeah, I got two kids. A son and a daughter. Mark, he lives out in L.A. and does something I don't fully understand with video games. Gabby's in her final year at Midwestern. Chicago? Correct. That's nice. Mackenzie said. You see them much? He shrugged. Not as much as I'd like. Doesn't help that you're working your ass off at the NYPD, even when you're supposed to be retired. How's all that Rebecca Murphy stuff going? Getting there, I think. It's pretty complicated. Mackenzie nodded. The cue still didn't move. What about you? Travis said. Have you got kids? No, she said. I missed the boat on that. Travis didn't know how to respond. Would have been nice, she added as if she thought she'd made him uncomfortable. I just never found the right man. Her eyes stayed on him, flashed briefly in the light from the window, and Travis felt a momentary buzz. It had been so long since he'd found any woman attractive, and they'd appeared to find him attractive in return, that he didn't know what to do. And then, for some reason, he thought about Naomi. All the things she'd said to him over the years. And that was when gravity started to pull at him. Mackenzie was chief of detectives. She was probably ten years younger than he was. She was good-looking and industrious. He was old and directionless. 
Why would she ever be interested in someone like him? Mackenzie started talking about being married to the job and maybe sometimes regretting it, and then Travis mentioned Naomi and how it was hard to strike a balance. Eventually, at the front of the queue, Travis offered to pay for Mackenzie's drink, but she refused and said his black coffee was the least the NYPD owed him after all he'd done. When they were waiting at the end of the counter, she smiled at him again and said, You're easy to talk to, Frank, you know that? Are you serious? She seemed surprised by the comeback. Of course I'm serious. Haven't you heard the rumors? The dyke is physically incapable of opening up? Travis grimaced. Don't worry, she said. The name doesn't bother me. At all? There are other things to worry about. The traces of something drifted across her expression. Before Travis could work out what it was, she said, Anyway, I meant it. You're easy to talk to. My ex-wife would have disagreed. Well, she's wrong. She seemed to mean what she was saying, to enjoy his company. And as he thought of Amy Hauser again, for the first time in days, his initial thought wasn't about the call he'd picked up at Amy's desk, or his doubts about his friend. Instead, it was about what Amy had said to him when they'd come out of the meeting with Mackenzie. Mackenzie liked Travis. Family can be hard sometimes. Travis tuned back in. I'm sorry. I was just thinking, Mackenzie said. Her eyes were on the windows of the coffee shop, but she wasn't looking at the sidewalk, at the street, at the crosswalks and traffic lights. She was caught somewhere else. It was almost as if she'd let her guard down without knowing it. You talking about your ex, about being so far away from your children. Family is hard sometimes. Travis studied her. Do you have family close by? She rocked her head from side to side, like the answer wasn't an easy one. Sort of. I grew up in a shitty house in Staten Island. I loved my mom, I truly did, but she had her own problems. Mental health issues, I guess you'd call it these days. And my father was a waste of oxygen. She blinked a couple of times, and it seemed to break the spell. Way to bring the mood down, Catherine. This is what I mean, Frank. You reel people in just by being so damn nice. You must have been a hell of an interviewer. I had my moments, he said. I had a half-brother, she said finally, her face different this time, Travis unable to quite decipher it. That's where I was going with that. He was the product of one of my dad's many affairs, and when his mother died, he came to live with us. My dad refused to adopt him. We never fostered him. In terms of the system, he just kind of fell through the cracks. That wouldn't happen these days. Maybe shouldn't have happened back in the 70s, but it did. Are you too close? We were, she said. Very. He was two years older than me, and I'd always wanted a brother, but... I don't know. There was something in him. Travis frowned. In him. He could be weird. He got into some trouble at school. My dad was a major league asshole, and the two of them went off like fireworks at home. When your father tells you he never wanted you over and over, that tends to screw you up. So my brother, he started acting out. It began in his teens. He did some stupid things. Vandalism. Petty theft. She was eyeing Travis, as if unsure whether to form into words whatever picture was in her head. He used to hurt things sometimes. People. Animals. I remember my father lost his shit one night when he found out next door's cat had crapped in our yard, and the next day, the cat's got a broken leg. They just stared at each other. 
He was just trying to please my father, she said softly. But Travis saw an echo in her face, a hint of doubt, perhaps, and he wondered if that was just an excuse. Maybe her brother hadn't hurt that cat to please a father who didn't want him. Maybe he just liked to hurt things. Just then, their coffees were put at the end of the counter, and like a light being switched on, Mackenzie broke into a smile. Shit, I don't know why I'm saying this. Except for some reason, Travis wasn't sure that was true. It was like she'd been holding her breath. She'd never been able to tell anyone about her brother, yet had always wanted to. To her, he was a ghost that needed exercising. But now Travis was wondering why she'd chosen this moment to let the breath go. Why, of all people, did she tell him? Why would she let her guard down in front of a guy she barely knew? She'd built an entire career out of never giving an inch. Even if, as she'd said, Travis was easy to talk to, it still felt like something was amiss. She looked at the third cup of coffee waiting for them on the bar, the side marked with the name Amy, and said, You waiting here for Hauser? I'm supposed to be. Mackenzie nodded. That's a shame. I wanted to show you something. He was thrown by the statement. It's in my car, she said, and looked at her watch. Your car? It might be pertinent to what you're working on. Travis frowned. What do you mean? I'd rather not discuss it here, she said, looking around. Did she mean the cold cases that Hauser had given him? Or did she mean Louise Mason? Or Rebecca, Travis thought, glancing out of the window. Still no sign of Hauser. It'll make sense when we get there, Mackenzie assured him. Intrigued, Travis said, Sure. Okay. Let's go take a look. Chapter 79 Axel was my brother, Mackenzie said quietly. Maybe not in the way that the law recognizes, but in every way that mattered. A lot of the time growing up, he was all I had. Her eyes had returned to the snow globe. But Axel, he was... She stopped. Uncontrollable. Then she sniffed, almost shuddered, as if escaping a riptide, and Rebecca remembered something. The morning she woke up in Foley's apartment, he hadn't actually said he was married. He'd said, I feel I need to be honest. I do have someone else in my life. I don't think I'm going to tell her. He was in that hotel bar, and he put something in Louise's drink. She looked like she was wasted. He told her he was going to drive her home, not that she was probably in any state to argue, but where he really planned to go was the same place he took you, that retrogram apartment. The publicity team handled the booking system there, and guess who in the publicity team took it upon themselves to be the first point of contact? The role he had over there, it should have been an assistance job. She leaned in, elbows on the table. But Axel liked to know when that apartment was free. Mackenzie almost smiled, but there was no joy in it. Over the years, he's been with a lot of women, but I think as he got older, they stopped flirting with him as much, and they definitely drew the line at sleeping with him, and that frustration would have built in him, angered him, made a weak man like Axel feel small and rejected. He was, she seemed to be weighing up the right way to say it, he was addicted. Sex was maybe the most important thing of all for him. You see a lot of men like that. All they have to contribute to the discourse is their dick. She closed her hands again, nails pressing into her palms. Difference was, Axel wasn't wired right, so when women stopped giving it to him willingly, he didn't just accept it. He got some pills and switched tactics. That way, no one ever said no to him. Younger, older, the type of girl like you, who wouldn't drop her panties for a stranger, he took them back to that apartment. 
And the next morning, when they woke up with no memory of what had happened, there he was, Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. You Can Trust Me, Mr. Isn't It Crazy We Got So Drunk That We Can't Remember Anything? Of course, I never knew he was doing any of this shit until the night he killed Louise. That was when it all came out. That was when we found out it wasn't just one mistake. There were so many he couldn't even remember their names. Rebecca felt something pulse in her throat. She didn't know if it was anger or fear or nausea or all of them. So what? One day, she said, her voice little more than a tremor, he just decides to become a serial rapist? No, Mackenzie said. That side of my brother, that darkness, it existed in him for a long time before then. I saw flashes on and off for years. As a cop, the things I saw in him would have set off all sorts of alarms in my head. As a sister, I denied them and pretended not to notice. Rebecca's mind spun back to something Mackenzie had said earlier. I willfully ignored the warning signs. Well, maybe that wasn't entirely true. I suppose a part of me always worried that he might screw up my career in some way. That was why I put up a barrier between us early on. He never knew the number of my actual cell phone, just of a burner. He didn't know it was a burner, but it insulated me. I didn't call him. I didn't email him. I tried to limit being seen with him in places I might get recognized. I let him come to my house, but only at night. I told myself that it was fine to be cautious, justified. I was being reasonable and wanting to protect my career. I told myself, Axel's got issues and someone could use them to hurt me. But that wasn't the reason I did it. I see that now. That sort of behavior, it wasn't ordinary precautions. It was above and beyond. I knew what he was capable of. I'd seen it growing up, so a part of me was always waiting for it to happen again. And then Rebecca's attention switched. Hain had taken a step closer to Mackenzie, still quiet, but there was something in his face. Was it a message? I've wondered a lot in the time since, she said, appearing not to notice, why he didn't just screw these girls in back alleys or in places where they weren't going to remember his face, his name, or where he lived. In a way, I suppose waking up in his apartment, it made women like you less panicky, less likely to talk about what happened or report it, because the blackout drunk story would make sense. But knowing Axel, knowing the way he was when he didn't have this addiction buzzing in his head, how placid, even tender he could be sometimes, I think he probably wanted there to be more. I think with certain women, like you, after the deed was done, after the buzzing in his head had stopped, he just wanted to feel normal. I think he really did like you in that moment. I think he saw something in you. But he went way too far. That was the problem with Axel. That was why we had no choice but to come after you like we did. He didn't just tell you his actual name. He told you his nickname, its origins. He told you his surname. I think he really did like you, Rebecca. She thought of her dream, her memory. I think you should stay, Rebecca. The whole thing was repellent, but Rebecca hardly had time to process it. Hain had taken another step forward, and this time she saw the message. He was saying, stop. This isn't a confession. Except for Mackenzie, maybe it was. Maybe it was a chance to give voice to all that she'd pushed down about her brother, or the hatred she'd felt for the way his choices had almost derailed her life and career. After all, where else would she be able to admit to what her brother had done, and what she herself had kept secret, other than in the closing moments of another woman's life? We need to get this done and go. Hain spoke for the first time. Rebecca looked at him, his gun, and he looked back. But Mackenzie was totally unmoved. You don't get to tell me that, she said, almost whispering it. We haven't got the time for this shit. I think, Mackenzie replied slowly, given your monumental screw-up is still breathing, she gestured to Rebecca. We've got all the time I say we do. 
Payne stayed where he was, silent. He was down in Miami, Mackenzie said as if she knew what Rebecca was thinking. Why hadn't Hayden just taken care of her himself instead of letting Lima do it? He was part of a joint task force down there, busting some asshole from the Bronx who thought he was Tony Montana. With you, everything was so last minute. We'd been listening to your calls, reading your texts, and then all of a sudden you decide to head out to Crow Island and we've got our perfect opportunity to make you go away. Only Hayne wasn't here. He was 1,200 miles away. She shrugged. So reluctantly, he ended up sending this other guy, Lima, this former CI of his, and, well, I guess we know how that turned out. Lima hadn't just been a criminal. He'd been an informant. Hayne shook his head at her. He didn't like any of this. A comic sense of timing, Mackenzie said, her words echoing the ones she'd spoken earlier. There was a distance in her all of a sudden. I was literally speaking to the commissioner at the fundraiser when Axel called me. They were back on the night Louise was killed. Kathy, help me, Mackenzie said, her eyes staring off into space, her voice altered, imitating her brother's. Even mimicked, the effect was chilling. You gotta help me. I've done something terrible. She stopped. A beat, and then she looked up at Rebecca. He'd taken her down to his car in the parking garage beneath the hotel, and she'd started to wake up. He screwed it up. Different set of pills, not as strong. Worse, she began fighting back, so he punched her, and after that, he totally lost control. Catherine, Haynes said, stop. He kept punching her until her face was just paste. An awful, shattering silence. Even Hayne didn't speak, didn't move. And in the quiet, the rest of what happened that night filled itself in. Foley called his sister, then she called Hain. Hain, Mackenzie said, using his name but talking to Rebecca. He's bristling. He doesn't want you to know this, and I understand why. He's been trained to internalize everything, to deal with it in silence. I've seen him do it for a long time. I know what he can do. I know what he's prepared to do and what he has done for a little extra money. He's very good at fixing things. Me, I don't find it as easy. To me, fixing things, that just means digging up dirt on opponents, not killing or raping, not burying you way out to sea. Her face contorted. Although, I don't know. She glanced over her shoulder at the gray shapes on the back porch, a flicker in her face as if she was finally becoming cognizant of what she'd done. I guess I knew what I was getting into. If you're ambitious, you have to be prepared to play dirty. And if you take one step into the shadows, like we did that first night when we made Louise vanish, you've got to be prepared to go the whole way. There's no retreat. The kind of decisions I made that night, that I've made tonight, coming here, you don't make them if your definition of fixing things only extends as far as spreading a little dirt. She nodded to Hayne again. He said I shouldn't come, but I felt I had to. Rebecca glanced at Hayne. He was six feet from her, the gun against his leg, his gaze rooted to hers. She thought of the girls and then of Gareth. What time would he be home? The longer this went on, the longer Rebecca stayed alive, but the longer it went on, the more Gareth was likely to be caught in the middle of it. Another innocent cut down on Catherine Mackenzie's road to power. Mackenzie rubbed a finger against her lips as if everything she'd said tonight, all her words, had scolded her. I had it all planned out, she said. Always have. Chief of detectives was just another stepping stone. Next, I was going to be the NYPD's first ever female commissioner, and after that, I could run for mayor. I could probably kiss a few asses in D.C. and get the nomination for Secretary of Homeland Security. I've always been prepared to do what I had to do to get where I wanted. I was prepared to take part in the weasley little games that get you the positions of power. I can be ruthless. But this? Louise? You? Your brother? All the other women Axel violated and walked away from, whom we don't even know about? We don't even know they've been raped? 
This isn't a game. When Hayne called me and told me you were still alive, when he finally made it back to the city on the run from the same organization he spends his days working for, and he told me we'd have to silence Frank Travis too. Wait, what? Because he knew way too much about this. Wait a second, wait a second. They looked at each other. Are you saying Frank's dead as well? Rebecca's throat felt like it was closing. Unmoved, Mackenzie just looked at her as if she pitied her naivety. Of course he's dead, she said. Did you really think I could leave him alive? Exorcism I'm really sorry about earlier, Frank, Catherine Mackenzie said as they took the elevator down to the parking garage. I don't know why I told you that. He looked at her. You don't have to apologize. I've never really told anyone about my brother. She met his gaze, and this time she was much harder to read. She was the woman he'd heard about, her expression blank as a wall. Well, he said, I'm glad you felt I was worthy. She just nodded. As the elevator doors opened onto the bottom floor of the garage, she pointed towards her car, a dark blue Mercedes, and said, I've got some files in the trunk. I really think it might help. Okay, he replied. But something didn't feel right now. He'd been so caught up with what was going on in the coffee shop, so fixated on the idea that Mackenzie seemed to like him, in the excitement he felt, that he was certain now he'd overlooked something big. His cell phone buzzed in his pants. He grabbed it out of his pocket. It was Amy Hauser asking him where he was. He glanced at the cardboard drinks tray he had in his spare hand, his and Amy's coffees in it, then at Mackenzie, who was looking at him, then tried to clear his head. He replied to Hauser, telling her he'd be five minutes. As they approached the Mercedes, Mackenzie used her remote to pop the trunk. It sprang up, revealing an empty space with two big boxes. There they are, Mackenzie said. Travis's cell phone buzzed again. Hauser for a second time. I think Hayne might be a cop. Travis felt himself stumble. Is everything okay, Frank? He glanced at the text again then stopped eight feet short of the Mercedes, his cell phone still in one hand, the drinks in the other, looking between Mackenzie and the two cardboard boxes. And he knew in that second that he was right. Something was wrong. But by then, it was already too late. Don't move, a voice said behind him. He felt a gun pressed to the back of his skull. He'd never seen or heard an approach. But he recognized the voice. The man who'd called with the tip about Johnny. The guy who dialed Hauser's phone. Travis looked at Mackenzie again, and for a second he thought he saw something glint in her eyes. Regret, maybe. Or remorse. And then he realized why she'd told him about her brother. Why she'd tried to exercise that ghost. Because it would never matter. Travis would never be able to tell anyone. Now get in the fucking trunk, Haynes said. Chapter 80 Frank knew way too much about Louise, Mackenzie said. About you, about all of these cases. It was a shame. I really did take a shine to him. He was smart, kind. In the short time I spent with him, it was easy to see why he was a great cop. He had a disarming quality. He was someone you could trust. She stopped, and in her face there was written a sadness that looked completely authentic. Talking to him today made me realize I had to come here tonight. For a moment, Rebecca didn't understand, but then it clicked. Mackenzie had confessed to Frank about her brother, and some part of her had liked it. Now she was confessing the rest to Rebecca. She felt a vibration in her chest, a swell of sorrow for Frank, and then Mackenzie was talking again. 
I just sat there, and I listened to Hain tell me what needed to be done, and after I shot Frank, she faded out, but those words remained. She was the one who had done it. She had killed him. Rebecca felt like she might be sick. After I shot him, Mackenzie said, picking up again, quieter now, it finally hit me. I thought, look at what I've become. Hain stepped forward. Catherine, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Rebecca wasn't sure if she was talking to herself or to Hain, but for the first time Rebecca saw an opportunity. Hain had stepped past her, was occupied, had let her drift from his field of vision. She looked left at a kitchen knife hanging off a magnetic strip on the wall. It was at least three steps away, and that was still too far, even with Hain distracted. On her right there was nothing, just a swathe of empty countertop. Except that wasn't quite true. In the middle there was a granite chopping board. I've become everything I've ever fought, Mackenzie said softly. A tiny smear of mascara reached out from the edge of her face, like a black vein. I'm a killer. The gun moved in Hain's hand. As they stared at each other, Rebecca took a step to her right, closer to the granite board. Catherine, listen to me, Hain said, inching closer to the table. I know what's happening here. It's the same thing that happened with Travis earlier. If you keep talking like this, the next time you spill your guts, it'll be to someone who actually matters. People think you only confess once, but you don't. You keep on doing it. You've already done it twice in one day, because it makes you feel better for a while. It's like a drug. He was at least an arm's length away from Rebecca now. But this needs to be the last time you ever open your mouth about this, you understand me? Because if you keep on doing it, next time, I promise you, it won't be worm food like Frank Travis or this bitch. It'll be a cop or a journalist. Mackenzie said nothing. This needs to stop. He wasn't just talking about Mackenzie confessing. He was talking about doing what they'd come here to do, severing the sinew that connected Rebecca, Louise, and all the other victims of Daniel Foley. It was obvious that he was way beyond where Catherine Mackenzie was. He'd seen death, and he'd caused it, and it had claimed all of him. Finally, Mackenzie muttered, You're right. Okay, good. We need to finish this, she said softly. Okay, he replied, glancing at Rebecca. Okay, good. He never finished his sentence. The gunshot cut the room in two, a sound so loud it was like the entire house moved. And by the time Rebecca reacted, Hain had already been thrown against the countertop. His head whipped back, blood flecking Rebecca's face, and then he collapsed like a rag doll against the kitchen cabinets. When she looked down at him, her ears still ringing, his fingers were clutching a chest wound. Horrified, shaken, Rebecca screamed, What the fuck? But Mackenzie was in the same position at the table. She'd hardly moved, her eyes glazed. In her hand was a snub-nosed pistol. I think it's time to call the cops, she said. Chapter 81 Rebecca was shaking, the adrenaline thundering in her blood. Call the cops, Mackenzie repeated. As Rebecca stared at her, unsure if she was serious, Roxy started barking from the other room. Call them! She reached into her pants and pulled out her cell phone. I don't get it, she thought. Why would Mackenzie shoot him? Except, of course, she did get it. Mackenzie had needed to come here and confess because that was the only way she could ever be free. Her secrets, the guilt, the remorse, the shame, were the same prison that the island had been to Rebecca. I need to help him, Rebecca said, pointing to Hain. Mackenzie shook her head. He's going to die if we do nothing. Just call the police, she said again, and finally turned the gun on Rebecca. It looked bigger now, scarier. Call them before I change my mind. Rebecca called 911 and told them there had been a shooting in her house. She gave them her address but didn't mention Mackenzie's name. The second she hung up, Mackenzie moved the gun, the weapon becoming slack in her hand, and pointed it away from them. 
He told me it was better if he came alone. Her voice was bereft of emotion. She wasn't looking at Rebecca or Hain. She wasn't looking at anything. She was looking into the future. The moment the police turned up and her career and ambitions were over and everything she'd worked for was gone. Hain's chest was moving, but he was starting to drift. His real name's Bobby, she said, Robert. But whenever he was dealing with stuff like this, he'd always use an alias. He'd switch between them all the time. She looked at Hain. In my early days as a captain, we were at the same precinct, and I did him a favor, got him out of a tight spot that might have cost him his badge, and after that he started doing things for me, fixing things, digging things up. And the more he was around me, the more he'd see of Axel, the more the two of them hit it off. Not that it was hard. Axel hit it off with most people. He was a liar, and liars can be charming. She smiled at the irony of that statement, because she was a liar, same as Foley was. She leaned forward. Hain. She smiled, because to her that was just a stage name. Yeah, he helped cover it all up. But there were some things we had no control over. We had no idea how many women Axel had assaulted because he could barely remember. Maybe it was ten, maybe it was fifteen. He didn't know. Some of the women he vaguely recalled, but we couldn't find them based on only knowing their first names. For most others, we didn't even have a name. To him, they were just shapes that passed through his life. So the whole time it was a guillotine hanging over us, because if these women suddenly remembered Axel, we were exposed. At any moment, one of them might have a flash of recollection, and boom, that was the end. They'd dig into his life, and although I'd insulated myself from him, they'd find me there somewhere, despite my best efforts. In the distance, sirens started to fade in. But if Axel committed suicide, she shrugged, I can tell you from experience, a rape, a series of rapes, we're going to work those hard. Cops will follow that road until we get to the bastard who did it. But a suicide... No one's going to pursue that for any length of time. No one's following the data trail. If it looks cut and dried, we write up the report and then we tie a bow around it. And Rebecca understood the rest. If one of the women did suddenly have a flash of recollection, a name perhaps, maybe a physical description or some vague memory of how Foley's apartment looked, it was going to be way harder to find the man responsible if he was buried under six feet of dirt. Hain persuaded Axel to go out to that bridge. He didn't push him, but he made him take the leap. He said to Axel, if he didn't jump, he'd put in an anonymous call to the NYPD and tell them about Louise. He'd frame him for you and your brother. He'd tell the cops about the other two we took care of. She paused, realizing that she'd never mentioned this part before. We did manage to find two of the women from the details he gave us. We got rid of them hunted them down and made them vanish, like Louise, like we thought we had with you. The air chilled. Now there were three other women, plus Johnny and Travis. It wasn't a murder. It was a massacre. Of course, Mackenzie said, Axel had no idea there was zero chance of us ever putting in an anonymous call to the cops, because it would bring questions to our door that we didn't want to answer. But we laid out the choice for him. Make the jump, or live out your days rotting in a prison cell. A man like Axel, who went around doing whatever the hell he liked, he'd never last in prison. More sirens, even closer. Mackenzie looked towards the living room as if she expected to see cops in the house. If she'd had any doubts about her decision, it was too late now. She heaved her shoulders and let out a long breath. The words had been coming fast, tumbling out of her, a desperate need to unload everything. But now she quietened. Secrets, she said, they're like those boys you see out in the ocean. You can hide them, you can drag them down to a hole in the deepest and darkest part of the water, but eventually... A tormented smile traced her lips, a wraith drifting in and out of view. Eventually they'll force their way up. In the end... Secrets float. 
It's just a question of how long they take to get to the surface. And Rebecca had got to the surface. She was the secret that came back. I needed to come here, Mackenzie said softly. Nothing I've wanted in my life was worth this. I haven't slept since the night Axel killed Louise. I'm not sure I slept properly for the entire time he was in my life. All I knew was that I couldn't do it again. I couldn't cover up another lie. When I found out you were still alive, I knew I had to look one of you in the face and admit to what I am. As sirens entered the street, Mackenzie reached down into the pocket of her coat. Rebecca heard something jangle. Then Mackenzie placed a set of car keys on the table. She glanced at Hayne, a look in her face that was hard to interpret, before returning to Rebecca. Pushing the car keys towards her, Mackenzie said, These are for you. It's parked at the Walgreens on Prospect. That was a couple of blocks from the house. Why are you giving me these? Rebecca replied. Because Travis is in the trunk. Rebecca's stomach sank like a shipwreck. I had this photograph of you all for a while, she said. You and your brothers and your father. The four of you on the front porch of that house you all lived in down on 81st Street. Hain dug it up from somewhere. I don't know where he got it, but I'm glad he did. I used to look at it a lot when I got home at night. Just study it. Your faces, and weird as it sounds, I felt jealous. I could see how tight you all were, how you'd forged something remarkable even after your mother abandoned you, and I never had that. I only had this. She looked at Hain, at the gun, at the blood on the walls of the kitchen, and then pushed the car keys even closer to Rebecca. I'm sorry we took Johnny away. I can't give him back to you. But I can at least do this much. I can't give him back to you. Where is my brother? I don't know, Mackenzie said. That's the truth. I don't know what happened that day, but Hain will. Her eyes went to Hain again. He was hanging on, moaning gently. I do know something, though. Your brother. She stopped, almost winced, as if she'd been shot, too. He's buried in a grave on that island. The words crashed against Rebecca. She told herself that Johnny was dead, had known it on some level for five months, but hearing it was different. It felt like a part of her had been torn out. She was home, she was finally safe, but without Johnny, something of her would always stay lost. Part 9 The Scar Chapter 82 Three days later, the police found the skeletal remains of Louise Mason's body in salt marshes in Jamaica Bay. There were two other bodies alongside hers, a French exchange student called Mathilde Roux, 22, whose parents in Paris had reported her missing seven days after Louise disappeared, and Carla Lee, 33, who had worked in a bar in Tribeca and was reported missing by her husband three days before Rebecca went to Crow Island. When investigators spoke to family and friends, no one remembered either woman talking about a man matching Daniel Foley's description, let alone the idea that they might have been raped. Like Rebecca, it appeared the other women had no recall of the night they'd spent with Axel, but Hayne had killed them anyway, just to be safe. Four days after that, a search team returned to Crow Island to recover Johnny. Both days they were there, it was overcast, unseasonably cold for early April, and when a task force arrived in Helena, it began to sleet. With them on that day was a detective called Robert Markovitz, who hadn't buried Johnny himself, but knew where Lorenzo Lima Celestino had put him. To Catherine Mackenzie, Markovitz had been Bobby, to the detective squad at the 46th precinct in the Bronx where he'd worked, he was Mark. Until that night in her kitchen, Rebecca had only known him as Hain. He was still working at the 46th precinct in homicide until the end. The day he'd called Amy Hauser's phone and Travis had picked up, 
It was in his capacity as a detective. He genuinely had no idea that Travis would be there. He was calling Amy Hauser's line to ask her about a cold case that might have had links to a murder he was working on. The media speculated about how a corrupt cop like Hayne could be missed, but particularly how he could disappear for three days after leaving the island. Yet it was easy enough. He didn't disappear. There were 36,000 officers in the NYPD and 19,000 civilian employees. The day after he'd made it back to the city, he'd taken a sick day to go to the ER and get patched up from the car crash. The day after that, he returned to work at the 46th. His colleagues commented on his injuries, which he said were due to a car accident, but no one suspected a thing. He just did what he always did. He vanished in plain sight. And so Hayne led the way. In prison greens, handcuffed, bandaged, his weight supported by two officers, slightly woozy from all the painkillers he was on, back to the island's forest. Detective Bowners had assured Rebecca before the search team left for Montauk they would find Johnny and get Rebecca the closure she'd been longing for, and on the afternoon of the first day she called to fulfil her promise. We found him, she said quietly. Finally, Johnny was coming home. Catherine Mackenzie was primetime news for weeks. The media tore her to pieces, speculating on every aspect of her career, her personal life, the folly and arrogance of her future ambitions. Rebecca read and watched some of it, but much more she ignored. A lot of the time it was because she was fending off interview requests herself, TV appearances, magazine articles, emails from a publisher asking if she wanted to write a book about her experiences. It was the incessant nature of it, the repetition of the questions, the complete absence of empathy, just a sustained parade of faces trying to get her to break. For weeks, news trucks camped at either end of her road, annoying neighbours, pressuring Rebecca, journalists from papers, websites and TV channels all across the country, hounding anyone who strayed onto the block. Throughout it all, as she left the house to walk Roxy, or took the girls to the park, she remained silent. If there was one thing she'd learned on the island, it was how to do that. At night, once Gareth had moved out for a second time and in with his new girlfriend, she'd lie awake, or she'd go through to the girls' bedroom and just sit quietly in the corner, watching them, and she'd think about Catherine Mackenzie. And even after everything had come out, Every awful detail had run in every news outlet in every city across the country. Rebecca would still feel a weird sense of discord. She hated Mackenzie for all she'd been involved in, for every lie, every secret she'd helped conceal, every death. She hated her for all the pain she'd caused the family of Louise Mason, her complicity in the murders of Mathilde Roux and Carla Lee, for how she'd allowed Johnny to be torn away. She hated her for the way that countless women were living victims of Daniel Foley, and although they might have felt that something wasn't right, that there was a shadow they couldn't shake, they'd never be certain of why. And yet, despite all of that being true, Rebecca couldn't deny that Mackenzie had had a conscience, a twine of good that had refused to snap, because if she hadn't, she wouldn't have sat at the kitchen table in Rebecca's house and made her confession. All the ambition in the world, all the dirty tricks she'd pulled, all the things she'd allowed to happen on her watch or turned a blind eye to, couldn't permanently unbalance her sense of what was right. It had remained unimpaired, even if it had taken her too long to find its hiding place. And of course, there was Frank Travis. They'd found him in the trunk of Mackenzie's Mercedes. He'd been bound and gagged with duct tape. Mackenzie told the police that she and Hayne had planned the day. In the afternoon, they were going to get rid of Travis. In the evening, at precisely the time that the changeover was happening outside Rebecca's house and the patrol officer's guard would be down, they would take care of her too except Mackenzie had been lying to Hayne. She'd woken up that morning and decided she couldn't do it anymore. 
Her confessions, the ghosts she was exorcising, first with Travis in Starbucks and later with Rebecca at the house, had been products of that. She was done hiding, done killing. So she talked to Hain, told him that he had too much blood on his hands already and that she would take care of Travis. And although she said Hain was suspicious, because he was always suspicious, he agreed. Mackenzie was a cop after all. She might have spent the latter part of her career behind a desk, but she'd walked the beat. She'd been a detective. She'd drawn her weapon thousands of times. She'd killed in the line of duty twice. She and Hain had got Travis into the trunk of the Mercedes, and then she'd said she would call Hain once the deed was done, and Hain could bury the body in the same place he'd put Louise Mason, Mathilde Drew, and Carla Lee. She called him at around 7 p.m. that night and told him it was done that the Mercedes was parked in a Walgreens a block from Rebecca's brownstone. That played well with Hain. He once told her that the worst place to leave a car with a body in it was in a deserted back alley. People would pay attention to it there. No one paid attention to it outside of Walgreens. It played even better when she showed him the trunk. Travis was on his belly, his face bloodied, duct tape over his mouth and around his wrists which were bound behind him. The tableau was good enough for Hain. He said he would put Rebecca's body inside the car too, once they'd killed her, and drive both her and Travis to Jamaica Bay. But it was all staged. Travis's face was a mess because Mackenzie had put a deliberate cut in it and spread the blood out. He was on his belly, so it lessened the chances of Hain seeing him breathing. She'd selected a parking bay as far away from any lights as possible because she knew Hain wouldn't want the trunk open for long in a public place. And all of that was why Rebecca felt so conflicted. Because Frank Travis was still alive. Because he got to tell Rebecca all of this himself. And because they had Catherine Mackenzie to thank for it. Chapter 83 the memorial service for Louise Mason took place at St. John's Cemetery, close to her parents' home in Rigo Park. Rebecca left the girls with Noella, and she and Frank Travis, sporting a fetching bandage that stretched from his forehead to the dome of his skull, went together. They sat at the back as Louise's uncle, her cousin and her father talked eloquently through tears about Louise's life, her art, her successes, and most importantly, the person she was. Afterwards, Rebecca went up to Louise's parents and introduced herself. The three of them hugged for a long time. Perhaps in some other life, it might have been unusual, an act that might have made one or all of them uncomfortable. But in that moment, none of them questioned it. Two days later, Rebecca was burying Johnny. Noella stood up and read a eulogy for him that was so funny and heartfelt, Rebecca spent the entire ten minutes lurching between laughter and sobs. Johnny had wanted to be cremated, not buried, so there was no rain to contend with this time, no storm clouds above the East River, as there had been when Rebecca had said her goodbyes to Mike and to her father. They held the wake in a bookshop after it had shut for the day, three blocks from the house on 81st Street, where they'd all grown up. It was a place Johnny had always loved, perhaps even the place he was at his happiest. Rebecca chatted to friends of his she hadn't seen for years, distant relatives who'd come all the way from Boston for the funeral, and for a while it was easy to forget the ache in the pit of her stomach, the anger she was feeling, the sense of hurt and betrayal. But at the end of the night, when just she, Noella, and the store manager were left, Rebecca turned to No and said, why wasn't she here? No frowned. Who, honey? My mother. No glanced at the store manager and he headed out back to give them some space. Forget her, No said, putting a hand to Rebecca's arm. Why wouldn't she come? Because she never comes back. But why not? Because she's not like you, honey. How you feel about your girls, what you were prepared to do to get back to them, that's not who she is. 
If that was who she was, she'd have shown her face when Mike died. Hell, she wouldn't have walked out on you in the first place. No put her arm around Rebecca's shoulders. You've got enough to think about without worrying about her. She abandoned you all. You three were only kids. You and Mike were just babies. The inference was clear. What kind of a monster would do that? She hasn't even sent a bloody card. Perhaps she doesn't know, No said. Except the day after the funeral, a card arrived. Rebecca opened it. Johnny's familiar refrain. It's better than nothing, echoing in her head. Inside, her mother had written, I was sorry to hear the news about John. But no name, no mum, no Fiona. Rebecca looked at the envelope. It had British stamps on the front, airmail stickers, but no return address. Again, she thought of Johnny. He'd always kept the cards when they arrived. Rebecca tossed hers into the trash. Chapter 84 A couple of hours later, Frank Travis arrived at the house. Rebecca had prepared some sandwiches, and while the girls ran around the backyard, she and Travis sat on a couple of old wicker chairs under the shade of the porch, Roxy lying at Rebecca's feet, chewing an old slipper. This brings back memories, Travis said. Were your kids crazy like this? He smiled. Kyra was running around in circles, singing a song she'd heard on the Disney Channel, while Chloe was laughing so hard she eventually lost her balance and plopped onto her backside. How were they doing? Travis asked. Rebecca watched Kyra as she poured her and her sister an imaginary cup of tea. They're doing okay, she said, but sometimes they look at me and it's like... Her eyes went back to the girls. It's like they don't remember me. Give it time, kiddo. She glanced at him. And then there's this thing with Gareth. I don't know what I expected to happen between us when I got home. I didn't expect us to get back together, but I guess I didn't expect him to move on so quickly. Travis was quiet for a moment, his hands steepled in front of him. This stuff can be hard, Rebecca. I think it's time you started calling me Beck now, Frank. Beck. He smiled again, fiddling with the bandage on his head. When my wife left me, geez, I was spinning like a top for months. It was nuts, because I wasn't even happy with her. I didn't like her. But anything that tilts you, even if it's something small, and I'm not saying this thing with the girls is small, not at all, it can really play with your head. Travis took a bite of his sandwich. It's like Louise. I got her home. Not in the way I wanted to, but I got her home. And I'm still lying awake at night. It still feels like I failed her. You didn't fail her, Frank. Travis didn't say anything, just took another bite of his sandwich, and they fell into a comfortable silence, watching the girls. After a while, Travis turned to Rebecca and said, They may be a little confused right now, but they'll come around. Kids are remarkable. They're so much more resilient than we give them credit for. When they're this age, they adapt and move on. There's no rancor or regret. Soon it'll be like you were never away. Rebecca looked at Travis and felt an immediate pull towards him. This was the sort of speech her father used to give to Johnny, Mike, and her when they were growing up. Gentle, incisive words that would draw them back from whatever edge they'd wandered out to. She found herself reaching over to grasp Travis's hand, and although he seemed taken aback, he soon took hers in return, understanding. Thanks, Frank, she said. He held her hand for a moment longer, and then she saw his expression change, and she knew they were about to get to the real reason for his visit. In truth, a part of her had been scared to ask. If this visit was about Johnny, she knew it would hurt. She knew it from the way Travis was looking at her. He placed the half-eaten sandwich on his plate, finished his Coke, and then moved his hand to the inside pocket of his sports coat. When it emerged, a flash drive was pinched between his thumb and finger. Travis put it down, pushing it towards her. On the side, it said, 
FAO, Frank Travis. What's this? She asked. They figured out what happened to Johnny that day. Rebecca blinked. Bowners and her team, in their interviews with Hain, they've managed to put together a rough idea of what happened when you and your brother got separated. He grimaced as if he was having a hard time forming his words. They know why Johnny's wallet was at the lighthouse. Why? Rebecca asked, almost fearful of the answer. It sounds like when you were trying to escape from Lima, Johnny didn't realize you weren't behind him to start with, and then when he went back for you, when he was calling your name, he couldn't find either you or Lima because you'd already drawn Lima away from the track in the direction of that gully. In the beat between sentences, an image of that day flickered behind Rebecca's eyes, her tumbling into the gully, hitting her head and blacking out. After that, Travis went on, there's a knowledge gap, but the cops seem to think that when Johnny couldn't find you, he tried to run back up to the main road, presumably to flag someone down. Shortly after, Lima finished with you because he thought you were dead and returned to the parking area with the keys for Stelzik's Chevy. He used it to catch Johnny. So how did Johnny get all the way out to the lighthouse? Travis didn't respond initially. Instead, it looked like he was gathering his strength, stealing himself for the final assault. He didn't. Haynes says Lima caught up with your brother before Johnny ever managed to reach the top of that trail out of Simmons Gully. I mean, the track was almost a mile long. Something hitched in Travis's voice. According to Bowners, he continued quietly, coming forward in his chair. A stretch of the loop was cut off temporarily when a truck spilled some logs across it. Rebecca remembered the night she'd got to the top there, in the middle of the storm, before she'd headed into Helena and had found wood and plastic fasteners across the road. That meant when Lima was done, done, done burying her brother. Once he was done, he couldn't take the direct route back to Helena along the southern flank because it was blocked. He had to go the other way around and come past the lighthouse. That was how Johnny's wallet ended up there. Apparently, according to Hain, when Lima was driving away from the dig site, after he'd buried Johnny, he spotted the wallet near the top of the trail. Your brother dropped it when he died. Lima didn't want to leave it out in the open there because he thought it was too close to the body, so he stopped at the lighthouse and dumped it there. Travis reached over and took her hand again. I'm sorry, Beck. This is just... But there were no words. His other hand went to the flash drive. With two cops dying at your house, he said, with recovery of first Louise's body and then the other two women's, then Johnny's and then me, and all the other terrible shit that's been going on since the island. Somehow no one got this over to you. It got missed. I know that Bowness is going to call you to apologize later on. She says they meant to show you days ago. What is it? Lima missed something in Johnny's pockets. Travis stopped, looking at Rebecca, and as she wiped her eyes, she nodded, letting him know she was ready to hear. Johnny hid it in the coat's actual lining. Hid what? You remember that day at the forest you got back to find the window on the Cherokee had been smashed? You covered it with plastic wrap for five months, Rebecca nodded. You remember how the dash cam got taken from the Cherokee? and it never made sense why someone would steal it. Rebecca frowned. Travis pushed the flash drive all the way over. This'll explain everything. Chapter 85 A week later, Rebecca left the girls with Noella for the morning and went into the city. She felt scared at first, frenzied. She stood on the front porch of Noella's house, unable to move, unable to rip her eyes away from the girls. But her heart beating hard, she dragged herself forward and rode the subway in, and gradually, as the minutes passed, she started to calm down. In the time she'd been on the island, her medical license had expired, and because she had made no attempt within three months to seek another two-year extension, she'd had to call the Office of Professions to explain what had happened. They told her, because her case was unusual, and because they were having a hard time understanding, to come by the office on Broadway. 
After she was done filling out forms, she walked a block to Bryant Park, the sun beating down out of a clear blue sky and found a table in the shade at the back of the public library. She brought her laptop, as well as the flash drive Frank Travis had given her the week before, and in the zipped pouch of her laptop bag, something else. The card her mother had sent. She'd fished it out of the garbage. She had no real idea why. She still felt as much confusion about and contempt for Fiona Camberwell as she had the day she'd dumped the card in the trash can. But eventually she'd gone back to the kitchen, rifled through the old food, the chip packets, the detritus of her family's life, and reclaimed it. It was stained and wrinkled, but it had survived. She opened it again now, looking at the message. I was sorry to hear the news about John. Excuse me, would I be able to use this chair? Rebecca looked up from the card. A man in his late forties, tall, broad, good-looking, with dark hair, was standing next to her. He had a bag over his shoulder and a coffee in his hands. Sure, she said. He smiled at her. Thank you. He dragged the chair away from her table and set it up at the next one along. Rebecca's mind wandered again, back to her mother, to the flash drive, to the idea of going back to work, her thoughts moving fast. Are you okay? the man asked. She realized she was still staring at him. Oh, she said, I'm so sorry. I was miles away. The man smiled again. Well, that's a relief. He looked down at himself, his shirt, his pants. I thought I might have food on my face. <laughs> no, you're okay. You'd tell me if I had food on my face, right? It depends how amusing it looked. The man smiled a third time. He had a lovely smile. You're English, Rebecca said to him. I am, he replied. You sound like you might be too. Not for a long time. I moved here when I was 18. But you still have some of the accent. Yeah, she said. For some reason, it's always hung in there. I like it. She paused, thinking of Johnny, of how he'd hated his mid-Atlantic accent. The memory made her sad, so she pushed it away. Are you here on vacation? Sort of, the man said. I'm meeting a friend for a couple of days. She lives out in L.A., and this seemed like a good halfway point for both of us. What about you? He checked the time. Are you having an early lunch? No, not yet. Maybe soon. He didn't pry, even though he must have been curious. I've been on a sort of career break, she said. Okay. And you're thinking about going back? More through necessity than desire. It was only brief, but as they looked at each other, it was like something passed between them. An understanding of how onerous necessity could be. What do you do? The man asked. I'm a doctor. An orthopedic surgeon. Wow, you look way too young to be so qualified. She laughed. Not as young as I like. I'm guessing you took a career break to have kids. This time she paused before answering. Sorry, he said, that was incredibly nosy. No, it's fine. It was a pretty accurate guess, though. He nodded. Please don't be creeped out. What about you? Rebecca asked, studying him. I'm an investigator. Like a private investigator? Sort of. I find missing people. Rebecca looked from the man to her mother's card, creased, tarnished, its lack of an address, the lack of a kiss, a sign-off, any clue about who she was. The missing person who brought me into this world. She turned her attention back to the man. He was watching her closely now, but not in a way that troubled her or made her feel uncomfortable. It was more like the look Frank Travis had always given her. Curious. Humane. She reached out a hand. I'm Rebecca Murphy. He took her hand in his. It's lovely to meet you, Rebecca. I'm David Raker. Chapter 86 the flash drive contained a single video file. Seven days had passed since Travis had handed it to her, 
and Rebecca had watched it hundreds of times. She knew every single inch of it, every word, every blur, every accidental tilt and stumble. After a while, viewing it was like watching a flower die and grow simultaneously. Much of it she could barely even look at. Yet she did, because the rest, much more of it, she cherished. That night, after meeting the missing persons investigator and trading cell phone numbers, she collapsed into the couch, the sun bleeding out in the sky, the girls in bed, and opened her laptop. A video window was already up. As night slowly began to creep into the room, for a long time all she did was stare at the freeze-framed image on the screen, thinking of something her father had said to her in the days and weeks before he died. Even the dead can talk. In the end, he'd been right. She pressed play. An image of Johnny started to move. He was mostly out of shot to start with, but Rebecca knew exactly where he was, on the track leading up from the parking area at Simmons Gully towards the loop. He was halfway, breath in front of his face. This was minutes after Rebecca had fallen into the gully, minutes after Lima thought he'd killed her. Johnny was frightened. He didn't know if he was doing the right thing in leaving Rebecca. He'd gone back, hadn't been able to find her, thought the next best thing was to try to get help. But now she could see he'd lost confidence. Now he felt as if he'd abandoned his sister. Even so, he kept going, running, the video jarring and disorienting. Then he slowed again, seemed to remember he was holding the dash cam and stopped. Briefly, he started turning it, trying to find something on it. The image was upside down, on the side, facing one way and then the other. Travis had told Rebecca that no one had been quite sure what Johnny was trying to do. But she knew. On the drive to Montauk, Johnny had asked about the dash cam, and she told him Gareth had installed it and that he'd said the dash cam had an emergency response feature that sent out an SOS if you were in a car accident. That was what Johnny was looking for in these moments. That was why he'd smashed the window of the Cherokee to get at the dash cam. He'd thought there was a button on it he could press. He'd thought, in lieu of him having his cell phone, it might get them found. But very quickly he stopped looking, because that wasn't how the SOS function worked. There was no button to press. He broke into a sprint again, the dash cam still recording the spaces behind him, the ground, a skewed angle on the trees. He was running with it in his left hand. At one point his legs turned and he was looking behind him and as his body swiveled, he slowed and the noise died for a moment. There was the sound of a car engine in the background. Lima. He was coming. Johnny started running again, faster, the picture a blur of movement. It became almost impossible to see anything clearly, until, out of nowhere, the dash cam came up to Johnny's face, as if he'd suddenly thought of something. The angle wasn't perfect. The camera was on the back of the dash cam, so the screen was facing away from him. He had no real idea if he was in shot or not. I don't know if anyone will ever see this, he said, and although Rebecca had heard him say the same words countless times, something twisted inside her as he spoke. Someone's trying to kill us, his voice frayed. He was terrified of leaving Rebecca, of what might have happened to her, of what was going to happen to him. My sister. I don't know where my sister is. She might be dead already. He faded out, glanced behind him. For a second, when his face came back to the camera, he was white. The fear, so utterly paralyzing it seemed to have collapsed him, altered his features somehow. But then he looked behind him again, down the track, the forest on all sides of him, bleak, rigid, wind crackling in the dash cam speaker. And it was like he understood that this might be his last chance to say something. Beck, he said simply, his eyes watering from the cold, from her name and what it meant to him. Wind ripped through the trees. Johnny looked away again, behind him, and now there was a clear speck at the bottom of the track. It was Stelzik's Chevy. When Johnny turned back, there was terror in his face again, terrible, consuming, and it cleaved Rebecca in two. He knew he couldn't outrun a car or a gun. 
If anyone ever finds this, if my sister's still alive, tell her that I love her. He looked behind him. He was crying properly now. The cold had nothing to do with it. As the Chevy closed on him, tears were running into the corners of his mouth. I never said it enough. Maybe I never said it at all. He blinked more tears away. I love you so much, Beck. I love you too, Johnny, Rebecca said quietly. And finally, the screen went black. To start with, Rebecca could find no good in what she'd been through. Nothing positive. Nothing she could use. Mostly, she tried not to think about all that had happened to her, reducing it to a scar in her past. Yet, as time went on, as her memories became greyer, as her pain began to subside just a little in the cord of that scar, she discovered one profound and undeniable truth. I know who I am now. I know what I do. So whenever the doubts came back in the months and years that followed, whenever her courage threatened to take flight, she would return to that truth. She would tell herself who she was and what she'd become. And she would promise herself never to forget. My name is Rebecca. And I survive. Author's Note For the purposes of the story, I've carefully altered some of the working practices and organisational structure of the NYPD, the Suffolk County Police Department, and the American medical system. I've also taken some very minor liberties when it comes to dash cams, VHF radios, and the layout of both Jeep Cherokees and Dodge Rams. I hope all of these things have been done with enough subtlety and care for them to have passed unnoticed, at least until now. We hope you've enjoyed this Penguin audio production of Missing Pieces by Tim Weaver, read by Indra Varma and John Chancer. It was produced by Charlotte Davey and the post-production was Red Apple Creative. Copyright and recording Penguin Audio 2021. Text copyright Tim Weaver 2021. All rights reserved. The moral rights of the author have been asserted. For more Penguin Audio productions, visit us at penguin.co.uk slash audio. Thanks for listening. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this programme.